la pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe deben fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio.
Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos. Y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron... Good morning, I request, please, I ask the Secretary to um, read out the agenda of this plenary. So, Secretary. Por favor, proyecta la agenda. Could we please have the order of the day up on the screen? La agenda, por favor. Muy buenos días. Eh, vamos. Good morning. We will now quickly read through the order of the day. The draft order of the day for day three. We will begin with the following topic, rising food and agricultural input prices from 8 to 9, and we will be having a presentation from the chief economist of FAO, Maximo Torero. We'll take a break at 9 o'clock on the dot because we need to give the team a chance to set up the room for the opening ceremony at 9.30. After the opening ceremony, we will have a break at 10.30 and we will resume with the thematic sessions from 11 
till 12.30. There will be a lunch break at 1.30. We will discuss the afternoon's thematic session. At 2 o'clock, we will continue with the thematic session for the afternoon. And at 4.45 or quarter to 5, we will have the chair's summary. Thank you, Chair. The agenda here, dear, I just uh, now submitted for your approval. Is there any objection? If there is no objection, the agenda is hereby approved. And I want to thank you very much. I, ha I, I indicated earlier that we, this is a very important topic for all of us. Um, this session, rising food prices and food and agriculture inputs, is an issue of extreme relevance for the region and the world that affects the agriculture production, food and nutrition security, put in current context one more element to consider in our efforts to reduce poverty, hunger, and to achieve a socio-economic sustainable recovery for our countries and for our region. To begin the dialogue, I will ask Mr. Maximo Torero, Chief Economist at FAO, to give us a brief 15 minutes introductory presentation on the subject. Remember only we have an hour to deal with this issue, very important issue. So I will ask Mr. Maximo Torero to take the floor. Could we please have Maximo Torero's presentation up on the screen? Many thanks, Chair. Uh, let me start while they put the presentation. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much. Muchas gracias a todos por por este invitación. Thank you all very much for inviting me to take part in this session. I will be delivering my presentation in a minute. The topic is soaring fertilizer and food prices. I'll be focusing on fertilizer price increases given the fact that it's seriously affecting our region. The presentation is broken down into six parts and I'll be delivering it in 15 minutes. I'll deliver the overview in English, apologies, then recent trends in fertilizer prices, market structure, the main policies that affect fertilizer prices and a focus on Latin America and the Caribbean and what we believe the next steps might be for us to work on. Before I get into this presentation essentially on inputs, let me tell you a little bit about what we're looking at in terms of the risks we're facing vis-a-vis -vis the crisis in Ukraine. We split them into three major groups. The first is food and agriculture. The second is what we call the agri-food system. And the third is the macro. The second is the macro component. And the third is the humanitarian component. There are several key components within food and agriculture. The first is production this year and in the next harvest season. And this is related to inputs and trade. All of this is being affected by the conflict. As you know, Ukraine and the Russian Federation produce over 50% of our oil seeds and 30% of the world's grains. Therefore, this has had a direct impact on food prices, as we've seen. However, the gap this year, if the conflict were to be resolved today, the gap wouldn't be huge. This could be covered by imports from other countries, for instance, India. The structural problem will hit in the next harvest if we do not manage to plant crops for the next harvest, which is why we hope the conflict will end as soon as possible, of course. Another major problem is that there are restrictions to imports, which could further exacerbate the market crisis. Another key element is that of logistics and infrastructure. The war is in part destroying Ukraine's infrastructure and it would take some time for Ukraine to recover. There's one issue we haven't discussed at length, zoonoses or animal diseases and Ukraine does suffer from African swine fever. The fact that animals are being moved around due to the conflict, this could affect surrounding countries. Turning to the macroeconomic part, 
energy inputs and biofuels is the major element here. The problem with fertilizers will be compounded given the rise in energy prices. Many of our countries are already facing high levels of debt due to the COVID-19 crisis, and this will be further exacerbated by the current situation. Lastly, we'll discuss the risk of nuclear contamination. In case our soils are contaminated, we would face a 10-year contamination period, which would severely affect Ukraine's market. There are three different focuses. The population of Ukraine, in Ukraine, displaced people who need to be supported with transfers and social support programs, and other countries suffering from the effects, the ripple effects of this crisis. Could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. We've conducted a vulnerability analysis, and here you have the different categories represented by different colors. If you look at the orange part of the map up on the slide, these are high or large increases in food costs compared to GDP expected. And a large part of the region will be affected to this degree. We're vulnerable, especially when it comes to fertilizers. That's why it's important for us to look at that. Of course, when it comes to food security per se, countries in North Africa and South Asia will be affected by increases in prices given that they are net importers from these countries. This just shows us the different levels of vulnerabilities. And uh, start looking into the issue of fertilizers, which is the major call for, for this conference. First, official quotations uh, representative indicator prices for January and February of 2022 are not yet available. However, private industrial service in the U.S. suggests that global momentum has stalled with prices at the wholesale level since some initial downward pressure, notably for uh, monoammonium phosphate, but much uncertainly around uh, whether the price is going to be reduced for the other inputs. It is important to note that contrary to the price trends in Europe, the U.S. price for potash fertilizer rose rapidly in 2021, essentially doubling over the past 12 months. Also, European price quotations uh, have risen recently and are set to move even higher in the light of the current conflict. Now, what is the market, market structure and why we are so concerned of what is happening? In the case of fertilizers, like in many staple commodities, there is a high concentration of suppliers, which means that any shock in any of these suppliers will affect the world. And essentially, a disruption in one or two or even of three key suppliers can significantly disrupt the overall supply situation and affect this. This is the case for Russia Federation and for Belarus, whose together account 32% of the global potash exports in the world. The war in Ukraine has not caused the problem in the fertilizer market, but it has exacerbated it because of the export restrictions that are now being imposed moving out of a quota in the fertilizer sector of these key exporters of fertilizers. Now, what are the drivers behind the supply and demand? The first driver is the high energy prices that we need to look at uh, very carefully. The high energy prices uh, are showing that for the nitrogenous fertilizer, the production uh, right now uh, is starting to increase that fertilizer prices, and which means that this will have a significant effect over uh, the access to those fertilizers. And that's what many of our countries are facing today, and where we need to put a significant emphasis in trying to look at. There is a small improvement, but it's important to assess the situation of what is happening. Now, higher gas prices have reached very high levels today, as you can see in the, in the, in the graph that we are presenting. And this has decoupled from other fossil energy sources such as crude oil. Now, why is this happening? First, there is an increase in demand. Natural gas was used in high volumes to produce energy, electricity, in 2021 in many regions around the world, especially those that were trying to recover from the crisis. In the case of China, floods and other adverse weather conditions reduce coal production and cause the need to top into gas, also lower coal imports. 
Also, we are facing constrained supply. Shipments from Russia started to decline sharply in the fourth quarter of 2021 and have not significantly recovered from these low levels. While supplies through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline seems to have been maintained, there were reduced flows through other pipelines, notably in the Jamal pipeline. So it's important to understand that we have those two dimensions that are exacerbating the prices of these inputs, which are essential for fertilizers. Now, there is a silver leaning on the horizon, which is important to note, especially for the region. Prices for natural gas have come down by 60% from the tops that reached after the invasion. That says prices for natural gas are still four times their normal levels, four times their normal levels. However, if urea prices remain at current levels, fertilizer producers will enjoy positive upgrading margins and resume fertilizer production. So that's good news. And as we will see in the next slide, fertilizer prices, especially for urea as the key indicator for end fertilizers, remains high and it looks as though it has reached a top. With falling gas prices, urea prices could be sufficient for fertilizer producers to resume production in Europe and elsewhere. But everything depends on the development of gas prices, as natural gas is the key feedstock for nitrogen fertilizers production in Europe, North America, and the Middle East. Important also is whether government in Europe will allow fertilizer production to resume. In view of the conflict, they may give priority to the replenishment of gas stocks using gas for heating or, pre or production or of strategically more important products like steel instead of moving into the production of fertilizers. So we need to be very attentive on what, what will happen in that regard. Now, one other element which is extremely important is the tra trade restrictions. And there has been a growing number of countries impo imposing export restrictions in the fourth quarter of 2021, any of which are still in effect, which they are still in effect, and therefore that will affect the prices. In the fourth quarter of 2021, a number of major fertilizer exporters announced export restrictions or tighter export controls. Some major importers implemented large purchasing tenders, subsidizing fertilizers via variable levy systems that offset the difference between the set domestic target price and international reference price. Both measures, this is restricted exports and subsidized imports, keep domestic prices stable, but they put significant pressure on the international prices. Allow me to allude to a few concrete country examples that illustrate the case. In the case of China, the end fertilizer supply issues at home have driven up prices which reached their peaks in September to October 2021. As a result of the export curbs, domestic price fell sharply and normalized the pre-crisis level of 2,500 yuan per ton. But this has not been the case at the international level and therefore put some pressure. There are other countries that are also facing similar problems that we need to look at them extremely carefully. Another element that we need to take into account is the significant increase in transportation costs and the clogged supply chains. High transportation costs concerning transportation costs have increased and they were increased up during COVID-19 and after COVID-19 pandemic because of the different disruptions. However, since October 2021, the cost of bulk transportation have receded significantly. The Baltic Dry Index, a key barometer for bulk transportation costs, has fallen back by January 2022 to its January 2021 level after having seen an increase by 300% from January to September 2021. Overall, this should lower not only shipment costs for fertilizers, but also shipment costs for most agricultural products, which are often transformed in, in bulk form. Now, another element which is extremely important to look is the affordability of fertilizers. How is affordability defined here? Affordability is simply defined as the ratio of output to fertilizer prices. It does not include different needs of fertilizers for different crops, Example, soybeans have lower need for end fertilizer than maize and other crops the same way. When we look to the affordability issue, what we find is that in 2020-2021, high output prices imply high affordability, as you can see in the graph. But between 2021 and 2022, and the challenge we are facing in the region, fertilizer prices rise faster than the crop uh, prices, and therefore, the affordability sharply declined in that period. Now, this varies, of course, crop by crop, and these graphs show the situation crop by crop. And we see that fertilizer affordability for different crops drastically declines for rice and sugar, 
And this is really important in the case of rice, which is the only commodity that we are facing lower prices today. It's still higher for oil seeds and wheat, but also there is a sharp decline. This is the most worrisome development with a view to the next crop season. And that's the challenge that you are all facing, the lack of affordability, which is making a significant challenge for the region. Now, let me focus briefly on the Latin American region and the Caribbean and the challenges that we are facing here. To make trade statistics comparable, we have converted all fertilizer products into the nutrients contained therein. The chart underlies the fertilizer import dependency of the Latin American and Caribbean region. The entire continent, with the exception of Trinidad, Tobago, Venezuela, and Chile, has been net importing of fertilizers. The import dependency applies to basically all key nutrients. This is nutrition and nitrogen, P and K. And surprisingly, the large countries, Brazil, Argentina, or Mexico, account for reliance share. This reflects, first and foremost, their large acreage, but also higher fertilizer application levels. Let's therefore normalize the absolute fertilizer application levels by the amount of arable land to which the fertilizer is applied. This is excluding pastures and needles. This is what you see on the next slide that I am showing right now, where we can observe how we can make the imports comparable. And we have normalized the fertilizer imports by hectares of arable land. This provides a much more telling story. It is underlines that the smaller Central and South American economies are much and more dependent on fertilizer imports than the large ones like Brazil and Argentina. Our host country, Ecuador, for instance, is the second most import dependent country in the region. Allow me to emphasize here that this chart excludes Trinidad and Tobago. The reason is that Trinidad and Tobago produces and exports vast amounts of nitrogen and fertilizers, taking advantage of its natural gas reserves. Including Trinidad and Tobago into this chart will dwarf all the other countries in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Now, what is the danger? That while Trinidad and Tobago may enjoy the current boom in gas and fertilizer prices, it may soon suffer from what is known as the Dutch disease, and that's something that we need to look, and the country needs to look carefully. Now, let me move into the possible impacts and the potential outlook for the region. First, in the immediate, we will have a lack of fertilizers for the FAO, for example, humanitarian projects, and that's Afghanistan. The lack of industrial-grade ammonia at blue catalytic converters for diesel vehicles, and the lack of gas to heat greenhouses. In the short term, we will have lack of nitrogen. I'm sorry about that. Lack of nitrogen of N and P fertilizers in the spring 2022 in the northern hemisphere. Lack of N and P fertilizers in the fall of 2022 in the southern hemisphere. And low affordability and high price responsiveness for demand in the low income countries, which could result in the lower use and lower food production for 2022 2023. In the long term, if energy prices remain high, food prices will remain high. Higher headline inflation eventually, and high core inflation, as we are observing today. Most regressive on poor consumers, which have a higher share of the incomes in spending food. So it's crucial that we open the markets for fertilizers, and it's crucial that we are able to recover the production of the key countries that are being affected by the conflict. Now, towards a contingency plan for fertilizer supplies in 2022, 2023, and beyond. In the short term, our major recommendation is to keep fertilizer trade open and supplies reliable to avoid ad hoc trade restrictions. We need to monitor trade and trade policies, and AMIS is going to play a role on this. We need for better data, better fertilizer market intelligence, and as I mentioned, AMIS initiative is towards up-to-date and reliable nitrogen balances. We need early warning indicators, stock levels and changes, stock to use ratios, and stock to disappearance ratios, which is still today we don't have in AMIS. We need to avoid structural producer protection and support, we need to prioritize agricultural over a non-agricultural use to ensure humanitarian assistance. In the long term, we need to appropriate a timing, pacing, and sequencing of the transition towards low carbon energy sources. Also, we need to improve fertilizer use efficiency. And here is where the soil maps play a crucial role. And today, with the technology we have, we can quickly implement soil maps so that we can use better and more efficiently the fertilizer we have. We are putting this as a long-term recommendation, but it can easily be a medium-term, even a short-term recommendation if we accelerate the investment in these oil maps. 
we need to review and eventually repurpose those fertilizer subsidies. It will be a big mistake to rush into fertilizer subsidies right now. It will be better to use that money to invest in soil maps so that we can use fertilizers more efficiently. And we need to promote better agronomic practices, improve soil fertility, and targeted extension services. Let me summarize and finalize here. First, 2021 and 2020 prices for fertilizers spiked in tandem with energy prices, further rose with trade restrictions and geopolitical tensions, and high transportation costs, and initially high affordability. 2021-2022, we will face very high fertilizer prices, which have lowered affordability, as I showed before, across commodities, and high output prices as a result of that. Global fertilizer use to decline by 3% in 2022-2023, according to IFA, after a 6.3% increase in 2021-2022. If prices remain at current high levels, the drop in demand could be much pronounced, and of course, it will affect production and yields. 2022-2023, we will have a lower use, which will may mean a lower crop production and food quality in 2022-2023, and potentially food security issues. How much is it still to be examined it needs to be looked in detail, but cues from 20, 2008 brings this up. Latin American and Caribbean countries are the food and feedback center of the world, so we need to find solutions to this problem so that this doesn't become a world food security crisis. The Latin American region and Caribbean region uh, is particularly exposed to high fertilizer prices that we have shown, with the exception of a few small net exporters. And all RLC countries are net importers for fertilizers. We need uh, for a contingency plan, and this contingency plan implies collection of data, better balances of stocks, early warning systems, short term to keep the trade open to avoid export restrictions, in the long term to keep energy affordable and need for cheap and green energy. And we need to consider a longer transition from fossil energy to more sustainable energy sources. We need to be very careful on how we change the energy mix because any impact over energy prices will have immediate correlating fertilizers. And from 2023 onwards, the high volatility in energy and fertilizer prices will remain as a feature and beyond. So the boom and the bust cycles in the fertilizer and food markets, similar to the swings from 2008 and 2011 and 2012, could happen. And again, let me repeat, we have an opportunity to increase the efficiency in how we use these fertilizers and to bring technology and innovation to assure that we use this scarce resource in the best possible way today. And the region needs it because the, the dependency on imports that they have and because the role that they play in global food security. Thank you very much, Chair, and apologies if I extend too long. Let me thank Mr. Torero for those very interested presentation. And I think now we have a better idea of what is taking place in the world and the prediction also. So I will now open the floor for comments, opinions, and recommendations. Please indicate by pressing the button on your mic uh, in plenary and raise your hand um, in Zoom. Let us ensure that we stick to the five minutes because we have many persons here who would want to make intervention and we want many interventions as possible. I'll ask the Secretary to prepare the list of intervention. And the first intervention will come from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to say how pleased I am that the FAO has proven itself once again to be a very nimble institution. And we have carved out this morning a specific space to deal with an issue of first importance. As I said a few days ago, we are facing a confluence of circumstances. We have the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have the conflict that is going on in Russia and Ukraine. And we were in a world where even before these two, food prices were on the increase. I want to speak specifically about the Caribbean region and just to update everyone that at the CARICOM level, the discussion has started and at the sub-regional level of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, I had the opportunity to be a part of a session chaired by the government of Antigua and Barbuda. And the minister is here, Samantha Marshall. 
and we basically came up with certain contingencies. We are aware in the Caribbean that the be all and end all of this will rest on how long the conflict in Russia and Ukraine will last. And I just want to note that we will definitely need as small island states as much support from international organizations, technical support and otherwise, so that we can address the impact on food security and food sovereignty. As we are all aware, food must be available, it must be affordable, and it must be accessible. And uh, I don't want to close my point without emphasizing that we may have to look at the current budget that we are working with to see how we can have different allocations and how we can change some of these heads. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We have Brazil and Zoom. Brazil, you are on. Very much. I'd like to start by. Sorry. Like I'd like to start by uh, thanking very much uh, uh, the chief economist uh, uh, Maximo Torreiro for his very comprehensive and interesting uh, presentation on the volatility of food prices and the impact, uh, its impact on global food security. Brazil considers this matter of utmost importance and supports the engagement of international organizations within their mandates. We commend the work of FAO in order to support members' discussions and efforts. Last Friday, for instance, the Director General and the Chief Economist of FAO organized a technical briefing on the impact of COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine on the outlook of food security and nutrition. Once again, it was noted that despite international commitments to the Agenda 2030, countries have been facing immense challenges to implement the sustainable development goals, including efforts to end poverty and hunger. In the last two years, COVID-19 pandemic has made the situation worse, contributing to the largest single year increase in global hunger. The conflict russia ukraine represents a new challenge, bringing loss of lives, forced displacement, serious implications to the humanitarian situation on the ground, as well repercussions to food prices and trade, access and affordability of fertilizers, and food security at a global level. Brazil deeply deplores the violence in Ukraine. In a few days, FAO Council will have the opportunity to discuss within its mandate this issue. In this access, in this aspect, Brazil understand that FAO has a key role to play in the context of the crisis in Ukraine, helping the mobilization of international communities to avoid that the conflict creates an enlarged threat to global food security, particularly in developing countries. Regarding agriculture and food security, the conflict has directly impacted on the ground the production and trade of commodities and its input, like inputs, like fertilizers a situation that deserves careful attention. We praise the fact that the ground-based agencies are already putting in place measures to provide technical and humanitarian assistance in Ukraine and neighboring countries. Indirectly, however, the conflict may endanger international trade. We should be alert against the temptation of the, uh, of the adoptions of measures that are not compatible with WTO's rules. We believe that member countries must keep international agricultural trade flows free for the fullest extent possible. Member countries should exempt agricultural goods and inputs as well related surface uh, from any international, regional or national economic sanctions imposed in relation to, to the conflict in Ukraine. International communities should be concerned with the humanitarian situation of the civil population engulfed by the conflict. Our attention must be also dedicated to the vulnerable populations in third countries that suffer the consequence of lack of food and higher prices. FAO must be attached to its mandate, support members to fight food insecurity, which they aim to placate or moderate the negative undesired effects of conflict to global food and insecurity. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now recognize Ecuador. Ecuador, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, welcome to the representatives of various countries who have arrived to this summit during the ministerial segment, and I hope that you enjoy the hospitality that you expect in this city and have an opportunity to get to know uh, the friendly nature of Ecuador. And secondly, I would like to thank you to the chief economist of the FAO for his presentation on this fundamental topic, which Ecuador has been mentioning since this session began on Monday. And we need to take steps as the country is represented at this very important meeting. We underscore the need to hold dialogue on international uh, food and fertilizer trade in order to maintain the uh, chains uh, in operation, as well as to ensure the infrastructure for food processing and all other logistics. And we hope to come up with a declaration stemming from this summit that could be known as the Quito Declaration or something that could be approved by consensus. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, I would like to thank Maximo Torero for his presentation and reiterate Argentina's commitment to ensuring food security. All countries represented here are deeply concerned with the high levels of volatility in food prices and how this can affect global hunger as well as regional hunger. It's important for the FAO to continue monitoring the issue systematically as we would like to also underscore that regional and international trade is sine qua non and a determining factor, not only for food security at the global level, but also to generate sustainability and a means of subsistence for millions of people, as well as supporting local economies. With regard to the scale of food prices and the prices of inputs, as we just heard, it's very early in the conflict in Ukraine, and we have been watching this process play out since last year, and we see the high levels of cost of various chemicals, fertilizers, and other inputs, in large part due to expansive monetary policies and subsidies that many developed countries have implemented. Agricultural trade at the global level is still characterized by structural shortcomings, for example, uh, subsidies and incentives. This has been aggravated by phytosanitary and health measures, as well as other measures that have been implemented. And so once again, we reiterate the importance of a multilateral food trade system that is based on rules, is more open and more fair, non-discriminatory, protected by the WTO and in line with its rules in order to promote rural and agricultural development and contribute to ensuring food security and improving nutrition for all. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. I now recognize Panama. Panama, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Dear ministers, we wish you greatest success at this 37th regional conference of ministers of agriculture of Latin America, and we are here in representation as the pro tempore chair of the Council of Ministers of Central America and the DR, one of the regions that is the poorest in Latin America. We have uh, been suffering for some time now for inequality, the lack of justice in our trade and exchange systems and regions where poverty in the agricultural sector and the lack of food is a constant issue that leads to enormous suffering among our populations. And it's also being felt moving north and in other continents. The COVID crisis and now the war between Russia and Ukraine has aggravated even further this situation that we have been living with for quite some time. We hope that this meeting leads to specific, tangible, precise actions in order to contribute to our population's well-being. They demand it. It is not time to continue talking. We need to turn words into deeds and come up with interventions today in order to seek 
economic and trade systems that are more fair for our countries and avoid limiting our trade by richer countries that often use or limit our products in the field. And we need to ensure that our poor rural systems are able to survive with greater social justice and access to wealth technology in the agricultural systems. We are putting forth all of our efforts in our governments in our region in order to overcome this serious crisis. And we are working in concert with international organizations, in concert with our producers and our peoples in order to move forward, pushing through this very difficult process that is now worsened by the spike in food production prices and the war. The, we need to look at the criteria of reason and justice and work toward a much more fair objective with greater solidarity for the poorest countries of the world. We cannot endanger this single spaceship on which we live known as Earth. And so we have some people in third and fourth class while others in first class. And we need to be intelligent in the way we manage this pandemic and now this crisis as we seek out new paths toward governing to guarantee greater survival in this planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now recognize Barbados. You have the floor. Just turn off, turn off the mic, those Peru, uh, right, <coughs> Panama. Thank you very much, dear. Uh, first of all, very good morning to all of my ministerial colleagues and to all distinguished ladies and gentlemen who are attending this FAO regional conference. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure for me to participate and put the case on behalf of uh, the region, but more importantly, on behalf of our CARICOM brothers and sisters, who after seeing the presentation that was presented by the FAO chief economist, we must recognize how hugely vulnerable we are within the region, and that the one thing that we must look to in advancing our position in the region is to be able, first of all, to determine how FAO and indeed how budgets within um, the Latin America region and the Caribbean are going to be determined if we are to forge ahead with adjusting building resilience and adaptation in a region which calls for the Caribbean and CARICOM to be able to put measures in place now to mitigate all the challenges that would confront us given what is happening with Russia and Ukraine. It is very evident in the presentation that food and nutritional security will definitely be at risk if we are not in a position to be able to advance systems that will be able to give us a value chain approach towards protecting CARICOM and indeed making the regional um, resilient. My view is that we have to look to see how we can benefit from developing renewable energy that gives us a chance to be able to reduce our dependency on, nat on, on natural gases and at the same time provide opportunities for advancement in innovation, building climate smart agriculture so that more hydroponic systems can be considered using nutrients to feed plants and at the same time determining how small island developing states can be singled out for preference and specialized treatment in terms of how we are able to find the resources to be able to adapt and build the resilience that is required. Therefore, I am strongly recommending that we strengthen our sanitary and phytosanitary measures within the region and at the same time give ourselves a chance to be able to determine how fast we can move towards building the resilience that is required, the adaptation that is needed, and look to innovation and smart technology in advancing agriculture. Certainly, as a region, we will not have the resources to do this, and I'm therefore appealing to the FAO to look at how we now use our budgets to be able to consider the region, small island developing states, as a special case. 
Thank you very much. I now recognize the Dominican Republic. You have the floor. Good morning, distinguished ministers and everyone present. I think that this is a time in which we already are dealing with high prices and we don't know how long those prices are going to remain high. And I think that we need to move more quickly and as we are looking for the resources to address COVID, we need to also look for the resources to address the high prices, particularly when it comes to fertilizers. We need to find those resources and we don't have any other option. At the same time, we need to look for substitutes for the fertilizers we're using. I can see, as I've been looking at this with other countries, that the agriculture budget will be dropping when it comes uh, alongside the GDP. And that should not be uh, the case, particularly during this conjecture. I think that at the end of the day, everything is interrelated to the fact that the solution lies in seeking new resources. Health is very important, but without food, there will never be health. And that is why I understand that the policies we need to seek out at this vital meeting, and I would like to congratulate the FAO for this initiative, need to be aimed at specific solutions because we already have a diagnostic. We already know what's happening. We need to be specific as we seek out immediate solutions. All of those solutions need more resources for agriculture and fishery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to Peru. Peru. Thank you very much. Good morning. Greetings from Peru. And I would like to thank you and congratulate you for this opportunity at this conference. And Peru contributes to global food production. And in this context, I think it's necessary for us to address the issue of uh, something that may turn into a crisis. First of all, the high prices have had an impact on agrarian production, and I think that we need to expect that for the next few years. Therefore, we need to address two very important scenarios. First, this is an opportunity for us to raise organic crops. In, Purdue, in Peru, we are promoting that. We've reached a stage of promoting the entire organic production change, particularly when it comes to organic fertilizers. Here, I think it's necessary for us to make a very important link. However, that's not enough to simply address the high price of fertilizers around the world. I think that here, from the FAO, what we need is to build a partnership so that at the very least the flow of food and fertilizers is not affected by the crisis, particularly due to the conflict and the sanctions in the countries that are uh, major producers of fuel and fertilizer. On the other hand, Peru is making important efforts in guiding investment and our contribution to global food production has been affected. And I think that from the FAO, we need to collaborate and uh, to, to help everyone overcome this crisis, which uh, we hope does not spiral out of control. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will now um, give the floor to Trinidad and Tobago. Before Trinidad and Tobago take the floor, I would like to have an indication how many persons want to speak more on this matter. Just raise your hand. 
So what we'll do, we'll not end the session at nine, uh, at nine o'clock. We'll continue, we'll adjourn, and we'll continue at 11. So Trinidad and Tobago, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, colleagues. Mr. Chairman, in achieving zero poverty and zero hunger, food must be made affordable. However, the COVID-19 pandemic impacts Ukraine-Russia conflict and other global shocks is further pushing away the objectives of achieving food and nutrition security and sustainability. I am particularly Microphone, please. Microphone, por favor, acá. Microphones, please. Thank you. I am particularly pleased that FAO certainly recognizes the importance of this topic, and I congratulate this institution for taking the lead in this topic. I join my colleagues in requesting of FAO sound policy and supplying technical and other resources to the most vulnerable, leaving no one behind, so that we all rise together to overcome these challenges. We must also explore alternative sources of fertilizer, such as the ex expansion or such as the expansion of measures to concentrate on conserving our soils. Greater emphasis can be placed on exploring organic base options and expansion of our livestock sectors. Trinidad and Tobago supports this fight in doing all in our power to respond to the soaring fertilizer prices and mitigation of food price increases. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now recognize Uruguay on Zoom. Uruguay, you have the floor. Good morning, Chair. Thank you very much. Greetings to everyone attending. And in the interest of time, I will get right to the chase. Thank you very much for the excellent uh, presentation of the uh, position in uh, diagnostic uh, with fertilizers. And we are in a very delicate situation. And this is going to affect uh, the next uh, crop seasons. If we don't have the sufficient uh, inputs, we might uh, see our productivity greatly affected on the global level and a major drop in food production that will more greatly exacerbate uh, the current situation. The analysis is without prejudice to the issue of greater trade freedom and it's very important to look at economic sanctions and embargoes in many countries that are producers beyond the issue of uh, politics we have the issue of restrictions in countries that are not complying with UN standards with regard to their involvement in this conflict and it's also reality that embargoes in one way or another exempt countries from food trade and the trade of medicines and we also need to consider the countries that produce uh, agriculture inputs in a very concentrated uh, fertilizer supply market we are restricting ourselves due to political issues with these producer countries where there's a high concentration of these inputs and they are unable to ex export we're not only talking to about the countries involved in the war but also countries that are suffering from economic sanctions imposed by the international community and due to that we're going to face much more restrictions than availability and therefore we are not going to be able to resolve the issue of availability or the matter of the prices which will translate into high food costs 
and that will lead to even greater nutrition crises and food insecurity around the world, greater levels of poverty that we are not even able to imagine. If we do not quickly resolve all of this related to fertilizer availability beyond whether or not we're okay with new technologies or techniques that we might research more in seeking more efficiency and alternatives, we will not be able, we cannot be able to waste time unless we take drastic measures re, uh, removing uh, the restrictions and embargoes on these fertilizer producer countries. This is our position. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. I now recognize Cuba. Cuba, you have the floor. Costa Rica had requested the floor. Rica. Don't worry. Thank you. Bien, yo creo que hemos... I think that we have heard a lot about uh, the supply and demand of fertilizers and the impact this may have. I would like to speak on the issue briefly, but I would also like to talk about the consequences of this because we're already seeing those consequences. The pandemic boosted poverty in Latin America and the Caribbean. Over 200 million people all live in poverty today. And this is not an issue that can only be blamed on the pandemic and the war between Ukraine and Russia. This is something that has been coming for some time, and poverty in the f rural areas of our countries has been the result of the fact that we do not pay our farmers a fair price for the arduous work they carry out day in and day out. Our consumers are also not receiving a fair price for food because distribution chains and third parties in Latin America and around the world create enormous price distortions and this leads to both extremes of the chain being let down. Our producers today with the rising price of fertilizers are unable to continue producing food of high quality in a timely fashion or in sufficient quantity. But even if they have those fertilizers, the debate that the FAO needs to hold is what is a fair price that our farmers should receive for their wares? And what is the relationship, the trade relationship between nations so that we can ensure there is fair international trade of agricultural products? Historically speaking, we have tried to reduce uh, costs by being more efficient and effective. We can see that with agricultural tra technological transformation, but that requires refinancing. That requires insurance. It requires our banks in our countries being open to financing agriculture in order to transform it. Otherwise, we will not achieve fair prices for our farmers or opportunities for them to move forward and develop. Today, in the face of the crisis in Ukraine and the pandemic, the only thing we can do is put up a debate that has been a long time coming for years because we have already seen how necessary it is for over 500,000 family farmers seek producing food for major cities. It's indispensable for the FAO to begin looking at the debate of fair prices for our farmers and our countries in Latin America that produce food. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And at this point in time, um, we will adjourn this session because the room will have to be prepared for the opening session. Before I do that, I will ask Mr. Torero to just give us a brief summary of this um, session, this part of the session. I think we have had some very, very important intervention 11 intervention we have had and very, very important. So I'd like Mr. Torero to give us a um, thank you. Thank small you very summary. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be very brief 
it's extremely important for us to move toward short, medium, and long-term concrete recommendations. The situation is critical, and we might fall into a food crisis if we don't act. This is a very critical period. One more shock in a food producer, and we will be facing a global food crisis. So what are some very specific recommendations? We need to move trade. We need to ensure that uh, products and inputs are able to flow, and we also need to boost interregional trade to boost our region. Secondly, we need to look at the efficient use of inputs. As I stated, Ethiopia has enormous experience in becoming more efficient in their soil use. The blending that they do can be modified, and this can lead to huge savings in the use of inputs. And uh, thirdly, we need to assess sanctions. We are pushing something very strong. Sanctions are a double-edged sword. On one hand, they might have benefits, but they might also lead to a noxious effect on a much larger scale. In this case, fundamentally due to the problem that we have been facing with fertilizers for quite some time, and we need to be very careful with what we do because this may lead to a weapon that becomes much stronger as we face huge political problems in many countries as well as a global food crisis. Thirdly, we need to target our interventions. We shouldn't generalize. We need to be very targeted because we have scanty resources. The FAO has been working on a facility for imports, and we are working to ensure that it includes inputs and that there is a facility already at the IMF. We hope to expand it in order to assist the neediest countries that require access to liquidity in order to acquire what they need immediately to ensure their food security. Fifth, the change of the energy mix needs to be dealt with very carefully. We need to evaluate the consequences given the market that we are dealing with today and the problems we're facing. Finally, we need to seek in the mid and long term technological innovation, and we cannot let this problem happen again. The concentration of production and inputs is something that we have been dealing with for years. We need investment to overcome that in order to truly appreciate the value of food. It is central that we work on this. The FAO is greatly involved in being very active in understanding that if I am going to sell a tomato that involves inputs, that involves land, water, labor, that value, the true cost of food, is something that we need to keep in mind. We need to understand it. That doesn't necessarily mean the price of food is going to increase, but we need to know it and we need to ensure that incentives are appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Torero. And I will now ask the Secretary to make some very short announcements before we conclude our re adjourn this session. Secretary. Okay. Muy buenos días. Good morning. The government team has informed us that the opening ceremony will also see other government representatives present. Therefore, there will be a strict security protocol, which unfortunately limits the number of participants in the room. The government will provide two credentials per delegation so that two people from each delegation can take part in the session in the room. They will be distributed right outside the room. We will begin this segment, the opening ceremony, at 9.30. So we will all have to leave the room and come back in at 9.30. I'm very sorry. Apologies, but this is the protocol they have conveyed to us, given the presidents of the President of the Republic of Ecuador. Thank you. And now adjourn this session, and we'll continue after the opening session. Thank you once again. We are coming back at 11 with the thematic sessions. At 9.30, we will have the opening ceremony. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. 
la región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos. Y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. 
Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La comunidad andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa mano de la mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima conferencia regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás.
La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos. Y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. 
La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Okay, gracias. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Hola, hola, hola. Desde los hola. hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, días, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen días, ríos que se vierten todos. en dos de los Gracias océanos más presencia. productivos del planeta. Luego Thank de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas, en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, Republic. medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima conferencia regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, 
los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 
23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos. Y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás.
Please welcome the constitutional president of the Republic of Ecuador, Guillermo Lasso Mendoza. An applause, please. También el vicepresidente. The Vice President of the Republic of Ecuador, Dr. Alfredo Barrero, and other authorities for this important meeting. An applause, please. Podemos tomar asiento, por favor. Please take your seats. Bienvenidos y bienvenidos. Welcome to the opening ceremony of the 37th period of sessions of the Regional Conference of the FAO for Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you to the authorities who are presiding this session. Mr. Guillermo Lasso Mendoza, the Constitutional President of the Republic of Ecuador. Señor Alfredo Borrell, the Vice President of the Republic of Ecuador. Señor Mr. Chu Dongyu, the Director General of the UNFAO. Señor Mr. Ariel Henry, the Prime Minister of Haiti, who is joining us virtually. Señor Juan, Juan Carlos Olguín, the Foreign Minister. Señor Pedro Jose Alava, the Minister of Agriculture and Livestock and Chair of the 37th Regional Conference. Señor Julio Verdeguera, the regional representative of the UNFAO. Señor Hans Hans Hubergen, the independent chair of the FAO Council. Saludamos. Greetings to the representatives of governments of the 33 countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, to the members of the national government uh, cabinet and members of the international organizations and diplomatic uh, bodies here, international organizations and uh, civil society as well as the private sector. Also, thank you very much for the media for covering this event and joining us today. The regional conference of the FAO is more urgent and necessary than ever. Today, we are formally beginning the ministerial meeting of 33 countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, in which we will recognize the important contributions of agri-food systems for economic cooperation and access to a healthy diet, creating work in urban and rural settings, and managing natural resources in a sustainable fashion. Ecuador gives you the warmest welcome, and we invite you to get to know the site of the 37th uh, Regional Conference for Latin America and the Caribbean in the Ecuador is a país mega diverso, situado in the middle of the world. Entre valles y montañas majestuosas, bosques amazónicos y un extenso mar del que surgen las islas encantadas de las Galápagos. Posee un invaluable patrimonio agroalimentario, construido por hombres y mujeres que trabajan la tierra y custodian los paisajes productivos y los recursos naturales, garantizando la seguridad alimentaria. 
Desde 1945, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura y el Ecuador trabajan juntos para impulsar una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una mejor vida, sin dejar a nadie atrás. Una mejor producción, más eficiente y sostenible, gracias a la innovación y la agricultura digital, facilitando el acceso equitativo a los recursos productivos para los pequeños productores familiares y la pesca artesanal. Una mejor nutrición, gracias a programas de alimentación escolar y educación alimentaria, que incorporan el consumo de alimentos frescos y locales provenientes de la agricultura familiar. Un mejor medio ambiente, mediante la recuperación de la biodiversidad. Prácticas productivas ancestrales y la gestión sostenible de los recursos naturales, de los bosques, de la tierra, del agua y de los mares. Una mejor vida, gracias a la transformación rural e inversiones orientadas a través de la iniciativa Mano de la Mano, que construyen sociedades más prósperas e inclusivas, para que tanto mujeres como hombres cuenten con herramientas y servicios que les permitan aprovechar todo su potencial. Después de 73 años, Ecuador vuelve a ser la sede de la Conferencia Regional de la FAO para América Latina y el Caribe. Les damos la bienvenida al país de los cuatro mundos, cuya gente trabajadora y amable está construyendo sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles para las generaciones presentes y futuras. Esto es Ecuador. That is Ecuador and an applause please for our beautiful country. Ecuador of the four worlds today welcomes you and extends an invitation to work hand in hand to build more efficient, inclusive, resilient and sustainable agri-food systems for both today's generation and the future. Now we will hear from Chu Dong-gyu, the Director General of the FAO, to begin the official opening of this important event. An applause, please. Your Excellencies, Honorable President Lasso, Republic of Ecuador, Honorable Vice President Dr. Vega, dear colleagues, Mr. Chair, person of the conference, buenos well, dias, señora, señora. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Con mucho gusto. I am delighted to get to know you. I was the first time landing this continent. I was uh, 22 years old. It's just a neighbor on the Andes mountain in Peru. I was on the mountain. I look at the why I should become this beautiful country, Ecuador, as a beautiful neighbor of Peru. But finally, my dream come true. Thanks for the 36, 37 regional conference of FL. And also, I would like to mention to all of you, this conference, not only historical, and the historical memory of the regional conference. It's a historical conference because of the first time President of the Republic, Vice President of the Republic, attended the regional conference. I couldn't remember any historic record in the history of FAO. I really give big applause to my honorable president and the Vice President of the Republic of Ecuador. <laughs> Second, historical memory, because in 1949, it was the first regional conference, second of FO regional conference, also was held in Ecuador. So that's indicated 35 years 
long history commitment from all the government, all the people, and especially from uh, all the big family, lots of family. Thank you. Thank you again. I wish to thank you, the government of Ecuador, and the Excellency President Lasso for hosting this 37th session of FA Regional Conference for Latin America and the Caribbean region. Ecuador hosted the first one ever FA Regional Conference, as I said, in 1949. That time, the GDP was less than $100, but last year, it's about more than 6000 It's really historical, remarkable achievement during the even face the pandemic. So I should salute all the efforts, achievement made by the strong leadership of the president and also people of Ecuador. And now, 77 years later, Ecuador was one of the founding members, 42 founding members of FL, and we had a gathering today. It's a really critical moment of the world and we had to rethink, recite, restart from this regional conference. You can imagine 70 years later, I think I hope some of us still live and tell the story today, what happened today, 70 years later. <laughs> so uh, the world needs us to rethink, recite, restart in, and the new vision and new mission. Why we must deal with some of the greatest challenge to our food and the nutrition security, the preparation for this regional conference has been very inclusive. 36 consultations took place in, in the country, sub-regional and regional levels, involving thousands of participants from government, parliament, civil society, private sector, scientific and academic community, UN country teams, and dozens of the partner organizations. We face this moment with a clear roadmap to transform our agro system to be more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. As set out in the FO strategy framework 2022 to 31. And I look forward to the guidance from this regional conference on how to implement, adapt the framework in lines with the regional specific condition, priority, and needs. Of course, I expect you take the ownership and the partnership from this regional conference, work together with the rest of the world. The Latin America, the Caribbean regions play the fundamental role during the pandemic to ensure that the health crisis did not become a food crisis. Your success had a positive global impact, and you must continue the same efforts across your agri-food systems to the benefit of global food security. The food you produce, the export will influence the nutrition of millions of men, women, and children within and beyond this region. And the way in which you develop your agricultural forestry, fishery, and livestock will impact the global climate, as well as the ecosystem and the biodiversity of each of the countries in the region. This region has a unique world. It accounts for 13% of the global production value of agricultural and fishery commodities and it holds 34% of world available fresh water, and it's the most biodiversity region in the world. I said that diversity in the biodiversity, food, and the culture also. But you also face great challenges. The pandemic has hit Latin America and the Caribbean region hard. Hunger, food insecurity, obesity, poverty are on the rising. And the regional natural resources and ecosystem face de degradation. Most recently, your region, together with the rest of the world, is being impacted by the impact of war in the Ukraine, in particular on the price of food and fertilizer. This not only threatens the consumers and the producers, but can also affect the economic recovery from the pandemic. If it was particularly concerned about the impact on the global food security, our most recently estimate suggests that in the short term, the number of uh, undernourished people can increase another 7.8 and 13.1 million worldwide. The impact could be even worse depending on the cause of the conflict. P 
Peace is fundamental to protect people from hunger. During this regional conference, I call on you to identify the key multilateral action that can be taken to reduce the impact of the crisis. No single country is big enough or powerful enough to address this problem on its own. You must, we must act together to achieve the more. If we are ready to do its part, working with you as a region support this action to address the impact of the crisis if it has issued a call for all countries to keep the global food and fertilizer trade open, find new and more diverse food suppliers, support vulnerable groups, avoid ad hoc policy reactions, and strengthen market transparency and dialogue. Dear colleagues, FAO strategy framework responds to the challenges of our current agri-food system through the concerted and a systematic approach. And it's built on the four aspirations of a better production, better nutrition, a better environment, a better life for all, leaving no one behind. The four patterns reflect the interconnected economic, social, and environmental dimension of agri-food systems and rural development, as well as their centrality to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. For effective and lasting impact, the strategic framework and the four patterns needed to be rooted in the reality of your region with national ownership and for your implementation. With the four, four patterns, better production is uh, come the first. The region can consolidate its role as a world foremost net export of food and take advantage of increased demand for agri-food products. Latin America and the Caribbean today produce enough food in the current terms to support the lives of approximately 1.3 billion people on the earth. Yet, this will not be sufficient by 2050 when we will need to nourish almost 10 billion people on this planet. But the production means accelerate the innovation and policy needed to respond to the rise in fertilizer prices as well as other inputs. A trend that is squeezing our farmers and we must act immediately. But the production also means increased productivity for with a low environmental impact through science, innovation, digitalization, you must produce more with less. With the better nutrition, you will be addressing the alarming rise in the hunger, which has risen to uh, 60 million people, as well as the rise in the obesity, which already affects 125 million people. Better nutrition can be promoted through the legislation and other forms of regulation to discourage the consumption of highly processed foods and to promote the consumption of nutritious food. I'm pleased to see that this is already being done in 23 countries across this region. School feeding program, uh, other social protection initiatives are also needed to increase the access to the health diets and it can improve the lives of people suffering from food insecurity. A better environment is a precondition for sustaining our agri-food systems and agricultural production. And it is also our moral obligation towards the present and the future generations. Taking, taking care of the water, soil, forests, rivers, and seas must be at the heart of agri-food systems in Latin America and the Caribbean. Recognizing the protection, land, tuna rights for the indigenous people is critical for the preventing the deforestation and the conservation biodiversity. A better environment also means adapting and increasing the resilience of agri-food systems to the impact of the climate crisis, reducing the greenhouse gas emission, which today account for 40% of the regional total emissions. A better life for all means protecting and preserving the livelihood of many families that were impacted the hardest by the pandemic. A better life for all also requires a collective effort to reduce territorial, gender, ethnic, and rural able inequalities. A better life must be grounded in the great economic opportunities in the rural areas, include a cultural development and non-farm activities such as rural tourism. That's why the Ecuador have a huge potential. And I know the Honorable President 
create more opportunity for the country. Yeah? Opportunity is hope. Rural societies have been left behind, and we must take use of the innovation to increase their access to the opportunity of digitalization. Better life also requires equitable international trade, greater integration at the regional and the sub region levels. Dear colleagues, to achieve this for better, the region must step up the, its efforts to harness science and innovation at all levels of uh, its agro food systems. If it has a wealth of the resources, knowledge to support the countries at regional level, recovery efforts, and to transform agro food systems. We are committed to work as one FAO, mobilize the resources across the organization to focus on the three regional priorities you have set out. One, sustainable agro food systems for health and death. Four, two, prosperous and inclusive rural societies. Three, sustainable and resilient agriculture. This priority are at the core of the FL flagship initiative. The Hand in Hand initiative can mobilize the investment in support of agricultural rural development and is ready and aware in the six countries of this region. I know Ecuador is taking the lead of this Hand in Hand initiative together with FO and the relevant partners. The 1000 Digital Village Initiative is helping villages and rural lo localities in 14 countries to take a giant leap forward in terms of digitalization. Here is in Ecuador, we have launched the innovative territory digital hub that we have also extended to other countries soon. FAO technical platform for family farmer is accelerated innovation that allows family farmers to integrate new knowledge, science, and technology into their production system. And FAO global action on uh, one country, one priority product aims to develop the sustainable production and value chain for the special agricultural products. All these initiatives require great investment, and for this, FAO can be an important partner. In the past two years, we supported 43 investment projects in 19 countries, totally about 3.8 billion US dollars and increased by 79% of resources mobilized by FAO within and for that region. The FAO Technical Cooperation Program has been catalytic to leverage new investment and financing to support the regional priority. The regional conference is the platform to bring together best ideas, policy, innovation, technology, and the stress knowledge from the Latin America and the Caribbean. And to link them with FAO latest knowledge, science and advances to the benefit of the region and the world. FAO has the capacity to mobilize knowledge and good practice globally and to establish a partnership and synergies to make innovation ready available to all. Let us continue to work together in an efficient, effective, coherent manner. We must continue to think bigger and do concrete, transform our ecosystem and the rural development better life. For all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the General Director of the FAO for your important words. The strategic framework of the FAO for 2022-2031 promotes transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life without leaving anyone behind. And now I would like to invite Pedro Avala Gonzalez, the chair of the 37th Regional Conference of the FAO, to please take the floor. An applause, please. Thank you very much. Mr. Guillermo Lasso Mendoza, constitutional president of the Republic of Ecuador. Dr. Alfredo Borrero, Vice President of the Republic of Ecuador. Dr. Chu Dong Yu, Director General of FAO. Mr. Ariel Henry, Prime Minister of Haiti. 
joining us virtually. Mr. Juan Carlos Olguin, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Human Mobility. Mr. Julio Berdegue, Regional Representative of FAO. Mr. Hans Hugevin, Independent Chairperson of the FAO Council. Representatives of the 33 countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. Members of the National Governments Administration, representatives of diplomatic corps, representatives of civil society, private sector, guests, the media. First of all, I would like to publicly thank our President Guillermo Lasso Mendoza for his unlimited support to ensure that this 37th Regional Conference of FAO become a reality and be held here in Quito, Ecuador. 73 years ago, in 1949, Ecuador hosted the first FAO Regional Conference for Latin America and the Caribbean. And today, we are chairing it again the 37th Regional Conference. The global food crisis calls on us to plan new production strategies, strategies that involve all actors across the food chain, from our smallholders all the way to our consumers among our population. We are pursuing an agricultural system which is ready to face climate challenges so that through genetic research we can achieve new resilient and tolerant crops. The main concern of this government and ministry is to diversify with new exportable crops, never forgetting the T4R fusarium's threat against millions of hectares of banana plantations here in Ecuador. Due to this, we will enter into an agreement with the University of Berkeley, with Mr. Aspol and Ms. Jennifer Dona, Nobel Prize winner, who discovered a new technology called CRISPR for genomic modifications which allow for a new Cavendish variety which is more resistant and allows for better quality production than what we currently have. Chairperson, Vice President, here we are, bearing witness to what you have said. With your permission, President, I would like to introduce Mr. Brian Ostuck from the Genomics Institute of the University of Berkeley. Please, go ahead. Buenos dias, everyone. Good morning. Should I need to share my screen still? Everybody um, can see that? I can. Can you hear me okay? Can someone uh, chat me or something? We can hear you. Perfect. Okay, great. It's a great pleasure today to be able to uh, address this uh, regional meeting of FAO. And um, what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes is to just give you a brief um, introduction to what we're planning to do between um, a collaborative effort between um, the Innovative Genomics Institute at UC Berkeley, ESPOL, and the government of Ecuador, the Ministry of, of Agriculture. Our strategy is to use gene editing 
strategies to control Panama disease and save the banana. This is a new technology that is currently being deployed across many crops in the world and really is the next um, generation of plant breeding. Here's the problem. Um, fusarium wilt or Panama disease has a, is a serious disease around the world. But just in 2019, this particular um, fungal strain of fusarium landed in Colombia. It is now in Peru and it threatens Ecuador to basically cause destruction of the banana industry in these various crops. It's quite a devastating disease. And you can see from the right hand slide that it causes a, a wilt in the um, vascular tissue of the banana plant and eventually wilts the entire plant. From this particular slide here, you can see that this particular fungus has a long history and is found in many parts of the world. And more importantly, you can see that it's in Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. So it really is threatening Latin America. It's currently well established in Australia and India, Indonesia, and other parts of Africa where it's a serious problem. In 2019, the University of California, Berkeley, and ESPOL signed a memorandum of understanding to basically start to develop a cooperative program to attack this disease problem. And so this was signed in 2019. Unfortunately, it was, as we all know, COVID hit and things were slowed for um, a considerable amount of time. And then just two weeks ago, a large delegation, you can see the Minister of Agriculture, and this is Jennifer Doudna. Jennifer Doudna is the uh, discoverer of CRISPR technology and won the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And she's the director of the institute where I currently work. So you can see many people here from ESPOL and also the Minister of Agriculture here. We were also um, very graciously attended by our chancellor of the university, Carol Christ, along with Jennifer. And the delegates got to meet everybody and they aff affirmed their um, commitment to using this technology to try to solve the banana problem in South America. The Innovative Genomics Institute is located on the campus of the University of California at Berkeley. It's divided into four programs. It has a major program in human health where we're doing gene editing and trying to solve uh, genetic diseases such as sickle cell anemia in um, humans. We're making new advances in genome engineering. We also have a unit um, that's involved with um, public education. We feel this is very important as we go forward to, to explain to the public exactly what are the benefits of gene editing. And of course, there's a unit which I am the director of, of sustainable agriculture. I don't want to go into too much scientific detail here for this particular um, audience. We'll be having another presentation tomorrow with myself and David Zilberman, another professor at Berkeley, where we'll go into more in depth. But essentially, if you look at this particular lower right-hand corner here, genome editing um, is really cuts down on the um, timeline, which you can produce new elite disease-resistant varieties. And it really, as opposed to just classical breeding or, or GMOs or mutation breeding in this particular case. Now, again, this technology is, um, it seems complicated, but it actually, you can do this actually in your kitchen if you had the correct tools. It's a very straightforward technology and it's very robust. And we're able to actually make precise insertions of DNA or alterations. Think of it as a typewriter and then we can actually um, go in and change the sentence structure in a very precise manner. Our strategy is the following. We're going to use gene editing to create durable resistance in banana to this Fusarium tropical race four. So at the IGI, we're developing a high throughput genetic transformation and gene editing system in banana in cooperation with ESPOL and the Ministry of Agriculture. And we're employing um, a particular class of genes called morphogenic genes that really just speeds up the process and allows us to be able to get um, edited plants back in a um, much faster manner. 
some of our initial targets will be genes that we know that in other crops, when you make mutations of these genes, they give rise to durable resistance. The methods that we will use will basically be DNA free methods, and these will not be GMO plants. So we think there will be a high level of acceptance in the community. In addition, we plan to identify disease resistance genes in wild species of Musa, which is banana, and create gene stacks that contain multiple disease resistance genes. And finally, we are um, investigating some classic technology where we can graft resistant rootstocks onto um, Cavendish to get disease resistant plants. So that's in essence, that's the program that we are um, undertaking. And as I said, tomorrow uh, in more depth with the uh, 33 um, ministers, we'll be discussing more precise details in this. So just finally, um, this is the view from our campus of the University of California. We're very fortunate to have a beautiful view of the Golden Gate Bridge. And we really look forward to establishing this cooperative relationship with ESPOL and the Ministry of Agriculture in Ecuador. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very clear comments on the importance of technological innovation and research with a view to responding to the conditions and priorities of each country in Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, we would like to invite the Constitutional President of the Republic of Ecuador, Mr. Guillermo Lasso Mendoza, to take the floor. Let's give him a big round of applause. Welcome, Mr. President. Dr. Alfredo Borreo Vega, Constitutional Vice President of the Republic. Dr. Chu Dong Yu, Director General of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Mr. Ariel Henry, Prime Minister of Haiti, who is joining us virtually. Mr. Juan Carlos Alguin, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Human Mobility. Mr. Pedro Alava, Minister of Agriculture and Livestock. Mr. Julio Berdegue, Regional Representative of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Mr. Hans Hugevin, independent chairperson of the FAO Council. Ladies and gentlemen, representing the 33 governments of Latin America and the Caribbean. Authorities of the, of the national government, members of the diplomatic corps, and international accredited organizations to the government of the Republic of Ecuador. Representatives of the private sector and civil society, distinguished friends from the media, dear friends. A very special greeting goes out to the Director General of FAO, Dr. Chu Dong Yu. Welcome, everybody, to Ecuador. Distinguished friends, Ecuador is once again hosting this important event. After 73 years, we are very pleased and reiterate our commitment to ensuring that the world can achieve high quality, sustainable food production in time. This conference 
is an extremely important forum where we can debate the challenges and priorities pertaining to food and agriculture. It is also an opportunity for us to coordinate in a concerted fashion the protection of the resources of social capital and the economy that depend on agricultural production. At this time, where we have almost overcome the pandemic, we must all work to capitalize on the use of natural resources that our countries and millions of people require. A UN report published last December states that hunger in Latin America and the Caribbean increased by almost 14 million people in 2021, reaching a total of 60 million people. In contrast to this alarming figure, a research report also published by the UN states that every year 931 million tons of food are wasted every year in the world. There's no doubt that we are doing something wrong. On the one hand, millions of human beings are suffering from hunger, and on the other, tons of food are being thrown away. These are serious problems that the world must tackle urgently. Thankfully, there is some good news as well. During the pandemic, the world's economies were struck hard, especially in this part of the world. However, no country in this part of the world halted production, therefore guaranteeing local supply and allowing for some exports. Distinguished friends, from the beginning of my mandate, we began to develop an ambitious vaccination plan whose success was recognized at the global level and allowed us to reactivate our, our economy quickly. This health-related measure, as well as other targeted measures, have ensured that Ecuador be able to essentially go back to normal. And we now hold most in-person meetings almost at capacity. In order to tackle the Im impact of the, pandemic, of the pandemic, we developed a program with a 30-year program targeting entrepreneurs with a low interest rate and in particular family farmers in Ecuador where women are primarily the heads of household. We have allocated millions of dollars to this credit program, the cheapest in the world. And thanks to this, thousands of Ecuadorians have started a small business that now allows them to support their families. We began with the agriculture sector so that we could boost our production in the field and generate more rural employment. We also feel that production and food security are determining factors when seeking to tackle chronic child malnutrition as we have been doing since the very first day of our mandate. Our slogan is more Ecuador in the world and more of the world in Ecuador. That means opening up to new markets, diversifying our agricultural supply and placing our commodities across all five continents. Ecuador isn't just shrimp, tuna, bananas, 
cocoa and flowers, we have other commodities that are starting to be better known and very much appreciated beyond our borders, such as avocado, cañamo, pitahaya, tropical fruits, and many more. We wish to produce more and export more because that translates into more jobs for thousands of farmers and well-being for their families. Also, as a banana and plantain producing country, we are aware that we need to link with producing countries in terms of developing genetic development if we are to tackle TR4 fusarium wilt. In Ecuador, we have taken measures against this fungus and we have been able to protect our crops effectively thanks to the successful work of our agriculture ministry. And of course, we must not forget that we need to find answers that offset climate change that our planet is suffering from, which has a direct negative impact on our agricultural soils. Distinguished guests, this important event comes at a critical time for mankind, at a time of conflict between Russia and Ukraine. We all know that wars are one of the main drivers of hunger and food insecurity on the planet. Due to all this, I hope that at the end of the 37th Regional Conference of FAO for Latin America and the Caribbean, we will be able to promote the necessary actions for the most disenfranchised sectors. Our work will always be aligned with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which seeks to end hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture, leaving no one behind. Distinguished friends, please allow me to conclude with a quick anecdote. On August 5th, 1949, the Ambato earthquake hit. This is a city in the central mountains of Ecuador which killed over 6,000 people and left some 10,000 people homeless five weeks later. After this tragedy, in a country that was still mourning the people it lost, the first FAO conference in Ecuador was held, chaired by Gallo Plaza Lasso, who was also the OAS secretary later. He focused on the field, on agriculture. He always dreamed of an eminently agricultural, prosperous, productive country, just like we aim for now. He was one of the first people to speak of food security and of its importance for the planet. He also provided farmers with land, farmers who for centuries had depended on a semi-feudal working system. Thus, Gallo Plasalasso was at the forefront of agricultural reform, a reform which happened more broadly years later. I will conclude with some of the words that he spoke some 70 years ago in a conference like this. In our America, a continent and grain basket of the future with its wealth of unexploited natural resources this continent 
should have an increasingly large role in agricultural production worldwide. America needs to be aware of its fate and responsibility. And if we are to achieve better living conditions in the future for the disenfranchised, it is crucial that we achieve better nutrition for all. Dear guests, experts, and local authorities, I wish you every success in this 37th Regional Conference of FAO for Latin America and the Caribbean. Your input is paramount when it comes to mitigating hunger worldwide. Millions of people will be grateful to you as Ecuador's government is grateful to you now. Thank you very much. May God bless you all. Welcome. This is no doubt a historic time for Ecuador. After 73 years, our country has the honor of once again hosting this important event for Latin America and the Caribbean. We, of course, would like to express thanks to the constitutional president of the Republic of Ecuador, Mr. Guillermo Lasso Mendoza. The authorities will now stand in front of the plenary for the official inaugural picture for the event and the heads of delegation of the 36 members of FAO present here. Here comes the official picture. We would be grateful to all our virtual guests as well as our in-person guests for being here. We invite you to get to know our country, our landscape, the wealth of natural resources, and the huge contribution of the country to food security. Again, we would like to invite authorities to stand at the front of the plenary hall for the inaugural picture with the heads of delegation of the 33 FAO members so that we can take the official picture. Esta es una foto que marca historia, por supuesto, en nuestro país. This is a historic moment for our country because 73 years later, we have the honor of hosting this important event for Latin America and the Caribbean. Señor Ministro, ¿cómo está? Placer. ¿Sí? De esta manera queda plasmada la foto oficial de este. We have now crystallized this important event thanks to the official picture. We have 33 member delegations after 73 years from the first regional conference here. This is a historic moment for our country. Thank you very much for visiting Ecuador. Thank you for visiting this wonderful country that greets you warmly. The president is greeting a few 
representatives of our delegations from the countries that are here with us today. We truly appreciate your president. We would like to thank the constitutional president of the Republic of Ecuador with a warm round of applause, Mr. Guillermo Lasso Mendoza, who joined us here for the inaugural ceremony, as well as the vice president of the Republic, Alfredo Borrero. Let's have a big round of applause for both of them. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us for this inaugural ceremony. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for being with us. We'd like to ask the delegations to please once again take your assigned seats so that we can continue with the official opening of this very important conference, which uh, we will now be continuing. Let's please take our seats as the President and Vice President of Ecuador are leaving, and we will continue. I would like to ask everyone to please take their seats so we can continue with the conference. We would like to inform the media that once we conclude this opening session, we will be holding a press conference upstairs with the Minister of Agriculture and Livestock of Ecuador, the Minister of Foreign Relations and Mobility, the representative of the FAO, and the chief economist of the FAO with the media. That is in the Apincel room. We will be holding a press conference with our authorities at that time. Thank you very much. I would like to request your cooperation. Please take your seats so that we can continue, please, with the conference. To our protocol team, please assist all of the attendees from the delegations that are with us. I would like to ask for your cooperation so that we can continue. We have a very important uh, virtual presentation from Haiti with the Prime Minister who is with us. He is already ready so that we can please uh, continue uh, with the conference and the presentation that he has already prepared. Please take your seats. And once again, let's please take our seats. Dear heads of delegations, please, let's take our seats. Once again, I would like to request you to join us at the head table, Mr. Edward Centeno, the chair of the 36th period of sessions of the Regional Conference for Latin America and the Caribbean for the FAO. Por favor. Please. We already have the chair of the 36th period of sessions. Please come to the table. Delegaciones, por favor, que aún. Dear delegations, please. Those of you who are still standing, I would like to ask you to please take your seats. Our head tables already ready with the authorities who are with us today. Dear delegates, please take your seats. It's important for us to get started. Once again, we have a presentation that will be given virtually. It's already ready to share with you. And therefore, we would like to ask you to please cooperate by sitting down and taking your seats.
Nuevamente. Once again, we're ready. We are ready to continue with the opening ceremony. Thank you very much. Please take your seats, those of you who are still standing. Please cooperate so that we can get going. Para dar curso. Continuing with today's order of the day, we would like to give special greetings to Dr. Ariel Henry, the Prime Minister of Haiti, who is with us. He is joining us virtually, and he will be giving his presentation now. An applause, please, for the Prime Minister of Haiti, who is already ready to give his presentation. Your Excellence, uh, to the President of Ecuador, Your Excellence, Vice President of the Re Republic of Ecuador, Dear Director General of the FAO, Dear Chair of the Regional Conference, Dear Assistant Director of the FAO, Ladies and Gentlemen, Dear Ministers of Member States of the FAO, Honorable Members of Parliament, Ladies and Gentlemen, Representatives of the Diplomatic and Consular Corps, Ladies and gentlemen, representatives of international organizations, dear members of different delegations from states of Latin America and the Caribbean, ladies and gentlemen, dear representatives of civil society, ladies and gentlemen, dear representatives of associations from agriculture, ladies and gentlemen. Around the world today, food security and nutritional security remain a source of major concern. Nearly 2.37 billion people do not have access to appropriate nutrition. That was the case in 2020. That is 320 million people more in just one year. No region has been spared this scourge. In Haiti, where 3% or rather 5,000 people face acute food security, we need urgent assistance for period from March to June 2022. Since the COVID-19 pandemic was unleashed, vulnerabilities and inequalities have grown, particularly when women in rural environments, children, and indigenous people are concerned. Therefore, the involvement of the international community to eliminate hunger in all forms of malnutrition around the world remains the same. We have made some progress, but we all agree that the main factors compromising food security and nutrition worldwide are invariable. We see economic challenges, which are quite large. We also face climate chaos, conflict, and yet poverty and inequality are caused by structural shortcomings that amplify shortcomings around the world. Around the world. We unanimously recognize that transforming our food systems are is indispensable. We noted this at the UN summit on the food systems in 2021. On behalf of Haiti, this transformation must address three major challenges. Nutrition, socioeconomic and environmental factors. 
Along these lines, we reiterate our commitment to build political stability and a security environment in order to facilitate supplying urban markets. On the other hand, to develop appropriate financial facilities to finance the food system. To develop strategies to add more resilience and more production to our territories. And finally, to adopt modern training and knowledge systems in order to improve the decision-making process and promote interaction between all stakeholders involved. I would like to call for strengthening uh, technical cooperation programs at the FAO at the regional level to help countries according to their needs and to draft public policies with the objective of reducing poverty, hunger, and malnutrition by 2030. The Haitian government will continue to work in concert with the FAO in the framework of the Hand in Hand initiative, which aims to accelerate agricultural transformation and rural development that is sustainable. I will conclude my words with my strong belief that the conversations and exchanges that we hold at this conference, we will reach regional consensus on the way in which the FAO will support the various countries of our region with an aim of ensuring food security, better nutrition, and healthy diets that are accessible to all along with supported economic support for peace and development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Prime Minister of Haiti for his intervention. Preso, the Minister of Agriculture and the Chair of the 37th Conference, and he has, we have, please join me in applauding and receiving the Vice Chair. And now I would invite Mr. Eduardo Centeno, President of the 36th session of the Regional Conference of the FAO. Let's have a round of applause for him, please. Your Excellency Q. Donju, Director General of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO. Your Excellency Pedro Avala, President of the Regional Conference for Latin America and the Caribbean, the 37th session. Honorable ministers, representatives, and heads of delegations of member states, special guests, joining us today. It is an honor to address the conference today in representation of the countries of the region of Latin America and the Caribbean to present the summary of the recommendations of the FAO for Latin America and the Caribbean that Nicaragua had the honor of hosting virtually from 19 to 21 of October 2020. The document reference is C-2017,
and I will respect regional and world aspects on policies and regulation. But before doing that, I would like to underscore and express my appreciation to the 545 participants from 33 member countries, including two vice presidents of the Republic, one prime minister, 92 ministers and deputy ministers, 14 governors, two observers, representatives of United Nations organizations, nine intergovernmental organizations, ten representatives from the organizations of civil society, one representative of the parliamentary fronts against hunger, five representatives of civil society, and five representatives of scientific and academic institutions. In the conference in Nicaragua, representatives underscored the importance of the 2030 Agenda and recommended that the FAO support members in moving forward on fulfilling it, focusing their efforts in the agri-food and food business nutrition in sustainable development without leaving anyone behind. Your Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, the regional conference felt that the following matters of policy for the region, A, the impact of COVID-19 on food and, agri and agriculture in Latin America and the Caribbean and the FAO's response, B, sustainable agri-food systems in order to provide healthy diets for everyone, C, hand in hand to achieve prosperous and inclusive rural societies and D, sustainable and resilient farming or agriculture. Your Excellencies, President, the Regional Conference recognized the relevance of the strategic framework of the FAO supporting its foundations on sustainable development and recommended that the FAO continue to prioritize the strengthening of gender focus, youth focus and resilience and inclusion of the original or native peoples, indigenous peoples, Afro descendants, women and youth and that it adapt policies, approaches and assistance to the national priorities and capacities, taking into account the heterogeneous nature of the members of this region and the singular vulnerability of small island developing states. Within this context and with respect to the matters related to policies and regulation, the Regional Conference for Latin America and the Caribbean invites this conference to consider and to agree that the FAO, one, provide support in the design, implementation, and design of policies and programs for recovery from the COVID-19 crisis and to facilitate mobilization of public and private investments and public-private partnerships for recovery of food systems, agricultural production, and other non-agricultural rural activities such as tourism. Two, that it support the adoption of measures and investments aimed at achieving sustainable agri-food systems to provide healthy diets to all, providing support and mobilization of resources and public resources and private resources for their food systems, foc focusing attention on the increase of food supply and physical access to healthy diets and in facilitation of economic information and habits of consumption to achieve habits of consumption to achieve healthy diets number 3 to provide promote resilient and inclusive agricultural systems to have rural societies that are inclusive and prosperous stressing the hand-in-hand -hand initiative as an instrument that focuses attention on eradication of poverty and extreme hunger in lagging areas, emphasizing 
production and the creation of new opportunities in rural areas. Number four, that it support members in increasing sustainability and resiliency of agriculture and food systems, as well as the producers, communities, terrestrial and sea ecosystems in view of the social and economic crises. And finally, support implementation of the International Year of Fruit and Vegetable 2021, fisheries and artisanal aquaculture for 2022. Finally, Mr. President, on behalf of Commandant Daniel Ortega Salveda, President of the country and in my, acting in my capacity, capacity as the chair of the 36th LARC for this region. I would once again like to thank members for the confidence deposited in my country. I reassert before you all our satisfaction with the strategic vision of the FAO and the need to continue to have the organization for technical cooperation and mobilization of resources so as to be able to achieve the goals of eradicating hunger, doing away with poverty, and fostering economic, social, orderly, and sustainable use programs moving forward so as to achieve the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your intervention, Mr. Edward Centeno. And now to close this opening ceremony, we would now invite Mr. Hans Hugevin, independent chairperson of the FAO Council. Kindly join me in welcoming him with a round of applause and our welcome to Ecuador, sir. Your Excellency, Vice Chairperson of this regional conference, Honorable Ministers, Director General, Distinguished Delegates, buenos dias, good morning. It's an honor and pleasure for me to participate in the 37th session of the FEO Regional Conference for Latin America and the Caribbean. Please allow me to convey my appreciation to the government of Ecuador and the people of Ecuador for the excellent organization of this regional conference and, of course, for their warm hospitality in their beautiful country. While countries recover from the severe impact of COVID-19, food insecurity and climate change continues to pose an exist existential threat to humanity, also for your region. And we are now also confronted with another global crisis for food security, as we are discussing that this morning and this afternoon. And I adhere the statements of the Secretary General of the United Nations and the Director General of FEO at the G7 Extraordinary Meeting of Ministers of Agriculture about Ukraine-Russian conflict. And I quote, we deplore the loss, deplore the loss of life and displacement of populations. We join the call of the UN Secretary General to end the war, restore peace, and protect people's lives. We stand on the side of the suffering people in the Ukraine crisis and express our solidarity with the people, particularly the ones deriving their livelihoods from agriculture. Conflicts and wars in many regions of the world cause unbelievable human suffering, food insecurity, and migration of millions of people. Food prices are spiking and developing countries are hit hardest again, as we saw this morning with the presentation of Maximo. We have to join our efforts to work together within the mandate of FEO to find actions and solutions on the immediate term, the midterm and the long term to ensure that we can maintain and get global food security. And let us not forget that hunger and food security are the foremost and first big challenge we are facing today. Our world is changing quickly around us. Innovations spring up daily like seedlings in spring. But this ex expansion is not without consequences. Despite the progress, more than 800 million people live in hunger. 
Three billion people do not have access to safe, affordable, and nutritious food. And two billion people suffer from nutritious-related diseases. The dots don't connect. One third of our globally produced food is wasted every year. And this is why children are still hungry. And let us not forget, often we don't speak about it anymore, but we have our challenge to feed 10 billion people in 2050. And we know that we need to improve and increase our agricultural productivity in a sustainable way. Latin America and the Caribbean is at the foremost on, of the global fight against hunger. But the progress made in previous 20 years was hardly hit by the pandemic. And your region is one of the most affected regions by COVID. After five constructive years, years of growth, the number of severely food insecure people has jumped by 27.5 million people between 2019 and 2020, and by 60.2 million if the moderately food insecure people is included. Additionally, the number of undernourished people grew by 30.8 million people in 2020. These are staggering facts, but there is also a positive message. The COVID-19 crisis has also brought increasing cooperation among your countries. We built ur urban rural independencies and demonstrated the resilience of agri-food systems. Most production growth in the last decade has come from productivity improvements. And the productivity growth across the region has been driven by science and innovation, research and development, accompanying investments in agriculture enabling environment, and specific support to farmers across the countries. I would like to compliment you with the growth of sustainable agriculture in your region. And it's predicted that it will still be 14% in the coming decade. And especially, of course, as was said already this morning, driven by exports and domestic economic growth. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, science and innovation, including new digital tools and technologies, offer an opportunity in addressing your challenges, particularly in the context of increasing demand for the region's food products and changing changes in consumer demands. I would like to compliment your region with actively promoting healthier diets and countering overweight obesity, and non-communicable diseases. Governments in a growing number of countries are employing a range of tools to achieve this, such as food-based dietary guidelines. Given also the threats to phytosanitary and animal health threats, the implementation of a One Health approach is of eminent importance. Furthermore, I would like to applaud your region for addressing the food losses in your region. You are really investing in better harvesting and processing techniques, wool roads and electricity infrastructure, and modernization of value chains and markets. With this, your region can be an example for other regions. And of course, we know how important in this respect also the promotion of food safety standards is crucial. But we also know that your region's national resources are challenged by climate change and water scarcity, so your challenges are enormous. For the four of the top ten most climate affected countries of the world are in your region. And in the last decade, climate change accounted for 46% of global climate disaster losses. Nevertheless, there is also a growing number, a growing number of public, private and public private initiatives aimed at accelerating adaption and mitigation, including decoupling community value chains from deforestation, supporting science and innovation for low emission livestock systems, strengthening the adap adaptive capacity of the fisheries and aquaculture sector, amongst others. Notably, the policies that have recognized entitled 227 million of hectares in favor of indigenous communities, and it really should be mentioned and applauded. Excellencies, we can, more, we can produce more food than ever, but biodiversity and the amount of arable land are decreasing. There's a clear need for a more systemic and coordinated approach 
among key sectors and stakeholders for the sustainable management of forest biodiversity, as well as improving agriculture productivity. I compliment you already with existing initiatives which are ongoing in your countries. And again, with these initiatives, also presented in Rome, other regions can learn from your initiatives. But it is also clear that the shortcomings of our food systems and also in your regions have been laid bare. We need transformative change and we need it now. There are no excuses anymore for not acting. Sustainable agri-food systems are and should be part of the solution. And Director General, FEO is needed more than ever to achieve our noble goals which are in your mandate and to join efforts to continue and to be directed transforming agriculture food systems for global food security. And as I said before, all stakeholders have to take their respective responsibilities and work together to the achievements not only of FEO goals, but also the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals of Agenda 2030. And of course, it's up of utmost importance to achieve those Sustainable Development Goals. And we, are know, we are know that we are lacking behind. But with the energy and your initiatives, we can show the world how we can clo come closer to our achievements of the Sustainable Development Goals. We, especially FEO, could support your efforts. For example, through supporting technical assistance and dialogue to foster a multi-stakeholders approach. Generate and share data and evidence, for example, for more and better trade. Support capacity development, intersectoral dialogue and training. Increase sustainability and increase sustainable production through science and innovation. Enhancing access for small and medium farmers to credits. Enhancing ecosystem services and biodiversity for better production and better nutrition. And last but not least, reducing carbon emissions. Allow me to recall the strong momentum with, uh, with which the United Nations Food System Summit gave us for food security. And 23 countries of your region affirmed their commitments to move towards more inclusive and more sustainable agri-food systems. And the leading role of FAO was also highlighted during this event. In this regard, we should be proud that FAO is hosting the Coordination Hub to provide the coordination for the follow-up actions, as well as to potentially leverage key partnerships in the wider ecosystem of support. And of course, FEO knows that FEO can count on their members. And I would like to compliment your region again for the emphasis given not only today, but also on your policies to the declaration of its natural resources, as well as the understanding that radical changes are needed in the interaction between agriculture and the environment. But it has to be done in a balanced way, balanced focusing on agriculture, improving agricultural productivity in an environmental way, also looking to the environmental consequences. And this way, sustainable agriculture can be, become a central part of the solution, not only towards more sustainable agriculture, but also coping with the changes of the climate. And for the changes facing in your, for the challenges facing your region, the role of innovation and technology as an accelerator is crucial. Supporting the shift to more sustainable agri-food systems and scaling up these, these initiatives is indeed a priority. That's why it's so important that we will and hopefully can adopt the FAO policy on climate change and study on climate change as well as a strategy of the innovation at the Council in June. The efforts made by your region should continue, and I also encourage the region to support the implementation of such FEO corporate initiatives as the Hand in Hand initiatives. It was already mentioned by several ministers. It's a strong ini initiative which needs further implementation. But we also should look to and another important initiative, and that's the Small Island Development States Platform. Also there, we need strong support. The Small Island, Small Island Development States 
can provide the needed support for the small island, small island, small island development states to cope with their specific problems related to climate change and related to agriculture. And given their special position and vulnerabilities to climate change, we should join their efforts, support, should support their efforts, work inclusively and show solidarity because they need it. Of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. It relies on the means of implementation. And in, in this regard, your emphasis on the role of the private sector, in particular the food industries, is crucial in making your agri-food systems more sustainable, more resilient, more inclusive, and more efficient, and to provide better nutrition for all. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge the special and crucial role of women, youth, but also indigenous peoples and local communities, which they play to plan your future. Acknowledging their role is the first step, but walking the talk is even more important. Excellencies, Chairperson, to conclude, the Regional Conference for Latin America and the Caribbean has a unique role to play, not only for your region, but also for the global policies and the global community of FEO. I firmly believe that continuing the engagement and commitment of the governments in your region will do much to ensure FEO's continued role to serve and fight for global food security. FEO can and should be an effective agent in a struggle to free the world of hunger and malnutrition, leaving really, really nobody behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hugerman. With this important presentation and messages, we conclude this inaugural session that gives way to the formal beginning of the ministerial sessions of the 37th Regional Conference of the FAO for Latin America and the Caribbean, in which 33 countries will share technological innovations, institutional and organizational that will contribute to face the main challenges for a better production, a better nutrition, and a better environment, and a better life without leaving anyone behind. We want to thank each one of you for your participation, and of course remind you that in 10 minutes, we will resume our conferences. We only have 10 minutes, please, so if you wish to have a coffee or water, it is available for you. Thank you for being in our country. Ecuador, the capital of the Ecuadorian Quito, the face of God, warmly receives you, so we welcome you to this wonderful country. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes 
mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural, 
y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres, mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima conferencia regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años. 
y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos. Y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los sistemas alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. 
Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras. Y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer festival latinoamericano de la juventud rural. Y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques, llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres, mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, Siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima conferencia regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeado
ministers from other countries will express their comments with respect to the innovations presented. Ministers will also have six minutes to present their comments. Interventions of ministers will be undertaken in alphabetic order of their country's names. Afterwards, we will open the floor of the plenary for comment suggestions and those interventions will have a limit of five minutes and they will be undertaken until the time available for the session is depleted. The general summary of the presentations and of the comments by the chair will be undertaken at the end of the thematic sessions at the end of today's day. Thank you very much, Chair. We'll begin with the thematic session, Better Production Innovations in Relation to Small-Scale Family Farming and small and medium-sized enterprises in the agri-food system, in the agri-food sector. I will give the floor as, a, as the Secretary inform us. We have a number of um, countries that have already registered. We'll begin with Antigua and Barbuda, followed by Belize and a number of other countries, Cuba, Guyana, Jamaica, and so on. So I'll give the floor to the first group of ministers and high authorities to make their presentation and the innovation develop in their country for better production. Each has six minutes. Let's stick with the time. And I will now call on um, the Honorable Minister of Antigua and Barbuda to make her presentation. Antigua and Barbuda, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Your Excellencies from the head table, thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to try my best to keep within the timelines. Mr. Chair, as you would appreciate, Antigua and Barbuda has been no different in that it has been significantly affected by the impact of the COVID-19. Further disruptions are expected as a result of the events with Ukraine and Russia. However, Antigua and Barbuda is not endowed with naturally occurring fresh water which is one of the main resources required for sustainable development. Production predicated on rainfall patterns is typified by seasonality and variability in quality and quantity of production, acting as a major deterrent to having any significant impact on reducing the food import bill. The inability to improve production due to unavailability and access to sufficient water has had significant implications on our agricultural sector. I'd first like to look at the problem, or as we would say, the challenge. Of course, we're asked to increase sustainable agricultural production, but in order for us I apologize. I want to make sure. Yes, we're asked to increase our, our agricultural production. And by virtue of being a member of CARICOM as a small island developing state, we are asked to ensure that by 2025, we can reduce our import bill by 25%. Mr. Chairman, climate change has proven to be a major impediment to the growth and development of the agri-sector within Antigua and Barbuda as a small island developing state. Evidently, droughts have become more prevalent in our region, and experts predict that this will continue to have an adverse effect on both crop and livestock production. Mr. Chairman, moreover, our region's development continues to be constrained by high vulnerability to natural disasters such as hurricanes, protected drought, and others. Additionally, the aging farming population is also an important factor that presents an imminent threat to food security. Antigua and Barbuda is highly dependent on desalination water. The physical water scarcity um, has shown over the period in the inability to really attract and have groundwater or surface water, I should say. 
we continue to have the increasing threat of impact of climate change. And I think we should highlight here that despite us being looked at as um, our GDP and, and what improvements we have made in growth, we continue as SIDS to be a vulnerable state that can easily, within one hurricane, suffer significantly. As I indicated, Antigua and Barbuda is highly dependent on desalination water, which supplies at the moment 92% of Antigua and Barbuda's water. The average cost of water there um, is $12.67 in EC dollars, and fresh water is $2.60. But the consumption is primarily for the domestic household, and only a minimal amount is used in the agricultural sector. So what have we done? We have introduced our, um, the mobile solar power desalination plants as a means of ensuring that we are able to improve our production of water for our farmers. And I have to commend FAO because they have been playing a significant role with Antigua and Barbuda in doing this. We have introduced policies related to the expansion of ponds and dams to allow for more surface water. And we have done so through the government insisting that there is a policy related that we will ensure that we subsidize the cost related to doing so. We have also encouraged more of our farmers to engage in hydroponics, which of course you will appreciate, reduces the use of the amount of water and allows you to regulate, as well as other innovation, such as irrigation systems. We also use the greenhouse system and drip irrigation for greater water efficiency. Mr. Chairman, as I conclude, what we need is support, continued support, as it relates to ensuring that we are able, as a small island developing state, to improve and have sustainable production. We need to ensure that we have better technical capacity as well as other resources to include financial resources through relevant agencies and private sector investment to ensure that we are able to improve our water production for our farmers. That, in an essence, is the presentation of Antigua and Barbuda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antigua and Barbuda. I will now give the floor to Belize virtually. They will make their presentation. Belize, you have the floor. No. No. Belize hearing us? If not, we can move to Cuba, and then we'll take Belize after Cuba. Cuba, you have the floor. Hello. See. Si. Yes. Thank you very much, Chair. Distinguished representatives of the FAO, Mr. Berdegues, ministers of, and representatives of countries joining us, guests, I would like to say on behalf of the government of Cuba, our appreciation to the government of, the, of Ecuador for the excellent organization of this event, as well as to the Secretariat of the FAO for its leadership. I would like 
in the first slide to explain the context that we have before us with with respect to what we are experiencing for the production of food related to the economic crises, obviously climate change, the pandemic that has accelerated the process as a catalyzer, it, population aging in some countries, migration, internal migration that has also reduced uh, labor in fields and in Cuba with the same situation being faced by the area we also have a worsening, unprecedented historical blockage or uh, embargo. And this has worsened the problem to produce food and to achieve uh, food security and sovereignty in our country. But as the policy of our country, the ach actions achieved, and we are devoted to implementation of a nutrition, education, and food security pro program in our country that's unprecedented. It's a system within the four improvements within the FAO. It practically improves the improvements that have been underscored here today. We have also undertaken the three measures for the system that work directly with producers to begin to materialize implementation of the sovereignty and the security system, the food sovereignty and security system in the country. Our minister, together with other ministries in the country, is working on the four betters of the FAO, better production, nutrition, better climate change, and better life. At this important event, I, I, I'm to speak about better production, but I'd like to do this uh, to be able to do it, to be able to have a better implementation of what the basis is of all the others, that is to improve agri-food or agricultural production for all the others. As a result, the sovereignty plan, as explained, is very important and the food security with its pillars of a sustainable system based on marketing, access, resources and education and uh, food education to be able to close this and lead to a better life for our population. This has enabled us to have a better presence of science here. Here when we at the excellent conference we've been able to take a look at the wonderful presentations on scientific point of view as well as academic point of view. This important decision of the 63 measures by the government recently approved in the country as a an innovation uh, dealing with organizational matters that enable us to expedite work and to bring these to the ground and allow for them to be implemented. There are seven groups of measures that br bring to ground what I was mentioning. The first is structural, based on the strengthening on, of local farming systems and the strengthening of municipal systems. This is also included in our constitution. The role of the municipality to make local systems dynamic and enable to have a, a bottom-up improvement system, financing investment and foreign investment. Here we thank the FAO for mobilization of funds in its support to this plan and mobilizing funds to be able to invest in our local agri-food farming systems. So the, 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 uh, far, the farming development system providing loans to our farmers in ensuring that all of the farmers are able to deal with the changes from climate change and loans to producers for livestock, for instance, uh, at over 10 years and zero interest rates, all of this facilitated by the FAO so that our producers are able to increase their production. Because if we sow more and have gr greater farmlands devoted to grazing for livestock, we will have improvements in the fields. The productive and cooperative programs, uh, the efficient labor, having producers 
that are in a better living conditions can acquire more land and thus continue to produce. Science and innovation is also essential in this system and the development of communities and of farmers to be able to continue moving forward on these topics. Despite the adverse situation of Cuba, accompanied by the FA, we ratified its will to continue to work with us with our modest practices, with our sister nations in the region, particularly with the Car Caribbean. Cooperation and solidarity need to be the words of today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cuba. And delegates, let's stick to our time. We have a number of contributors more. I will now give the floor to Belize. Belize on virtually, so I'll invite Belize now to take the floor. Good morning, Chair of the 27th Black Conference, Director General and member, members of the head table, distinguished delegates and virtual participants. The agriculture and food sector of Belize is a main pillar of our economy, contributing approximately $600 million annually to economic output, representing 80% of our domestic exports and directly employing more than 18% of our population. The effects of COVID-19 have been impactful and now we are faced with global inflationary pressure and high instability. This situation has called for my government to take drastic measures to transform the agri-food sector of Belize. As a matter of urgency, on being newly elected in November of 2020, the government of Belize implemented its planned Belize agriculture policy and commenced prioritizing the sectors of agriculture which are essential for food security, foreign exchange earnings, employment, and rural development. Thereafter, the ministry implemented policies to support local production using its Buy Belize campaign. With this initiative, there was an increase in the production and purchasing of local products. In another initiative, with the support of the government of Japan, containers were retrofitted to accommodate coal storage units and place in strategic production locations throughout the country to maintain quality produce for longer periods. Tax exemption supporting is also being granted for value-added inputs such as processing equipment, private smart technologies, and packaging and labeling machines. During this time, a major dairy cooperative invested in an ultra high temperature processing plant, which will enable its dairy products to have much longer shelf life and increase the processing capacity of the plant, creating more jobs and guaranteeing the availability of healthy food items. The government has also supported the exportation of commodities such as live cattle and poultry. This has secured foreign exchange for our country. Trade ties with Mexico and Guatemala have been strengthened to facilitate trade of agricultural goods and encourage co-investment programs with Mexico and CARICOM to increase the production of basic foods such as corn and soybeans. New export markets are also being aggressively pursued for non-traditional commodities such as the emerging Salvadorian market for onions and oranges. Moreover, the ministry continue working with farmers and agriculture cooperatives to improve their working conditions by introducing contract farming between producers and buyers. Meanwhile, new opportunities are being constantly explored in search of production and manufacturing of potatoes, soybeans, pineapples, plantains, coconuts, pitahaya, and sawasap, ensuring a sustainable livelihood for our local farmers and entrepreneurs. While the Belize, we have been addressing the matters of increasing production and productivity, we must also place extra attention and prioritize the inclusion of women and youth in agriculture. Belize therefore requests FAO support in developing an engagement plan. Market research is also another area where assistance could be obtained from FAO. Currently, Belize has the potential to produce more than it can, consume and thus has immense potential to increase exports. After COVID-19 and other worldwide disruptions in the agriculture value chain, 
The lease also recognizes the need to concentrate on the production of locally produced animal feed, feed organic pesticides, and fertilizers. In this light, we seek FAO support in search for the development of new products in this line. Moreover, we echo the sentiments of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Saboto Caesar, Kaiser, that to minimize risks associated with climate change and adapt mitigation measures, we need to seek programs which can assist with the development of a disaster risk recovery fund and crop insurance. This is, an, is another area where we seek FAO support. In concluding, I thank FAO for consistently supporting the efforts of my ministry in maintaining food security and supporting those who are most vulnerable. I request the continuation of the Mesoamericas in Ambre project to support healthy diet, nutritional, educational, school meals, and family farming. The school garden concept and school feeding program are, programs are growing and have taken root, extending into the most rural areas of the country. The development of in-depth value chains have set the stage for planning and strategizing production, and the incubator program is successfully supporting the growth of small and medium agricultural businesses. During the last year of Dr. Christine Moreira, FAO agreed to support the needs in developing a seed policy, supporting the new agriculture policy and strategy, implementation of digital villages initiative, and the digital extension program, program essential for our industry to create the enabling environment for their culture, growth, and sustainable development. From the people of Belize, we give you all a heartfelt thank you for supporting us and improving the livelihoods of the most vulnerable in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Belize. The next country is Guyana. And I will be attempting to do the presentation for Guyana. Um, so, Excellencies, to achieve better production, we must ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns through efficient and inclu inclusive food and agriculture supply chains at the local, regional, and global levels. Better production means ensuring resilience and sustainable agri-food system in the face of climate change and its impact on the environment. Since food and nutrition security of our countries depend on a sustainable and productive agriculture sector. To improve food security, the efficient cultivations and production of traditional and untraditional primary agricultural product and increased production and diversification of processed agricultural product emphasizes emphasis has to be placed on higher and more advanced degrees of commercialization, embracing specialized production and the increased importance of research and development and use of technology. Noting the agriculture sector vulnerability to climate change and negative impact that, can have on, that it can have on food security, we must be innovative in our effort to ensure better production. Our country, the government of Guyana, has been encouraging and investing in innovations with a focus on productivity, improvements driven by the research and development strengthening, climate resilience, advancing the use of technology, and intensifying improved land and water management practices. Productivity improvements are driven by research and development in the following area. High yielding rice varieties. A new high yielding rice varieties, GRDB 16, with a potential of nine ton per hectare was released. This variety of rice, this variety of rice has benefits such as higher yield, only 110 days to maturity, and it can germinate in water of up to nine inches. And I want to say here that we have moved with this variety, moved the national average of 39 bags per acre to just around 60 bags per acre. That's the way we have in, um, in, um, involved um, research. Biofortify rice. There have been very successful trials of biofortify rice, which is intended as a sustainable, cost-effective means of divert, delivering target micronutrition to the population that have weak access to such diet. The biofortify rice provides the target nutrition zinc to consumer that has high market value. There is, however, the cost of zinc fertilizer that has to be addressed. One possible solution is subsidizing the cost. And here in this rice, 
we are growing the, 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 the supplement of zinc in it so that it will be very healthy and, and very nutritious. And I think that this will be one of the, or our country is one of the first in this part of the hemisphere that is doing that, together with ECO is helping us. Livestock, Guyana is making stride into improved research and technology in the livestock subsector by refocusing effort in the research station and developing desired genetic material for livestock species. Public-private sector partnership and involvement and support is being encouraged in this area. Innovation in climate resilience are as follow. Shade houses. Shade house farming is an innovation being utilized as an adaptive strategy to the threats of climate change, such as flooding, droughts, and increased pests, all contributing to enhanced productivity. In 2021, 150 shade houses were constructed with the National, with the National Research, Agriculture Research and Extension Institute, providing material at subsidized costs to farmers. Technical support was also provided for design and shade house man management. In 2022, in excess of 200 shade houses is targeted for construction. The government as well recently launched an agriculture and innovation entrepreneurship program where 300 shade houses will be constructed with a focus on the efficient and sustainable production of niche vegetable, high-risk commodities such as cauliflower, broccoli, carrot. This project targets youth with BSc and certificate in agriculture. We also have embarked on hydrophonics. Flood early warning system we have started. We have had those in our budget. We have also in, um, started innovation in digital solution where we are using drone technology to help us to um, improve our production and productivity. Land and water management for better production with the impact of climate change and you all would have known last year Guyana suffered um, devastation in the flood. Almost the entire country was affected and the entire agriculture sector, almost 90% of the sector was um, devastated with that flood. Because of that, now we are putting more infrastructural development in the water management. We are building pump, st pump stations. We are rehabilitating canals and build new canals so that we can drain Guyana effectively. Unlike Ecuador, that is above sea level, about almost 6,500 feet above sea level, we are below, five feet below the sea level. So you can imagine the challenge that we have to drain our land in gravi with gravity flow. So with these innovation for better production, the transformation of our agri-food system is inevitable as they all positive impact on the production of our farmers. Also in the Caribbean, we have a ministerial task force that are looking now with all the Caribbean countries in CARICOM that are looking to bring down the cost of production, reduce the food import bill by 25% in 2025, and I think that we are pursuing that very aggressively. And on the 19th to the 21st of May, we'll have the first investment um, um, forum in Guyana where international, regional, and domestic investors will come here there to support the agriculture sector. So in a nutshell, that we are doing as a country to modernize and ensure that we have food security, not only in Guyana, but regionally. Thank you very much. I would like to now call and Jamaica. Jamaica, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman, colleagues. I see that we are all um, struggling to meet the six minutes, so I'm going to cut the 12-page speech that I was given um, and simply say ditto to what the Chairman said a while ago. Um, we are facing COVID-19, climate change, conflict, and several other crises which cause us to be agile, flexible, and united in our approach to achieve this goal of now building a resilient, inclusive, sustainable agricultural sector. Locally, Jamaica is seeking to do so um, by developing sustainable food systems, by driving agribusiness, by modernizing a more efficient agricultural um, sector, and by supporting our government's medium-term strategic priority um, and being a significant contributor, a key driver of growth in our country. We have to look towards doing this regionally. And I must say that the better production theme um, and all of the themes are strategic, cross-cutting, and essential. 
Um, for Jamaica, we are pursuing the better production theme uh, through a number of projects. I'm going to highlight only a few. Blue innovation for us to develop and implement a diversified and new business. Um, agro uh, which is critical to broaden the industrial value chain um, and agri-food production systems. Agroforestry and fruit tree crop production, critical in Jamaica. Um, as well as the rapid multiplication system for small ruminants. Um, lastly, is seed production. Um, and all of this is within the context of us advancing our research and development, soil mapping, soil fertility, and taking a very empirical approach to agriculture. So while at a country level, our best strategies um, are integrated into our medium-term business plan, there are several constraints. Uh, we are shackled and restricted by some of them. Integrated land and water management for sustainable agri-food systems, um, the innovative approaches, partnership solutions, financing and delivery mechanisms supported by close collaboration between research and development, um, and also um, the need for us to scale up climate action, particularly, um, as was said by our chair, um, for countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. Um, there's also the need for me to highlight that the PO through um, Crispin Moreira and the local team is working with the government of Jamaica. We have engendered a very strong partnership advancing projects focused on the homegrown school feeding program. Uh, we are advancing projects under our resilience in agriculture and market systems for the COVID-19 response. Uh, we are advancing a government's buyback program by providing support to assist in the collection and redistribution of produce, specifically to those areas that need it the most and have needed it the most in the height of the pandemic. And now uh, we have critical projects, some which have already been approved, um, that we are advancing in terms of improving rural livelihoods, in terms of enhancing climate resilience, um, developing our fishing villages, um, and improving phytosanitary food safety and market access opportunities. But I want to highlight that Jamaica is also very pleased to be included in a project under the South-South Cooperation Program, which is a partnership between FAO China and SILAC. So we applaud the FAO, and we see a great future in the partnership with this noble institution. Um, and so it is within this vein um, that, you know, we leave just the following, uh, just a few uh, matters for consideration. Uh, in terms of our local capacity, um, there's still room for in terms of the technical support, in terms of the value chain actors uh, being more equipped with technical and managerial capacities, in terms of linkages between public and private sector organizations, and support for building capacity across those sectors, and strengthening capacity to design and implement financial which are critical if the stakeholders are to achieve the of meeting local production. At a regional and national level, FAO could continue to provide technical assistance and enhance that in terms of supporting countries to address the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly on those rural, vulnerable areas, so promoting the necessary transformation that's required to boost rural economic activities. We could also have better coordination and approach. It looks like my mic is, is, is weak. Hearing me? No. Uh, we could also continue uh, through sub-regional and regional uh, partnerships with the FAO to support members in improving uh, information and communication. Um, uh, and to integrate the digital technologies so they become more accessible, particularly, again, for the rural communities. Lastly, I think that there is room for us, as I said before, to support more public-private partnerships and also to have a specific focus on agricultural value chains, digital, post-harvest, financial innovations, particularly for the integration of women and youth. And this effort should also involve the strengthening of livelihoods in coastal communities. So, as I close, Jamaica continues to appreciate the support um, and 
we will work together uh, to ensure that our agricultural space advances climate action, includes our women, includes our youth, um, and drives all stakeholders to be integrated in the current and future direction of this important sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamaica. I will now give the floor to Paraguay. You have the floor. Muy buenos días. Good morning. First of all, I also want to congratulate and thank the government and the people of Ecuador for sponsoring this meeting, and I want to greet the presidency, taking advantage of the opportunity to present on behalf of the Paraguayan delegation our recognition for this productive 37th period of sessions of our regional conference held in this very warm city of Quito. I also want to greet all the delegations present as well as our colleagues that have joined us virtually with whom we are sharing and exchanging perspectives on such current matters that are of interest to our countries, especially because they are aspects that affect or gather our different agri-food systems regarding our sustainability and daily lives. In recent years in Paraguay, we have had significant advances in matters of economic national growth with an average expansion of 4.3% a year between 2010 and 2019. In spite of the 0.4% contraction registered in 2019, fundamentally due to adverse climate effects and low prices that had incidence on the main export products. Therefore, the agricultural production becomes one of the sectors that contributed most to the national economic growth in the 2010-2019 period, during which we also generated around 20% of the overall jobs in the country, and so the economic contraction registered in 2020 of 0.8%, the lowest in the region, at the beginning of the, pan of the 2019 pandemic has been much less than what had initially been estimated due to the resilience of the primary sector that did not stop producing. In this context, and with the undesirable persistence of the condition of poverty in our countries, in Paraguay, and this is a problem that is more accentuated in the rural sector because the uh, family, rural families could have a fundamental strategic role in the perspectives of national, more, more inclusive national economic growth. And the importance of the agricultural production in Paraguay plus value added jobs, exports, generate policies that can promote exports and over others that have direct and indirect, both long and short term effects in the national economy. The primary national production responds to two productive models that coexist. On one hand, agro-entrepreneurial that is characterized by more dynamism in extensive areas with greater access to technologies and on the other side, family with a small scale production with difficulty to access to technology but of high social relevance. Precisely in the agricultural census of 2008, we registered around 300,000 productive units in the country. With everything that has been said, we must bear in mind the current situation of our countries. We continue in the pan we're still in the pandemic trying to control its impacts, to which we add the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine with its global consequences. Aside from the effects of climate change in Paraguay with the presence of La Nina event during 
phases of drought, this has generated significant shrinkages in the agricultural sector and its resulting impacts in the economic growth levels, as well as in the cost of the population, volatility of prices, technical uh, resources, and commodities. That is where the subsidiary role of the state becomes relevant, and therefore, from the Ministry of Agriculture, we are more than persuaded that the investment in productive infrastructure is one of the key tools to be able to enhance our national agricultural system, strengthen value chains that are efficient and inclusive in the local and regional realm, ensuring greater resilience of our productive sectors, offering the support required for the adoption of adaptation processes to climate change by prioritizing in each intervention the traceability of gender, inclusion of youth, and indigenous peoples. And precisely to be able to face these challenges and with the timely implementation, this will find us more resilient and we are promoting several investment projects as public goods. And on this occasion, case one focused on a vast territory of our country that has a high productive potential that benefits a large number of producers and communities. That is why we want to present a short video on a project that is being carried out right now in Paraguay. Thank you very much. Put the um, video in the platform so that because we, with the time that we have, um, we can upload that video and put it in the platform so that members can look at it and countries can look at it. I'll now give the floor to St. Kitts and Navies. You have the floor, St. Kitts and the Navies. Thank you, Mr. Chair, honorable delegates. We are living in an unprecedented time since the onset of COVID-19 pandemic. Climate change is an unwelcome change and an irritant that threatens to impede the progress of our agricultural sector. The Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis is aiming to reshape the, strat the stratosphere for our agricultural sector, where the country can become more self-sufficient in the provision of food, for the sustenance of all its residents and to create income and wealth generation opportunities for producers. We aim to increase agricultural productivity by maintaining sustainable eco ecosystems, reduce food imports while enhancing food and nutritional security, and achieve decent employment and livelihoods. We must unlearn some of the teachings of the past and absorb new knowledge to attain the goals for the agricultural sector despite the challenges facing us. Crop agriculture in St. Nevis has been characterized by being rain-fed. Over the years, the Federation has experienced less rain as a result of climate change. Our water resources are used mainly for consumption by our citizens and residents, which create competition for water resources for agriculture. The transition to climate-smart agricultural practices is imperative if we should adequately increase food production. Feral animal control is another area of challenge for us. We are seeking multiple creative solutions to manage the feral animal problem. Plant disease control is also vital to the productivity of crops. Many of our crops suffer from diseases, and it is evident that, that this is evident in the citrus crops. Yields in these crops have dramatically decreased and declined because we have not been able, as we hope, to resolve the diseases that threaten the existence and production of these crops. The introduction of more resilient crop varieties, better soil management, and enhanced knowledge and training in the area of plant disease management are needed to ensure better yields. The Federation is also seeking to improve the meat production of all most commercially viable species of livestock. The increase in the local production of our large and small ruminants through genetic upgrades, which could withstand the climate conditions in our federation, would allow the country to feed the population sustainably.
The development of animal product value chain is also critical to feed our nation in the foreseeable future. The discards and existing meat products will be processed further to increase the level of production. We are also involved in the development of agriculture as one of our main priorities. There has been a fluctuation in fish landings for more than two decades, which has been attributed to the warming of the oceans, plastic pollution, and other land-based pollutants. Like in the area of livestock, the improvement in the fisheries value chain is vital in addressing food and nutritional security concerns, as well as improving fisher livelihoods. Mr. Chair, in conclusion, the investment we are making in shade houses and in more innovative means to facilitate the process of change and enhance our sector is already paying off. Ensuring the active involvement of our women and youth, we will realize great strides in better and increased production. We believe that at the conclusion of our current process of seeing a new agricultural transformation and growth strategy plan for 2022 to 2031, which is greatly supported by the FAO, we will realize a better position to see our plans come to fruition and realize lasting solutions to the agricultural challenges we face and to ensure the improvement of food and nutrition security. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, St. Kitts and the Nevis. I'll now go to, um, give the floor to St. Lucia. St. Lucia, you have the floor. Members of the head table, esteemed ministers and other distinguished representatives and the media, good morning, or should I say good afternoon. My name is Andre Barry Innocent and my contribution is on behalf of Honorable Alfred Prosper, Minister of Agriculture in St. Lucia. In the interest of time, I'll get straight into it. I wish to take this opportunity to thank FAO for its continued support to St. Lucia and the other countries of the region in strengthening our agricultural systems and programming over the years. Through FAO's commitment and dedication, we have been able to make significant strides in the areas of reducing poverty, livelihood creation, building resilience to climate change, school feeding platforms, and more recently, in our response to COVID-19 pandemic. The fact is, we are small open economies that are susceptible to a host of external shocks of which we have very limited control. It may require that we rely on our collective efforts and try to build strong partnerships on a bilateral and multilateral level because we will never be able to do it alone. I therefore think this exercise organized by FAO is indeed timely as it presents an avenue for us to discuss and learn from each other to drive, to arrive, sorry, at a more practical solutions for the issues confronting us, which are mostly similar in nature. Let me go straight into the topic at hand, better production and innovations implemented to support this. When I think about better production in the agricultural fisheries forestry sectors, I think of issues regarding improvements in the consistency of quality and quantity of our food products that meets our local demands and provision of relevant inputs like fertilizers and water and the youth economy in the spirit of succession planning. Not only do we need good fertilizer, but with the current health consciousness of most people, there is a desire for more organic and natural fertilizers that can produce more healthy, wholesome food. Bearing this in mind, climate change brought the problem of excess sagassum seaweed, but a solution young man and an innovator, Mr. Johannan Dujor, turned the negative impact of buildup of sagassum seaweed into an economic opportunity by using the invasive species to produce a liquid organic fertilizer and a compost organic fertilizer that is widely used and even exported. The innovation was the removal and utilization of sagassum, excuse me, from the east coast of St. Lucia to create organic compost for the farming industry. Some of the results of the initiative resulted in a biostimulant factory established, removal of 270,000 kilograms of wet sea moss from beaches in 2016 with a projection of 90,000 kilograms per month for exportation. For the results were that 48 community stakeholders signed up to participate, of which 69% were women. The project won a Swissnosian Institute Award at the Earth Optimism Summit in Washington, D.C. in 2017. Production had reached a total of 420 bottles in March 2017, 
with a projection of 1,680 bottles by the end of 2017, which is projected to bring in U.S. 53 million, sorry, $53,333 by the end of 2017. The Sargassum Initiative is open to any further support that can be obtained. Another interesting innovation in St. Lucia was an initiative that sought to address the problem of drought and water shortages brought about by climate change. It was an invention by a St. Lucian named Carlis Noel. The innovation produces durable water, and it, and it sought to solve the water shortages by using solar energy and in the process neutralizes the brine. There are ongoing discussions to use this innovation to supply the agrarian communities with water. Further, I should say, there is room to explore how this initiative can be given Sorry for this. There is room to explore how this, in, this innovation sorry, can be complemented and or compared with other similar products for best results. Any support that can be given to further explore this innovation is welcomed. Another area of innovation was the youth economy because youth involvement in agriculture must be encouraged and supported. This was confirmed from the documented feedback of the recent preliminary session on youth in agriculture and the subsequent youth symposium that took place early March 2022. Further, data from the 2007 agriculture census in St. Lucia revealed that the sector is challenged with an aging farmer population. According to the census, 41% of farmers were 55 years old. 22% of persons who operate farms are over 65 years old. In light of this, the Ministry of Agriculture had initially implemented the innovative youth agri-entrepreneurial project that developed into a program which was implemented from 2012 to 2018. Silucia was the pilot country for this project, which was funded by CARICOM Development Fund to provide gainful employment to youth between 18 and 45 years through government-backed loans, provision of agricultural land, specialized training, and other forms of assistance to pursue their chosen business ventures. Approximately 85 youths benefited and participated. Pursuant to the youth economy philosophies, the Ministry of Agriculture is actively looking for pathways to lure young people into the food and agricultural sector. We are hoping to engage them in production of non-traditional crops such as mushrooms and more technologically based business ventures, especially as it relates to agro-processing, apiculture, CMOS, aquaponics, hydroponics, and other leveraging technology with the growth and revenue potential. It is also our intention to encourage youth with more farm mechanization using small farm implements rather than the traditional forks and spades. Any support with this would be appreciated. In conclusion, let me see some of the further areas of support not yet mentioned but needed for progressive agricultural sector are as follows. Agriculture and fisheries insurance for livestock, fisheries, and crops as a CARICOM initiative. Regional transportation of food and other commodities, drought and water management, drought resilient measures inclusive of the use of small solar power desalination units to provide water to agrarian communities. St. Lucia is open to, being exp to, open to exploring being used as a country to pilot such an initiative. Fisheries incentives, insect or fish rearing refuse for animal feed, training and capacity building of extension delivery services, and finally, strengthening capacity of institutions involved in data collection and enhancing existing data management frameworks. I thank you for your time. Thank, thank you very much, St. Lucia. I now give the floor to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You have the floor. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I wish to expose on behalf of St. Vincent and the Grenadines that all of the issues addressed touching and concerning many of the vagaries that we are faced with in the region, that we are also grappling with them. And it's really a time when we have to be as innovative as we can. I want to focus, Mr. Chair, particularly on the work that we have done in the blue economy in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Over the last two years, we have witnessed an exponential increase in the export of fish and other marine products. And uh, as the chairman of the CRFM, I am duty bound to note that if we are to, as a Caribbean region, harness the resources sustainably of the blue economy, that there is a need for further 
technical support as it pertains to our marine resources, not only in our territorial waters, but in our exclusive economic zone. It is in this regard, Mr. Chair, that I want to reiterate the very important point that in the report going forward, we must not only focus on the very important and critical issue of IUU fishing and the issue of adhering to the port state measures, two very important facets in our quest to develop our marine economy, but we are in need of international technical support. And again, I note, it is the Caribbean, it is the Caribbean's time for us to get the support from the NANSEM program. Thank you. Thank you very much, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And um, I think I, I have just won a bet here. I have just won a bet. <laughs> I will now give the floor to Sur Sur um, Suriname. There was a challenge that you can't stay within the six minutes, but the, you, you just took half of that time. <laughs> so, um, Suriname, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, for this occasion to share my experiences on the theme of better production. Let me start by noting that Suriname strongly supports the work of if FAO internationally, regionally, and in my own country in achieving the SDGs. I wish also to recognize the work of the country representative for Suriname and Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Ruben Robertson, who has been instrumental in lobbying financial and technical support. In light of these collaborations, Suriname and CARICOM continues to be grateful for this continuous support. I therefore pledge our support and collaboration to continue necessary efforts towards the transformation of our agricultural sector to be sustainable agri-food systems for achieving the SDGs and FAOs for better, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. In my presentation, I am looking at value chain innovation with a focus on small-scale family farming and agri-food SMEs. In Suriname, the main challenge in the agriculture sector is overcoming low productivity and competitiveness. Low productivity and competitiveness has resulted in a decreasing agricultural trade balance, which further declined due to COVID-19 impacts in 2020 and 2021. The COVID-19 pandemic caused significant disruptions in our food supply chain due to reduced access to markets by customers because of lockdowns and travel restrictions and reduced transport and distribution channels for farmers. Another value chain challenge is the loss and waste of food and agriculture produce due to absence of post office facilities and knowledge on how best to manage quality. The government of Suriname has set as a national priority assistance to small-scale farmers and family farmers to increase production and productivity using improved technologies and approaches along the value chain. The focus on small-scale farming is strategic to enhance productivity and efficiency in selected value chains of family farmers, women, rural groups, and extension officers. To address some of the value chain challenges, the government Im implemented measures to increase agriculture production and accessibility to food. Innovations include the following. Making available plant materials for family farmers, these were either free or offered at minimum cost. Second, Training in compost and plant material propagation techniques, including cassava tissue culture, culture technology. Third, facilitating the setting up of vegetable gardens in different districts to ensure access to food, given the restrictions in movement because of COVID-19 measures. Encouraging agro-processing in order to guarantee farmers sales and encourage exports to the region. Refrigerated trucks to reduce 
loss during transport, and the promotion of value-added production. Other value chain innovations that were implemented include supporting the, the implementation of a matching grant facility to increase production and strengthen value chains. The government of Suriname, a partnership with Europe, the EU and implemented by the FAO, is supporting farmers to enhance production systems and processing by increasing capital investments through a competitive matching grant facility. Under this facility, small-scale farmers are given a grant up to 90% of the value of the investment, and farmers contribute 10%. Large-scale farmers and agro-processors are given grants up to 50% of the investment, ranging from $1,000 US dollar to a maximum of $300,000 US dollars. Second, the establishment of a multi-stakeholder value chain platform for cassava, fruits, and vegetables. A range of actors meet on these platforms to discuss issues pertinent to production, processing, marketing, etc. Third, the promotion and implementation of PRE, sorry, pre- and post-harvest technologies, such as identifying critical loss points and implementing affordable solutions, strengthening the National Plant Protection, uh, Protection Organization for improved food safety, sanitary, and phytosanitary services. Completion of design plans for the establish establishment of a National Packing House facility with cooling and hot water treatments. Construction of this facility would be completed this year. Examining opp opportunities for extending the shelf life of commodities for export cooling and freezing technologies to cater to local and foreign markets. Our interventions in, and innovations have yielded positive results. First, over one million fruit and vegetable plants have been made available to farmers and households per year. Over 200 persons have been trained in compost and plant propagation techniques. Vegetable gardens have been set up in four districts contributing to self-sufficiency. Machine ground facility has been operationalized and is to be expanded in a, from 58 beneficiaries to date with additional 177 pre-approved. Multi-stakeholder value chain platform operationalized for cassava with 20 key stakeholders. Agriculture officers, farmers, exporters, and fresh cut agro-processors trained in pre- and post-harvest technology. The required support from the FAO, Suriname looks forward to continued cooperation and collaboration with the FAO to transform and strengthen our agri-food systems through expansion of the matching grant facility to build capacity of farmers to increase production. Second, assistance to develop a fund to assist farmers in increasing capital. Third, technical support to operationalize the packing house facility. Fourth, technical assistance in freezing technology. Five, market analysis to identify new markets and suitable value-added products. And finally, technical assistance in meeting health and safety standards. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Suriname. And before we pause for lunch, um, we will give the floor to Venezuela. Venezuela, by, um, on virtual, we will call on Venezuela to take the floor. Venezuela, tiene usted. Venezuela. So we'll give the floor to we'll give the floor to the Uruguay. They are virtual because I was told that they were not um, ready before lunch. So we'll ask the Uruguay to take the floor, please. Buenas tardes para todos. Good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon to the President of Ecuador at this 37th Regional Conference of the FAO. Good afternoon, Your Excellency Director General of the FAO, Dr. Ku Duyong. It is a very great honor for me to represent Uruguay and be for anything else. I would like to apologize on behalf of Minister Matos, who was not able to attend the FAO 
conference that is so relevant for our country due to last minute uh, matters. First, I would like to express my appreciation for this sparse space of discussion, very relevant for the discussion of the uh, very important topics that we have to deal with all food production countries. Minister Matos is in a discussion right now with the President on topics that we've been analyzing as a result of the 37th conference of the FAO. This conference has several discussion areas. I would like to raise some of the Uruguayan examples that have enabled us to improve production, but I would like to focus on some matters that are more of a conceptual nature or uh, that are deeper, that enable us uh, to develop the innovations to improve production. I'd like to focus on the three things that, from our standpoint, make it possible to, generation, to generate uh, productive innovation and development. The first element that I'd like to table to improve or have better production is to have a to have foreseeability in mind we cannot intend our producers or farmers to increase production if they are subject to a context of ongoing uncertainty as a result having a context of foreseeability with clear rules established over time and in time is one of the absolutely necessary conditions for improving production. The second element that I would like to table that's of relevance is the generation of a an increased technological paradigm that's broad-based that enables technological and productive uh, tools that enable us to generate an increasing number of foodstuffs uh, under with safe food that is required increasingly by the world. The fourth element that I would like to table as a condition that's necessary for reaching better production is clear price uh, prices that enable our farmers, our producers, and business persons to be able to uh, produce well throughout all of Latin America, they cannot reach better production if they're not able to envisage a promising future and uh, positive expectations to the future. So positive economic scenarios are essential uh, elements for this. And the fourth factor that is, in our opinion, of the utmost importance for production, uh, better production, is the human factor. We have a very heterogeneous uh, sector, actors that are, that are populating our fields, if you will, and uh, we have to look at the true motivations, dreams, the expectations and hopes of these people that is particularly relevant. In this sense, something that is common to many of the countries that we uh, that are attending this FAO conference is the generational matter. There is a significant uh, issue associated with incorporation of new generations in a, a, an activity that is so noble as the production of food. As a result, we can look at different examples, uh, things that Uruguay has done to improve uh, production, uh, production, traceability, uh, soil management that makes it possible for all farming to be undertaken under conditions that conserve and safeguard the soil so that there is no erosion, the management of pesticides under good 
practices with remote monitoring. We can give you many examples, but we believe that the most important in this space of reflection that's so important and so distinguished is to give a framework to these four elements as determining factors to be able to have improved production. Foreseeability, a technological paradigm that enables us to have high production levels, reasonable expectations, uh, uh, forward-looking, which gives us the possibility to have good perspectives in the future, and the human factor. So these are the four dimensions that we believe that give us the possibility of a great deal of work that can be undertaken together. Many of the countries in attendance today uh, uh, working together, we can achieve what we all want to achieve, having an increasingly strong uh, food system, a uh, food system that places South America at the core of the food production system, food that is always necessary and in the situation that we are experiencing, this is increasingly clear, a uh, South America and an America that can generate foodstuffs at the highest quality levels, a Central uh, South America that can give uh, environmental and cultural added values because producing food has to be combined with the culture of each country. Once again, thank you very much for this uh, space and, and I would uh, apologize for Minister Matos who unfortunately was not able to take part in the event, but he asked me to give you all his very warm greetings and we invite you to come and visit Uruguay and have significant discussions on all of these topics that are of such concern to all of us and on which we are all so focused in our work. I think um, we have had some very good intervention, an excellent presentation from ministers and heads of delegation on the innovation developing their countries for improved, better production. I think we are learning from one another how we can better production in various countries. And we'll continue this discourse, and, and we'll pause now for lunch, and we'll resume at 13.30, 1.30 p.m., and we'll continue with a number of countries that are listed here to make their intervention. So now we'll break for lunch. Thank you very much. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. De y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario Latina, no se detuvo. La región continuó otra siendo otra un pilar de la seguridad embargo, alimentaria el global, alimentario garantizando el abastecimiento local la y la exportación de alimentos de durante la toda la pandemia. Global, los pequeños productores adoptaron local, nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores los y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia 
Gerencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. La Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos. Y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19 y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. 10 países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos. Y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer festival latinoamericano de la juventud rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres, 
mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima Conferencia Regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. 
Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos. Y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural, 
y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres, mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, Valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima Conferencia Regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años. 
y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. 
ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres, mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, Siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima Conferencia Regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. 
Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos. Y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta 
y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa mano de la mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima Conferencia Regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. 
Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación Sur-Sur y Triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. 
y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima Conferencia Regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás.
La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos. Y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. 
La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa mano de la mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bien anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres. Mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon... América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas, en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima conferencia regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, 
los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos. Y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los sistemas alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. Diez países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario 
23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos. Y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa mano de la mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer festival latinoamericano de la juventud rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. Para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima Conferencia Regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, 
con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación Sur-Sur y Triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, 
luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. 10 países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos. Y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. América Latina y el Caribe es una región única. Su patrimonio natural y la vitalidad de sus sistemas agroalimentarios la han convertido en un pilar de la alimentación y la biodiversidad mundial. Desde los hielos del sur hasta las islas del Caribe, la recorren cordilleras donde nacen ríos que se vierten en dos de los océanos más productivos del planeta. Luego de regar los campos, valles, bosques y selvas en los que múltiples pueblos y etnias cultivan una enorme variedad de alimentos. Esta gran producción es fruto de pequeños, medianos y grandes emprendimientos, de la agricultura familiar y de la pesca y la acuicultura, y de quienes cuidan el ganado y los bosques. Es labor de miles de mujeres y hombres, de empresas, cooperativas y agroindustrias que se nutren del saber de universidades, ONGs e institutos de investigación e innovación. 
para hacer crecer esta riqueza, la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura celebra su 37 séptima Conferencia Regional en Quito, Ecuador. En este país, el cual es un verdadero microcosmos de América Latina y el Caribe, con 18 pueblos originarios, selvas amazónicas, majestuosas montañas, playas hermosas y valles verdes, sumaremos voluntades para transformar los sistemas agroalimentarios y volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Aquí, en uno de los lugares más biodiversos del mundo, rodeados de la riqueza multicultural de Ecuador e inspirados por su patrimonio natural y agroalimentario, los países podrán compartir sus innovaciones para avanzar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. La región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio. Durante el bienio 2020-2021, los países de América Latina y el Caribe lograron resultados de gran escala y avanzaron hacia sistemas agroalimentarios más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles. Más de 170 instituciones en 31 países participaron en iniciativas de cooperación sur-sur y triangular, y el número de acuerdos suscritos entre la FAO y el sector privado aumentó en un 30% en relación con el bienio anterior. Para responder a la pandemia, la organización prestó apoyo a sus miembros para que mantuvieran sus sistemas agroalimentarios funcionando de manera eficiente. 26 países suscribieron una declaración ministerial comprometiéndose a asegurar el abastecimiento de alimentos y los ministros y secretarios de Agricultura de 34 países sostuvieron tres reuniones hemisféricas para coordinar sus acciones. La FAO proporcionó estadísticas y análisis sobre las acciones de mitigación relativas al COVID-19 en la región y organizó 27 webinars sobre esta materia, que alcanzaron a 150.000 personas. 20 países aplicaron la metodología de la FAO para realizar evaluaciones del impacto de la pandemia en la producción agrícola. Cuatro países elaboraron planes de recuperación de la COVID-19. Y nueve países del Caribe prepararon planes nacionales para abordar riesgos potenciales para la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición. 
La Estrategia Conjunta para Reforzar Programas Sostenibles de Alimentación Escolar entregó implementos de higiene y conservación de alimentos a 600 escuelas en 11 países. Los miembros identificaron sus prioridades nacionales para la Cumbre de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Sistemas Alimentarios, luego de realizar 120 diálogos con múltiples partes interesadas convocados por 16 gobiernos. 10 países mejoraron sus censos agrícolas nacionales y 13 países utilizaron la escala de experiencia de inseguridad alimentaria de la FAO. Los miembros elaboraron planes para abordar la resistencia a los antimicrobianos. 11 países perfeccionaron sus sistemas de control alimentario. 23 crearon un plan de acción regional contra una enfermedad letal para los bananos y la FAO proporcionó apoyo y capacitación para enfrentar el brote de peste porcina africana. 40 mercados mayoristas de 13 países ofrecieron alimentos a precios accesibles mediante el comercio electrónico y las plataformas de consultas de precios. La Plataforma Técnica Regional sobre Agricultura Familiar fue lanzada para que la agricultura familiar incorpore nuevos conocimientos, ciencia y tecnología en sus sistemas productivos. Y nueve países promovieron el comercio electrónico digital de la agricultura familiar. Como parte del diseño de las Naciones Unidas de la Agricultura Familiar, cinco países comenzaron a implementar planes nacionales. La Comunidad Andina definió una agenda conjunta y América Central y República Dominicana iniciaron la elaboración de un plan subregional. Seis países participaron en la iniciativa Mano de la Mano e identificaron carteras de inversión para sectores prioritarios, mientras que la iniciativa Mil Aldeas Digitales apoyó a 48 experiencias de turismo rural en 13 países. Ocho países definieron un plan de acción para implementar soluciones tecnológicas para la administración de tierras, y la FAO reforzó las capacidades de los miembros para la gobernanza equitativa de la tierra. Más de 5.000 jóvenes participaron en el primer Festival Latinoamericano de la Juventud Rural y los mensajes del informe, los pueblos indígenas y tribales y la gobernanza de los bosques llegaron a 1.600.000 personas en todo el mundo. Cinco países implementaron prácticas y tecnologías ganaderas que redujeron las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y generaron múltiples beneficios. Y seis países promovieron la pesca sostenible. Nueve países fortalecieron su preparación ante amenazas y peligros que impactan a los medios de vida de la agricultura, mientras que tres países del corredor seco comenzaron a utilizar pronósticos de sequías y sistemas de captación y almacenamiento de agua. Seis países fortalecieron sus mecanismos para la adaptación al cambio climático y la gestión de riesgos de desastres mientras que países del Caribe utilizaron el modelamiento digital de los riesgos y crearon equipos especializados en drones para uso en la agricultura y en sistemas de información geográfica. Para promover la agricultura familiar y el derecho a la alimentación, reducir la pérdida y desperdicio de alimentos, abordar el cambio climático y regular el rotulado de alimentos, siete países aprobaron 14 leyes y parlamentos regionales adoptaron cinco normas. La FAO movilizó más de 420 millones de dólares en aportes voluntarios, un alza de 78% en comparación con el bienio anterior, y brindó asistencia técnica al diseño de proyectos de inversión por 1.700 millones de dólares en favor de 12 países. Todos estos resultados demuestran que, incluso durante uno de los periodos más desafiantes de la historia reciente, los países han dado grandes pasos hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás.
indeed Ecuador for hosting us here for this 37th LARC conference. Um, I am encouraged and happy with the hospitality I'm receiving so far. And so on behalf of my country, Barbados, I wish to extend a heartfelt thank you to FAO and the president of Ecuador and the people of Ecuador for hosting us for this 37th FAO conference. I've listened carefully to all the presentations that went earlier before lunch. And as a Caribbean man, I recognize what it is to suffer from ethnic fatigue. So I seek not to stay too long and help you to catch back up your time, Chair. There are a couple of things that I wish to comment on, uh, given the fact that my presentation today is based on comments, and that I wish to state that we have to reinforce the point that the challenges that confront us going forward, given what COVID has caused, cannot be underscored enough. And I'd also like to also present that what climate change is adding, then we need to recognize that we need to move with pace in order to address many of the issues that were raised. I'm heartened to hear many of the systems, the agri-systems that have been put in place, but I wish to also present that we have potential and significant advantages in, ex in, in exploring what is available in the blue and green economies, and therefore we should also seek to address how those can work. Technology and innovation must be at the core of everything we do. Uh, the concept of doing open field agriculture within CARICOM must seriously be revisited because we are confronted by several climatic events that will not go away. Previously, we were able to predict rainy seasons. Nowadays, you cannot predict rainy season. Pre previously, we were able to plan our crops based on the rain patterns. Those things are not easily done anymore. And therefore, strengthening would require that we seek to address the challenges that face us by moving in a strategic way to introducing climate smart agriculture by way of freight farms and indeed hydroponic systems, as I mentioned earlier. If Barbados alone is importing $709 million in food into Barbados, made up merely of all types of foods, including processed food, and that our primary agricultural bill is only $203 million, then that says to me that as a region, we must be facing a fairly huge food import bill. I will wish to therefore opine that we seek to address this matter by having everyone buy into our 25 by 25 vision, which is to reduce the region's food import bill by 25% by 2025. In doing so, Barbados has targeted 12 crops, ranging from eight weeks crops as high as 12 to 22 weeks crops in order for us to be able to address what we are importing. The amounts of 11.9 million pounds of food, primary agriculture produce imported into Barbados with a total value of 20 million US dollars will be addressed this year. And we are seeking therefore to activate, increase cultivation, introduce greenhouses, shade houses, and hydroponic systems to be able to address how we increase production. There must be also a targeted approach to using livestock one as a means for increasing production, but equally giving us a chance to see how we can use more organic fertilizers in that we are challenged now with the increasing cost of fertilizers. Organic fertilizers, as I know them to be, as a boy growing up, was sincerely and properly treated without too much introduction of chemicals, and therefore um, we grew up using food that we knew the sovereignty of the food because we had control over the inputs. And I wish to suggest that as a region, we then look to see how we can go back to organic fertilizers through livestock production. The target that we have set for ourselves is 25% increase in livestock production, which comprises poultry and pork. We did not include lamb in this calculation because it is our view that if we are going to go to uh, synergies within the region, within the CARICOM, using the black belly sheep uh, to increase production and take the value chain, using the hides from the sheep for leather craft, using the meat for specialty cuts, then uh, that is a separate conversation, but it provides an opportunity equally for us to provide a special type of lamb, low in fat content, high in protein, 
and also give us a chance to reduce the amount of, well, I call it mutton because of the time frame that it gets to reach the reason. And at the same time, then give our CARICOM brothers and sisters a chance to look at new initiatives and new opportunities for enfranchisement in agriculture. We in Barbados have started Project CARE, which is a community garden project that allows for people, and particularly the most vulnerable, who would not normally be able to purchase food in the first instance, to have government intervention, to give them community gardening so that government provides all the inputs, does, the government does the cultivation, they grow the food, and that food is distributed among communities across Barbados. And we have also have the PPP, which is going to be done to use master garden projects and give also um, Barbadians an opportunity to participate. I've already spoken to our farmers in Parliament and Enfranchisement Drive, where we've given farmers a chance to participate at a very young age, providing them everything, including training, business training, and at the same time allow for them then to have market access to government uptake of 60% of their produce. And the government of Barbados is also spending close to $100 million in the provision of water augmentation programs through reservoirs so that the farmers can have access to continuous supply of water. These colleagues are in line with what most of what has been presented today, and I wish to emphasize the fact that in order for us to achieve these, the CARICOM region must now be treated as a special case. I'm obliged to you, Chair. Thank you very much, Barbados. <clears throat> I will now give the floor to Dominica. Dominica, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Let me, on behalf of the people and the government of Dominica, say thanks to the FAO for this invitation here today. The Ministry of Agriculture in Dominica, we have a number of initiatives that are go ongoing as we speak, but I'll just highlight a few as it relates to better production. Um, critical to better production is farm access. And right now, we are spending in excess of $8.5 million in maintaining and upgrading of some of our feeder roads. What, what this is doing, it is not only opening up new lands for increased and better production, but it is creating an environment where our post-harvest will improve. Another initiative that is ongoing as we speak is the construction of a tissue culture lab, which will be critical to our production as it would be able to produce in excess of 600,000 seedlings in different varieties on an annual basis. Number three, our young professionals and young persons in agriculture is critical to the development and maintenance of the sector. And we are tying this in along with the digital economy and we believe firmly that innovation and technology are the key areas in which our young persons would be att attracted to the sector. So we'll be expanding in terms of our greenhouse technology, hydroponics, and small tools because we believe labor is becoming increasingly expensive for the sector, but also it's not available in the form that we would like. We also have an initiative where we'll be constructing, in partnership with several universities, a marine research center, and this is critical for our blue economy development along with our tourism sector. Chair, I would just like to support my Caribbean colleagues, Minister Caesar and Barbados, as we have to keep climate resilience on the table because climate resilience, it is costing the Caribbean millions of dollars. And I can speak from my, my own country's experience following the tropical hurricane Maria and we are building back better, but this is very expensive. So as we speak, we are constructing resilient livestock pens for our farmers, and this is costing a considerable amount of money, but it is necessary in order to maintain a vibrant agriculture sector. So once again, Chair, thank you for the opportunity, and we look forward to the discussion.
Thank you very much, Dominica. I'll now give the floor to Honduras. Honduras, you have the floor. Yeah, after Honduras, we'll ask Grenada. Honduras, here. So, Grenada, ready? Yes, I give the floor to Grenada. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to the Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, FAO officials, and representatives of regional and international organizations that are present. I make this presentation on behalf of the Honorable Peter David, who is on his way at this time to the meeting and on behalf of the government and people of Grenada. First, let me express our appreciation to the government and people of Ecuador for the excellent organization of this conference in these trying times and to the FAO for the support they have given to Grenada and the region over the last couple of years. We want to express our appreciation for all of the sacrifice that you have made to ensure that we can meet at this time. Chair, I want to thank you for the opportunity to comment on the session and to share with you Grenada's actions and recommendations to help us address the issues of better production. In fact, as many of the other presenters have said, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has taught us many lessons. And one of those is that all of us need to look at the issue of better production by pursuing targeted strategies that create a more sustainable and resilient food system. So at the national level, uh, Grenada has been focusing on, on the issue of drafting, adopting, and implementing national legislations that look at the issue of land and its management with an emphasis on soil management, as I've heard other presenters advocate, because this is extremely important for sustainable national development but also to build resilience in the agricultural sector, which is urgently needed. Providing support to the farming community to expand the acreages that are under production, and that is focusing on new technologies such as protective structures, irrigation, uh, solar-powered uh, pumps, etc. But also looking at research into new crop varieties, uh, and, 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 and focusing also on crop production data, which has been a challenge for our farmers to be able to access resources from the commercial entities. We therefore need to look at developing protocols to respond to climate impacts, such as climate variability, drought, storms, hurricanes, and this needs urgent attention. Improving the, the, the access to, to, to lands, as my colleague from Dominica has, has said, uh, to put unproductive lands back into production and in fact, government has allocated $47 million towards uh, rehabilitating farm roads across the island so that we could increase those acreages under production. Providing support for the, the um, propagating stations to increase the production of, of planting material that is then made available to farmers is also a priority. And uh, we have been working very closely with the with the FAO in implementing a national land bank project, which is also targeted at bringing idle government and private lands into production with a focus on youth in agriculture, because we are seeing an aging population and we need to get young people back into agricultural production. Um, the issue of labor that is available for agriculture is a vexing problem and it's something that needs to be looked at closely across the region. And um, government has been providing some labor subsidy to the agricultural sector, but we are struggling with that because um, we need to be able to be more efficient in how we implement this program. Also providing opportunities for increased private sector investment to include the development of proposals for, for, for research facilities to look at um, tissue culture, new crop varieties, exotic crops um, is also of priority for us and we want to ensure that these are, are looked at. 
disaster risk reduction is of optimum importance. And I have heard our colleagues mention the establishment of a fund to address this is of top priority. We cannot sustain the frequency and severity of the disasters we are facing in the Caribbean in particular. Every year from June to November, we have to be preparing for hurricanes or storms or flash flooding, etc. And planning to, 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 to ensure that we, we, can, we can capitalize on the opportunities to fund, this must be given high priority. And included in this must be crop insurance for not only tree crops, but also vegetables so that farmers can have some support to recover quickly is of high priority. Finally, we support better coordination at the level of OECS, CARICOM, and the LAC to ensure that we improve trade as this is a vital aspect of our regional food and economic security. I thank you. Thank you very much, Grenada. Before I call on Honduras, I think we are having some issue in terms of participant because this session was called for registration before. I will ask the secretary to guide us. Okay, uh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Chair. I just wanted to clarify the following. These thematic sessions, as we had previously agreed, will have three sessions. The first is when countries that have pre-registered, and we have a list with confirmations from the countries, will make presentations on innovation. Second, we will have a session where pre-registered countries will comment on innovations. And right now, we are in the second session of the thematic session on better production. I know some people are requesting the floor, and we are in the second segment where pre-registered countries, and we have a list right here. The third part based on the availability of time, and we are running behind schedule, we will attempt to have time for everyone to register and use the floor to talk about this topic. This morning, I read the order of the day so that you would know, and the summary of the chair, which had initially been planned to be discussed at 445, however, it was the part on climate change was still pending yesterday, so we're going to have to find the time to address that document. And unfortunately, that is going to give us more constraints on the plenary debates after the two groups are going to be presenting, that is, uh, presentations on innovations and then comments. Unfortunately, for those who are on Zoom asking for the floor, that is something that we had agreed on previously. You had to be pre-registered. We're giving the floor to pre-registered countries, and we see some that are now registering for the plenary. Thank you very much. Secretary, now we'll, I will give the floor to Honduras. You have the floor. Honduras. Hola. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, I want to apologize because I, I think I was called before we were called. Actually, we didn't apply for participating in this in this section, but since we give since you give us uh, the opportunity, of course we will take it. Okay. Uh, me disculpo porque no 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 habíamos aplicado. Apologies. We hadn't registered to take part in this segment, but given that you've granted us this opportunity, we'll take it. When it comes to better production and the standpoint of Honduras, the major challenge isn't really better production. It's production itself, ensuring there is production, that there is no hunger, and that hunger isn't a constant phenomenon that lasts years in a country such as ours where in the months of January, February, and March, FAO publishes reports about the hungry season. These news promote instability vis-a-vis -vis the interest 
in producing on the part of those who do produce. Again, like another country said, 70% of people living in poverty, many families are practicing subsistence farming and so on. I believe the country and the region at large need targeted strategies for this type of farming. And I think that we should use these fora to come up with pilot projects and flagship methodologies that are easy to implement in these types of contexts. It's not just about increasing production yield, it's about producing despite all the constraints that we know we face. From the standpoint of Honduras, and I believe most of the region of Latin America and the Caribbean, I believe one element we need to focus on is our dependence on high external input technology. We depend too much on technology that is inaccessible for most smallholders. On the other hand, we do not have any viable and accessible technology alternatives that can be bought because with these soft loans, these farmers don't have access to this sort of to the sort of credit that they need. When it comes to external technologies, I'd like to talk about combating pests uh, with pesticides and insecticides themselves, but this morning we were discussing fertilizers, and at the end of that segment, I wasn't very clear as to what our alternatives might be as a region. When it comes to fertilizers, I think essentially we should take this opportunity to analyze traditional farming the type of farming that's being promoted across the world in differentiated contexts. And I think that the biggest opportunity we have is to overhaul this type of farming and promote organic farming, which will allow us to use local resources. However, I don't see any research initiatives in this domain, and I believe this should start at FAO, and I hope that FAO can support my country in developing research initiatives such as soil labs where smallholders and medium-scale farmers can access soil analysis, soil testing at the lab level to confirm whether it's really necessary to use globalized formula to improve our soils. We don't even ask ourselves whether our soils need that or not. In the past, different types of farming were promoted in Honduras. And they're trying to implement these again, catch crop farming. Also, when it comes to external technology, we're told that we need to use additives as fertilizers and that we need to harness the potential of chemical fertilizers. However, we need capital to invest in this type of input. So I believe that access to agriculture and rural funding is a key component within better production if we really wish to drive efficient strategies in the short term, then that's something we definitely need to look at. Thank you. Yes. I will now give the floor to Mexico. Mexico, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chairman. Firstly, I would like to thank Ecuador's authorities for hosting us in this country. I'd like to thank them for the very successful organization of this conference, distinguished Director Julio Berdegay, distinguished ministers. In the framework of the thematic session on better production, innovations in family farming for small 
scale and medium scale enterprises in the sector, I have the following comments. Family farming is very different to traditional farming. It promotes resource preservation and the organization of farmers and prioritizes family over and above markets. The innovation that family farming brings takes on relevance, however it needs to be strengthened. Historically speaking, family farming involved subsistence farming. Now it plays a key role and is on public policy agendas to promote development within the farming sector. Innovations in family farming need to aim to truly understand the needs of the sector and provide tools that can be used to improve the sector. Bearing in mind the actors involved and the interrelations among them and public policies and institutions, as well as changes in the social, economic, and environmental base, technological innovation should feed into agroecological and sustainable practices undertaken by farming and campesino families. The aim should be to improve yields and restore soil health in addition to reducing costs. Another aim is to have inputs that are locally sourced and, of course, healthy harvests. If we drive technologi technological innovation today for food self-sufficiency of family farmers, then we will achieve small and medium scale family farming value chains. Innovation in family farming should also recognize and promote a greater proportion of women, uh, the role that women play in the field, as well as generational handover. The incorporation of sustainable practices in Mexico are aligned with the priority program production for well-being, sowing life that contribute to food self-sufficiency for farming families in our country. Farmers that are part of these programs have established alternative milpas and orchards and agroforestry systems providing rural communities with food as the first suppliers. They're also contributing in other ways to self-sufficiency and the creation of sustainable communities. By fostering the social and solidarity-based economy and also the reconstruction of the social fabric, family farming thus feeds into food self-sufficiency. We need to understand that it isn't enough to aim for an increased production in staple foods for family farmers' well-being. We need to significantly increase family incomes, protect soils, increase the use of rainwater, and substitute monocropping with biological diversity. In order to overcome the problem of food insecurity and achieve food sovereignty, we need to address the degradation of natural resources, address climate change related problems, and take an agri-food system approach. Innovation in family farming is present across the entire production cycle in the entire value chain from agricultural, fishery, livestock, or forestry production. The quicker we 
address family farming production needs with this new approach, the faster we will be addressing other rural problems such as the rural exodus, fallow land, the aging rural population, and the generational handover within the sector. Thank you. Mexico. I now give the floor to Nicaragua virtually. Nicaragua will make their contribution virtually. Nicaragua, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, I bring you the greetings of my head of state. The 37th Regional Conference supports all our people. We have been working with FAO on tasks which aim to support our farmers with a view to achieving our joint goals, the joint goals we all share, we as countries share with FAO on food security and food sovereignty. I would like to congratulate all the speakers who took the floor before us for their presentations and above all for the lofty and important task of sharing our experience to achieve better production in our countries. This is a major task improving production given that the alarm has been raised on the need to produce more food in this context. We feel it's important that there be fora for exchange or that those fora that do exist be strengthened in the realm of technical cooperation so that we can replicate successful models that have been developed in line with the context and needs of our people. I'd like to make a specific comment or perhaps a recommendation here on exchanging more genetic material and technology between and among our countries. I believe that exchange of technology needs to flow more smoothly because we feel it's clear that technology will bring us the greatest returns when it comes to achieving food security and sovereignty. What we can say is that our government, as of 2007, has achieved better production. We have not stopped growing for over a decade based on a broad-based program. We are constantly thinking of better programs that can reach all smallholders and we are blessed in a way because 80% of our producers are smallholders. Why do I say that's a blessing? Because we have a great deal of diversity produced by smallholder families. One idea to strengthen production is to create systems that bring together all actors, bodies for consumption and production, government institutions, and especially the Ministry of Family Economy, which has made Nicaragua a reference point when it comes to family farming development. It was designed to support smallholders, We're not just talking about farming, but rather economic support for them. We support all types of food, and we have developed more than 20 strategies that help us develop more programs that incorporate all types of technology possible. 450 
different types of technology, and this is something I'd like to stress, which we share broadly, globally, I'd like to say, with all producers, because our agricultural technology is in the hands of our producers, free of charge. We provide them with that technology so that they can produce better. We can ensure that 90% of the food that we consume is produced by us. We are very close to achieving food self-sufficiency, and we are certain that we will get to 100% within two years. In our country, all producers have access to all of our genetic variety. That is why it is key that we make recommendations on the need to exchange and complement the genetic variety that we have available to us here in Latin America. And that genetic variety that we share with our producers means that we can produce even in the face of extreme weather events such as drought. I'm running out of time. I have a great deal to share. But really, my aim here is that we strengthen the exchange of varieties of technology and of experiences. And once again, we need to thank FAO for its representation in Nicaragua, for working hard with us, for complementing our capacity, especially when it comes to the policies that our government spearheads. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicaragua. I now give the floor to Peru. Peru, you have the floor. Gracias. Thank you. Apologies. Good afternoon once again, Chairman, distinguished ministers of Latin America. It's a real pleasure to bring to you the greetings of the government of Peru and to be here. Better production means ensuring that the world is fed. That's what it means to our country. But above all, generating wealth, placing our agricultural commodities on global markets. We have made advances in the last 30 years. We are implementing reforms to strengthen, above all, our smallholder family farmers who have under five hectares and make up 90% of our farming community, but uphold the agriculture sector in Peru with a diversified, resilient, climate resilient, uh, climate change resilient agriculture. This is a major challenge because the government of Peru has undertaken an agricultural reform initiative with all that entails. It's tricky to reform with COVID as a backdrop and with the Ukraine-Russia conflict in the background, given the impact on the price of fertilizers. However, improving production to us means at least three things. First, guaranteeing that there be water on our plots or vegetable gardens of smallholder farmers. and. We need to, in order to do that, manage those lands where it rains. That's one of the only ways to stock up on water and ensure that we have enough water available to us to improve production. We're generating targeted policies in that domain to retain water, recover ecosystems. Given that climate change and the increase in the demand for water are exacerbating water scarcity. However, that isn't enough. We need to be efficient in the use of the scarce water we have through the use of technology. I think it's important that we share technology on 
water management. And I believe there are countries in our country itself and agricultural exporters who can share technology on the efficient use of water. Guaranteeing water for our vegetable gardens, for our farms, means that we can increase our yields, that we can generate jobs and incomes, but above all, it's part of what needs to be guaranteed if we are to achieve food security. However, another priority of Peru's government is that we develop production technology. And we decided that part of our resources should go to production subsidies. I believe, again, that technology is key when it comes to increasing yields. And we should ensure that we, above all, produce organic food for national and global consumption. We need to develop technology to increase our yields, but above all, to move to the next stage of the production process, such as improving supply, improving primary processing, and above all, industrialization, which brings greater value added to our products. This is allowing us as a country to improve our presence on global markets and helping us cooperate with and contribute to global food security. However, I believe that greater solidarity is called for, more cooperation among our countries so that we can develop markets and smooth the flow of our agricultural commodities, never forgetting, of course, food safety and food quality. We're also implementing proactive and aggressive actions on local markets, forging alliances with cities and resolving problems when it comes to accessing global markets, which is a key way of in ensuring that we achieve food security. Thank you. Um, Peru, I now give the floor to Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just be brief and offer just a couple comments on the presentations made by my colleagues on better production. Chairman, and I'm sure you are well aware because you would have raised some of these concerns in your earlier contributions. In relation to better production for our countries, we notice low productivity is one of the concerns. We, and I, this is a recommendation we really need to introduce more innovation, science, and technology. Um, just to name a few, irrigation, hydroponics, vertical farming, LED technology, where sunlight is an issue, greenhouses and shade houses, Mr. Chairman. But in relation to putting forward to deal with low productivity, I'm sure all of us here would know the significant cost that go with trying to develop these types of systems. Mr. Chair, we also have to transform the agricultural food systems to be more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. So we need to have better institutional arrangements, more representative farmers, groups, associations at our regional levels that can lobby, make recommendations that we can bring to forum and sessions like this. Mr. Chairman, we heard a lot about aging farming population. And in Trinidad and Tobago, we have tried many programs, many grants, funds, subsidies that go with youth in agriculture. And most of those uh, initiatives seem to not be bearing fruit. Um, when you look at the average age of a farmer, I'm speaking for Trinidad and Tobago. It's between 45, 60, around there. 
So we really need to pay particular attention to dealing with this issue of aging farming population. We need to encourage youth, new entrants in the agricultural sector, and a theory that has worked well in Trinidad, and I can share, is making good farmers better. While understanding we need to have the entrance of new farmers coming on board, what we saw in Trinidad and Tobago is farmers who have the agricultural blood in their souls, meaning they've come from generational farming. Those are the young people that we, we saw interested taking initiatives and venturing into the agri-related systems and agro-entrepreneurial uh, businesses. So apart from within and finding those young people um, from generational farmers, maybe that, that is one initiative, Chair, that we can look into in getting more young people involved in agriculture. In terms of the transformation of the agricultural incentive support, we need policies that is based on targeted production outputs rather than production inputs. An example of this, Mr. Chair, in Trinidad and Tobago, is we tend to concentrate more on incentivizing and subsidizing the cost of the inputs. And one example, in Trinidad, there's a vehicle subsidy that farmers can access. And many times, for the last decade or so, we have spent in Trinidad close to half a billion dollars, TT, in incentivizing farmers and their vehicles. And most times, Mr. Chair, some of these vehicles never really see a farm or go into the garden. So we need to review how we look at incentivizing agriculture and probably turn to incentivizing the production outputs to be more successful. Another point raised, Mr. Chair, risk reduction strategies in the agricultural sector using innovative solutions such as agricultural crop insurance. I have been in many conversations, Mr. Chair, and every time the issue of insurance, crop or agricultural insurance come up, there's dead silence. Because agriculture is a very risky business. All of us here knows that. And so I would like to implore FAO to see if they can shape some policy and some strategies in going forward so that we can really deal with this issue of risk reduction strategies and the issue of losses by farmers um, in countries vulnerable, more so the Caribbean. And Mr. Chair, finally, mobilizing of financing for investment in agriculture, we would like to see more partnership, private sector, NGOs. Um, I guess this, this initiative would really help us in achieving food um, sustainability and by extension reducing that um, issue of zero um, hunger and zero poverty in the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, let, me thank, let me thank each and every one of you who have spoken on this interested and important um, topic. The comments were very helpful, and I think the suggestion made are suggestions that all of us can learn from. I think we have to come to an end to this session. I will now open shortly the pl plenary, a very short plenary for three, um, three contribution, and all will be done by through Zoom. First, we will have Brazil, five minutes, and then we'll have the spokesperson from civil society and the private sector. So I'll give the floor now to Brazil. Brazil, you have the floor. Gracias, señor presidente. Dear ladies and gentlemen, delegates who are attending this very important regional conference of the FAO, as a representative of Brazil, I would like to state that I am pleased and honored, as is my delegation, to see such uh, important presentations on innovative public policies for sustainable development in our region. Tomorrow afternoon, 
Brazil will be presenting two innovative public policies, the plan for uh, fighting child obesity and improving nutrition, and the AVC Plus plan on the uh, better environment section. Yet we'd like to take this opportunity this afternoon in the better production segment to speak a little about a very important topic for our country, and that is family farming. In Brazil, family farming plays a fundamental role to ensuring food and nutritional security for our population as it is responsible for at least 70% of all of the food we consume in Brazil. Family farming in Brazil has features of sustainability and food management and production res with respect for natural resources and biodiversity. The products stemming from family farming are high quality and diverse. Family farming in Brazil also promotes the strengthening of local communities by creating uh, solid agroecological and production chains to contribute to distributing income and ensuring supply for international as well as national markets. Strengthening family farming in Brazil means uh, being uh, involved in markets with a strong plan for inclusive public policies such as the National Program for Strengthening Family Farming, known as PRONAF in Portuguese, the uh, Alimenta Brasil program, and our school food program. This provides 50,000 meals per day in schools throughout the entire country. At that scale, and given the production and sale, as well as the value of the work carried out by family farmers, increasing income for their families. We need to take note of that. According to our latest agricultural and fishing census in 2017, family farming is the primary source of uh, income for 90 percent of Brazilian municipalities with less than 20,000 in inhabitants. It provides vegetable and animal protein, vegetables and fruit. Today in Brazil, 77 percent of the rural establishments throughout our country are family farms and almost 3.9 million of, of farms in total, uh, with a total of of people employed in family farming throughout the country. That includes over 10 million people, or 70 percent of R Brazil's rural population. As a result, we need to consider this as one of the most important sectors for sustainable development in our country. We are at the vanguard of public policies for family farming in Brazil and in the region. We are still open to sharing our lessons learned as well as our rich knowledge through technical, bilateral, and trilateral cooperation, thus contributing to developing our region as a whole. I would like to note, Chair, that this morning we heard some interventions from countries present today, and they talked about the expectations for developing technical cooperation initiatives in order to uh, take advantage of fishing resources. I am delighted to share with you that Brazil is ready to explore this new terrain for technical cooperation with our friends from the Caribbean, and that includes in the area of the strategic partnerships that we have with the FAO and that have been in place since 2008. We are very proud of that. We would like to thank the countries present at the conference. Thank you to the FAO and thank you to representatives from civil society who are here to share experiences and learn from one another. Thank you very much, Chair. To Brazil, I, I now give the floor
Yeah, Ms. Tamisha Lee, spokesperson for civil society. She will be on Zoom. You have the floor now. The Chair, all protocols duly acknowledged. It's an absolute pleasure for me this afternoon to make an intervention in my capacity as one of the spokespersons representing civil society in Latin America and the Caribbean. Over the past two years, we have been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has manifested in lower tourist arrivals, reduction in government revenue, food insecurity, and increase in poverty. Indigenous people, people with disability, rural producers, especially rural women, have not been spared from the economic and social fallout which has seen them be substitute teachers for their children, which meant less time for unformed activities, experiencing limited opportunities for marketing produce locally and internationally due to the COVID restrictions, international shipping freight, freight and logistical constraints. This has been coupled by vulnerability to and adverse impact of climate change and natural disasters on production systems, which has reduced producers' income, increased poverty, and food insecurity of rural households, especially those who are headed by females. Over time, both male and female producers have been systemically challenged by poor production practices, which adversely affects environmental health and production systems, inefficient and manual production technologies, high post-harvest losses, limited access to irrigation and other types of on-farm water systems, high cost of labor and input, aging farming population, limited access to capital, land tenure issue, reduction of land for agricultural purposes, high incidence of predial larceny, agricultural health and food safety, marketing information, among other challenges. The contextual situation driving FAO's new strategic framework resonates with Latin America and the Caribbean producers in light of the aforementioned and other challenges. The response that has been translated into the three regional initiatives is of particular relevance to rural women and lack producers in general and should be pursued in collaboration with government producers, civil society, and the wider private sector. However, the modalities for implementation of FAO's strategic framework need to be broadened to include avenues for direct support of non-government organizations, in particular producer organizations at the local level. This will be a linchpin to FAO's thirst to localize its strategic framework. Indeed, any type of localization of the strategic framework that excludes NGOs producer organization and any representation therein will not be accomplished over the next decade. This is of technical assistance and other types of support that producer groups can access once it aligns to the regional initiatives and country programming framework of FAO. Indeed, those of rural producers, their organization, and other representatives of rural society. Civil society must be given a fusion of the initiative. Partnership with civil society must become entrenched in the delivery of programs to countries in the
We, it seems we that we done by FAO in gender equality and rural women information to enhance policies. The region is not void of policies and strategies, but lack resources for their implementation in an equitable and cohesive manner. The focus needs to be changed towards the implementation support for existing policies, even if they are to be enhanced. Hands so that the real and their families. Producers organization must be directly equipped to undertake and provide support to their own members as well as assist them in making tangible investments in the rural sector. FAO, in its first to localize its strategic framework, must target producer organization women, youth, and actors in the wider private sector to control resources to improve the livelihoods of rural producers. Let me thank um, and transform Let me thank the spokesperson for civil society. I think we also had some problem with the connection. I will now give the floor to Ms. Carla Galban Nuni, spokesperson private sector. You have the floor, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to this very important topic from the perspective of the private sector. Today, the word better production needs to be con I used very carefully, and I hope that it uh, will soon be uh, agreed on by everyone from the public and private sector, large and small mar markets. The challenges we face due to the pandemic uh, when it comes, uh, have uh, uh, worsened uh, non-communicable diseases uh, such as cancer, obesity, and others. And in my country, we saw that these diseases affected 80% of those who died from COVID. That's without even speaking about the issue of biodiversity. We need to improve this. We need to be more careful in the way we produce. Small, artisanal, companies like I present are millions in number and we are present throughout the region. However, today I'm also the spokesperson of uh, companies from other companies, small and large, small and medium producers of livestock, fish, agriculture, which work day in and day out to improve the quality of their products from the land and the sea. We are an important part of food systems that are resilient, inclusive, and sustainable. And we need to take that into account. Companies will always be here. We're not going anywhere. Our clients choose us each day. They vote for our products each day. Therefore, we need to be more attentive to reality trends and adapt constantly. Many Companies, small and large, have been able to survive thanks to our ability to adapt and innovate. However, what is innovation? It's a process that changes something. It changes the way we produce food. We improve or create something new with a positive or negative impact. And we have been innovative for many years in different ways, and we see the results today. For the same reason, this innovation, which we need, will generate a new way to produce. And we need to ask ourselves what we want. We need to define the change that we want to see and have positive examples now of better resilience. We need to find a way to do things to create better products and open spaces where we can learn from this. Innovation needs to be sustainable and aimed at the ecosystem and human beings for the well-being of everyone as a collaborative vision. Today, I am thinking of Miel Carvajal, a uh, producer of flour from northern Peru, and they sell this uh, made in a stone mill. This is a, an innovation because they don't use fossil fuels. They use materials available in the region with uh, very simple hundreds of year old technology. This is just one example. We have 
the capacity to reconvert our processes and product products, improve our recipes and the way we do things for better products and better health. But we have a very serious challenge, and this is the issue of informality. This is fed by complex bureaucratic systems. That's the perfect storm for corruption. And we would like to ask you to please consider this issue, which we have not yet seen come up in the conference. We need to work to improve processes like those suggested by the FAO. Informality in all sectors, like the sector I represent, means that millions of people do not have social security, set salaries, etc. They live in precarity, and we need to look at uh, whether the laws in place reflect our reality. And we need to ensure that this is the case in each of our countries. For example, we can look at the way that millions of companies uh, use energy and how this can affect the health of individuals who consume their products every day. We need dignified, independent academia and science in order to work on these concepts to improve everyone's well-being. This is a huge task, and we all need to be part of this as states, associations, academia, producers, companies. But to facilitate this, we need to identify who we are, where we are, how we can be supported. We can work as part of a larger community to promote innovation as the common denominator between health, jobs, education, and better value chains. Thank you very much. Uh, a spokesperson for, from the private sector. Um, delegates, I think we have made some, we received some very important, excellent intervention in all three parts of this thematic um, session that we have had. Um, and let me thank all the delegates of official observers and spokesperson for the intervention in the plenary also. We have had three of those in the plenary. Um, at this point in time, we must conclude this meeting in order to proceed with the next session scheduled on this day. So the next session we will have is Innovations for Healthy Diet for All. I now want to start this thematic session, Better Nutrition, Innovation for Healthy Diet for All. And we have eight countries that have already pre-registered. And I will give the floor to the ministers and high authority to make their presentation on the innovations developed in their country for better nutrition. I will now give the floor to Bolivia. Bolivia, you have the floor to make inter, um, your intervention. Hola. First of all, on behalf of the plurinational state of Bolivia and our president, I would like to give warm greetings to all attending the 37th Regional Conference of the FAO. I would also like to greet all of the ministers representing each country. For us in Bolivia, we understand food security as something that is necessarily linked to sovereignty. And we decided on the availability and accessibility of food. We seek a high level of nutrition from this very important source of energy for Bolivian people. The pandemic was something that did not affect hunger and nutrition, and we have not yet uh, studied the effect that the current war might have in our country. The price of food has not risen a single cent. All of this is due to the implementation of structural changes in agrarian issues, the provisions of our constitution that was approved in 2009, where it states social, political, economic inclusion of each Bolivian man and woman. It also cites economic growth for all based on equitable distribution of wealth, which generates industrialization 
and the management of our natural resources. I have little time, but I will give you the example of the earth. Before, 68% of it was in the hands of large and medium-sized companies, and 30% were in the hands of small-scale producers, 2% among others. Today, 32% of the land is not non-available fiscal land related to ecological activities that provide ecosystemic services for rivers, forests, lakes, and this is part of a strategy that is in the hands of the state in order to ensure that they are available based on production needs. 29% of the land in Bolivia is now controlled by what we call Tiop, which are uh, rural indigenous associations. This is part of our justice with ancestral peoples who lost their land during the era of the Republic. 13% of the land is in the hands of large and medium-sized companies, and 26% of the land is for rural and intercultural communities. I would also like to note that before the land was owned 90% uh, by men, and only 10% of the land was in the name of women. Today, 53% of the land is owned by uh, men and women in almost equal numbers. Access to land has meant that we have been able to guarantee that existing agriculture and fishery work in Bolivia is uh, very important and uh, receiving assistance from the state. And it means that we are able to produce our own agriculture and fishery inputs, replacing imports when the state guarantees credit at 0.5% annual interest rates for these groups. This also includes and will include uh, the fact that very soon we will be replacing imports of diesel because we have shifted our production to biodiesel made from plants. We also decided to support with uh, seed capital programs and a timely, appropriate technology to improve production. We are thus caring for our Pachamama, the Mother Earth, and above all, we are ensuring that our policies contribute to living well for all Bolivians. I would like to underscore the fact that the ministry is not just focused on production, but also rural development. And my portfolio through our constitution is cross-cutting. And it addresses all of the issues, uh, including uh, the life, education, access to living, uh, everything related to the well-being of, of uh, rural communities. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bolivia. I now give the floor to Brazil virtually. The Minister of Health from Brazil will take the floor virtually. You have the floor, Brazil. Thank you very much, Chair. Dear representatives and colleagues, delegates, Brazil places great importance on uh, the, com the fight against malnutrition and obesity, and this includes, uh, of course, obesity and, and poor nutrition. As we know, obesity is a challenge faced by our entire region. In Brazil, we believe that prevention is vital in order to overcome this new shared challenge. Thus, the Ministry of Health in Brazil will be sharing with us through video that experience in developing an interministerial and innovative policy to fight childhood obesity through healthy and nutritious school meals. And so I will, if you will, Chair, give the floor to the Minister of Health from Brazil. Thank you very much. The Minister of Health. Senhor Diretor General da Organização das Nações Unidas para a alimentação e agricultura. Chu Donyu. 
senhores ministros, senhoras ministras, senhoras e senhores. Dear ministers, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to participate in this 37th Regional Conference of the FAO to share Brazil's experience. Interpreters apologize, but due to the low audio, we are unable to hear the speaker. Interpreting will resume once the audio situation improves. Interpreters regret this, and thank you for your understanding. Caracterizado pela diminuição do consumo de alimentos in natura e minimamente processados. A alimentação inadequada está associada à má nutrição em todas as suas formas, incluindo a desnutrição, as carências nutricionais e o excesso de peso. Além disso, a alimentação inadequada constitui um dos principais fatores de risco para a carga global de doenças no Brasil e no mundo e afeta indivíduos independentemente de idade, sexo e condições sociais. A prevalência de obesidade tem aumentado de maneira epidêmica entre crianças e adolescentes nas últimas quatro décadas e atualmente representa um problema de saúde pública. No Brasil, uma em cada três crianças apresenta excesso de peso e mais de 50% da população adulta é obesa. O Brasil reconhece a urgência no cuidado e na prevenção da obesidade por meio de intervenções integradas em diversos setores que vão além da saúde, na perspectiva da construção de ambientes que contribuem para o crescimento e o desenvolvimento pleno de crianças e adolescentes. No contexto da Política Nacional de Alimentação e Nutrição, em 2021, o Brasil lançou a Estratégia Nacional de Prevenção e Atenção à Obesidade Infantil, o PROTEJA, que tem como objetivo prevenir o aumento da obesidade infantil e contribuir para a melhoria da saúde e da nutrição das crianças por meio de ações intersetoriais que promovam cidades mais saudáveis para as crianças e famílias brasileiras. A estratégia conta com financiamento de 96 milhões de reais, destinados a 1.320 municípios identificados como prioritários no período de 2021 a 2023, para apoiar a implementação das ações em nível local. A estratégia é baseada em um conjunto de ações essenciais e complementares que, reunidas e implementadas em nível municipal, poderão apoiar na reversão do cenário atual. Tais ações são divididas em cinco eixos principais. Vigilância alimentar, e nutricional e promoção da saúde e do cuidado às crianças, adolescentes e gestantes no âmbito da atenção primária à saúde. Promoção da prática regular de atividade física nas escolas. Educação, comunicação e informação para promover a alimentação saudável e a prática de atividade física. Formação e educação permanente dos profissionais envolvidos no cuidado das crianças e articulações intersetoriais e de caráter comunitário que promovam ambientes saudáveis e apoiem a alimentação saudável e a prática de atividade física no âmbito das cidades. O Proteja, em uma de suas ações essenciais, reforça a implementação do Programa Nacional de Alimentação Escolar gerido pelo Fundo Nacional de Desenvolvimento da Educação do Ministério da Educação. O Programa Nacional de Alimentação Escolar atende cerca de 40 milhões de estudantes espalhados nas mais de 150 mil escolas públicas brasileiras. O programa tem por objetivo garantir o acesso a uma alimentação adequada e saudável com a entrega de 50 milhões de refeições diárias, a custo anual de cerca de 4 bilhões de reais. Durante a pandemia da Covid-19, 
o programa ampliou o seu orçamento em mais de 700 milhões de reais. Os recursos devem ser usados prioritariamente para a aquisição de gêneros in natura, alimentos não processados e minimamente processados, que garantam uma alimentação saudável. O programa segue as orientações do Guia Alimentar para a população brasileira, bem como do Guia Alimentar para as crianças menores de dois anos, ambos do Ministério da Saúde, e determina que 75% dos gêneros adquiridos para as escolas devem ser alimentos in natura e minimamente processados. A adição de açúcar é proibida para as crianças menores de três anos. O programa também prevê que 30% do valor repassado a estados e municípios deve ser utilizado para a compra de gêneros alimentícios diretamente da agricultura familiar. Esse conjunto de políticas inovadoras reflete a atenção do governo brasileiro com a agenda de prevenção e cuidado da obesidade infantil, se valendo para tal da nossa Rede Nacional de Educação e do nosso Sistema Único de Saúde, SUS. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Brazil. I now recognize Colombia. Colombia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Primero que todo, quiero agradecer. First of all, I want to thank the FAO, who undoubtedly is doing collective joint work as a team with the government of Colombia. The Secretary General, Ku Don Young, Julio Verdeguer, President Pedro Abala, all the countries that are part of this session, and obviously the government of Ecuador that has received us. And I very especially want to thank by want to start by thanking the Minister of Agriculture of my country that has allowed us to, uh, the, who's in charge of the protection of the rights of boys, girls, adolescents, to share this scenario with you. And also with the perspective, a very important pr perspective of gender that is necessary at this table. We start by saying that this is one of the most innovative segments, and it's that the national government of Colombia has put childhood at its core because we understand that a direct correlation with economic, political, and social development is in line with this. We know that the first 1,000 days of the life of a child, there is a critical window to generate a scheme of tearing down or of closing gaps and inequalities during the rest of the life cycle. We have to acknowledge that for every euro that is invested in nutrition, 16 euro return to the local economy. And for every dollar invested during first infancy, there's a return rate between 7 to 10% a year, an element that undoubtedly uh, our economy Nobel reminds us of. So in 1,000 days of a child, there are neural connections and the brain is plastic. And that's why the nutritional aspects becomes fundamental for the development scheme of the generations that intend to be the new generations that follow us. So the president of Colombia, Ivan Duque is concentrating on a holistic intervention enshrined in the nutrition of the body and of the soul, ensuring food security from zero to five years of age and generating habits and the strengthening of the being and obviously in the promotion of a healthy lifestyle from 6 to 13, from 14 to 28, and evidently with those of us that are older and a bit rested. When we talk about nutrition from zero to five years of age, we're clearly talking about access to healthy foods and sustainable foods of food habits, the prevention of excess of, of weight. And in a country such as ours that has problems, first of all, of large migration from Venezuela, when, where we have 1,800,000 Venezuelans and 500,000 of them, boys and girls under the age of eight. We have to work on malnutrition. In attention to initial infancy, Colombia has many children of which 2,859,000 are in conditions of vulnerability. In this sense, the ICBF has been working during the initial childhood with 1,700,000 children where we give them 70% of the calorie, daily calorie values that a child needs at their tables of child of child assistance. 
and we will overcome 745. This has exceeded 745 million dollars, and the 70 percent covers fruits, vegetables, meats, poultry, fish, dairy products, milk, sugars foodstuffs in general, all of this which is prohibited for children younger than five years old. And we work with a territorial focus, recognizing and, and promoting the local economy. It is important to remember that in attention to COVID, the Colombian government flexibilized all the services to continue to guarantee food security of boys and girls and their families. So in other words, 1,700,000 boys and girls that received a monthly food basket. This implied a delivery of over 32 million baskets in Colombia during the time or during the two years of the pandemic. Additional to what we do during First Infancy, we're clearly working on a scheme to prevent or to ensure food security of the initial infancy through initiatives of family agriculture and community pots. And in what we do for the prevention of malnutrition, we have a holistic scheme that has created active search units, a multidisciplinary team of experts that are covering our entire country, especially in the red areas where there's a higher incidence of malnutrition and with professional nutritionists, with uh, nurses to redirect these boys and girls to health systems and to nutritional recovery systems and centers of ICVF. Last year, we were able to characterize 43,000 plus boys and girls, 575, 1.3% were identified with the risk of malnutrition and 3,553 children with the risk of malnutrition in no modality of assistance. What is this modality of attention? A thousand days to change the world. We've increased the coverage in 160%, going from 20,400 users to over 52,000 plus uh, children, assisting a specific indigenous and of African descent African descent population and in these 30 departments and having a nutritional recovery of 90% of the boys and girls that go through this process. In the nutritional recovery centers, we've developed 13 nutritional recovery centers in achieving a recovery, an effective recovery of over 96% of boys and girls. With these strategies, we have achieved a reduction in this government of 39.4% of deaths due to malnutrition. And evidently, we have to continue to struggle and work together. This is a joint effort because a single child that dies in our country hurts us. But this work has to be in articulation. Nutrition and good nutrition improves the possibility to have fair opportunities in life. Let's work together to reduce obstacles and guarantee that all the children, youth and women, can have nutritional food, safe, secure, affordable, sustainable, that we need to achieve our life projects. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to Ecuador. Ecuador, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Chair of the Conference, members of the Board of Directors, delegates of the countries that accompany us in person and that are visiting us this week in Quito. We welcome you all and also those of you that accompany us via Zoom. Ecuador has a chronic, the second highest malnutrition index in Latin America in a range of 27 percent, which is triple of the regional mean. So one out of three of our children, boys and girls under the age of two, currently suffer chronic mal malnutrition. In that sense, the President of the Republic, Guillermo Lasso, has adopted some measures among those on day one. He appointed as his government counselor for the strategy Ecuador Grows Without Child Malnutrition, Mr. Enrique Coloma, and he additionally created a specialized entity in the interinstitutional uh, aspect attached to the presidency. 
And this is particularly relevant because the country has a history of around 20 years, 12 programs to fight chronic child malnutrition, unfortunately all with very bad results. And so this is how malnutrition in our country has not been has not been decreased, but on the contrary, it has grown. So in that sense, we worked on an intersectoral strategic plan. And after 100 days of government, this program was developed together with the entities of central government and with the system of the United States, among them FAO, the World Food Program, UNICEF, and we additionally had the cooperation of multilateral banks, World Bank, CAF, and the private sector. This is a strategic plan that, it, that has 28 projects, six programmatic axes, and I'm going to mention a few. However, here the important thing is to highlight that the goal, the target that the President of the Republic, Guillermo Lasso, established was to reduce chronic child malnutrition by six point, uh, and re well, reduce it to 10% to 2030. This is undoubtedly a very ambitious cha challenge that is going to require the effort not only of the public sector, but also of the private one, together with cooperation agencies. These six axes that we're going to focus on in this horizon of five, ten years is first to generate an enabling environment. And for this, we work on the creation of a consultative council through which we are going to have civil society take ownership and become empowered with this, with this struggle. Unfortunately, we do not know the exact number, the exact percentage of malnutrition, child malnutrition in Ecuador. And the idea is to work together between public and private sector. We have created an interinstitutional committee for the prevention and reduction of chronic child malnutrition led by the President of the Republic and that has met on six occasions since the President uh, began his term. The second has to do with the mobilization of resources and for this we are already implementing a budget system by results which is one of the best international practices and that has given very good results in the countries where it has been implemented. And additionally the President of the Republic announced the creation of a multi-source fund that will be implemented during the coming months and that will allow and that will be fed with the sale of assets and that are productive in the state and that will allow us to guarantee that the next governments will not suffer what this government is unfortunately suffering, which is a lack of budget to tend to chronic child malnutrition. So that budget, those funds will be shielded. Then we have intersectoral uh, councils in the different cantons of our country and a bonus of nutritional assess assistance during the first years of life. We are also finishing the creation of a nominal follow-up system. This is actually relevant data because in our country there's not enough information on the nutritional status of our children and we are going to in the coming months have the first results of the national a survey on child malnutrition as to the strengthening of the institutional uh, structure. We're going to restructure the services for a child service and we're going to improve, we're going to work on improving the productivity of the provision of health services in the prioritized package. And finally, in the sixth axis, we're going to work on co-responsibility and transparency with a campaign, a communication campaign to develop awareness in the population. And there's also a scheme of tax deductibility for projects related to chronic child malnutrition. The government is establishing an interinstitutional approach where we will guarantee a package of goods and services that start with the prevention of adolescent pregnancy, 
prenatal controls of women, the growth control of healthy children, breastfeeding, nutrition, healthy water, and this is done together with the Ministry of Public Health, the Ministry of Housing, the Ministry of the Environment and Water, Social Registry, um, Civil Registry, and the Ministry of Social and Inclusive Economy. I will recognize Guatemala. Guatemala, you have the floor. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure for me to share the experiences of each one of our countries today. In Guatemala, during the COVID-19 pandemic, 85% of households of family farmers saw their economic income affected. Aside from this, the effects of tropical storms, Eta and Iota, that affected 204 families. Added to this, the accelerated increase in prices of agri products and fuels. And to this, we add the conflict that the, the, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And in this sense, we have adopted some measures promoting actions to increase production and the availability of foods and mitigate risks as to food security and nutrition. We have focused our efforts on productive investment, um, organization, and a plan recent, that we recently implemented, which is recovery and protection of soil. So based on our forecasts, we have promoted strategies such as the economic recovery of, of producing families. Through the strengthening of the connection between producers and public procurement, promotion of gender equality in this program, I must say that over 50% of suppliers are women. And in the same way, the strengthening of value chains in these types of products. And also, always thinking about how to improve production and availability of foodstuffs, we have implemented the restoration of production means conditioned to the restoration of soils. This is basically um, because we have established that soils in Guatemala have deteriorated. Surely in many of the countries that are sharing this this room with us and many of the products and fertilizers do not have the same effects that we would expect and what we want is to restore soils and conserve them in a better way and we have started and we are going to well this objective is focused on servicing 300,000 farmers that will benefit with this benefit and their responsibility is to work in their own parcels on restoration and soil conservation. So we're, we're looking for this and this is not only done to restore soils but to also produce food and that is why the economic support is conditioned to the fact that the producers have to focus their efforts on the best natural resource that they have and produce the best foodstuffs. And also in coordination with the FAO and the Hand in Hand initiative, we have been developing an investment program for the agricultural development program in the most impoverished zones of Guatemala. And we have developed a territorial plan with the purpose of, tran of territorially transforming these efforts under the Hand in Hand model. This program has three components inclusive and resilient agricultural development in prioritized areas, 
agro-industrial development, commercialization, and development of infrastructure for production. And our main focus is on, the, is on resilience, such as the improvement of productive practices through innovation and technology. And in first instance, instance the first the families do need assistance because of the vulnerability, but we hope that these families can, on their own, produce their own food and that the support of the state has to be supplementary and not determining, and that way we can make them more independent and give these families more opportunities. The idea is to reduce food insecurity and improve the nutrition of the most vulnerable, popu vulnerable population, mitigating the effects of the economic crisis, promoting strategic investments that will allow small farmers to add to value chains, establish programs focused on reducing poverty, and have more food security. And we also work with uh, in an articulated manner with ministries and cooperating agencies and donors. Good afternoon, Chair. It's a pleasure to greet you and all the representatives of member states of the FAO receive cordial greetings from the government of Panama led by our president. In the context of the improvement our, of nutrition, our ministry, the Ministry of Education and the national government created the program to study without hunger. It is a program that we initially developed with the support of the FAO, the technical cooperation of the FAO that started in September 2019 and that ended in February this year. This impacted a population of students of around 2,445 students. And that pilot plan was developed in four educational centers of different regions of the country. There was an approximate investment of 365,000 Balboas. Today, the new program that is being developed by the National Direct Nutrition Directorate of this ministry on this occasion will impact until the end of the year around 59,235 students. And 273 educational centers, fundamentally of the most vulnerable areas of the Panamanian population that are in different regions of the country. On this occasion, there is an approximate investment of 15 million Balboas. The other innovation that the Panamanian government has created is water harvesting. This is done by FAO through Conagua and the Ministry of Environment. And it has the purpose of supplying water through a filtering system and the treatment of rainwater for human consumption in those, in those schools that do not have the necessary water sources for the production and sustainability of water, which, as we all know, is fundamental in schools. And continuing with the questions posed by the FAO, we analyze what results and what benefits these innovations have had. For example, in the case of the program titled Study Without Hunger, the purpose is to take nutrition to these students that are in vulnerable areas, provide them with the necessary food so that they could adequately develop their educational process, which is the primary obligation of the Ministry of Education. 
the innovation is based on the fact that today this program is created by a law passed by the National Assembly and consequently the continuity of this program is guaranteed after the five years of the government. So in other words, there is an educational policy in matters of foodstuffs that the governments have to comply with after those five years. There is also an evident decentralizing of economic resources at a local level. So in other words, in the schools themselves. On the other hand, through the advisory of nutritionists, food is healthy so that these students from vulnerable areas following the food guidelines for Panama and respecting the local culture, they can benefit adequately. Another benefit that this program generates is the is the equipping of school kitchens. So kitchens are being are being set up in the school so that the stakeholders or the actors of the teaching process and those that coadjuvate in this process can prepare the food in the own schools, in the in the schools themselves warm food regulated by nutritionists, which evidently brings a benefit for this vulner vulnerable population. There's also an activation of the productive sector at a local level, precisely because the utensils, the necessary elements for the preparation of food is going to be acquired from the local producers. So what they produce is going to be acquired from them. As to water harvesting or water seeding also, evidently this is for human consumption. It is a benefit for health and the quality of life of thousands of Panamanians in areas of difficult access. And following with the question that is asked, what are the main limitations that you have faced in regards to the development of these programs? Well, this is something that is common, I think, to all countries of Latin America, which is the economic resource. We do not have all the resources that are necessary to face these needs. And also the human resource maybe sometimes there's a lack of nutritionists, accountants, procurement personnel. And the last question is, how can the FAO help to consolidate or disseminate the initiative or address the limitations? Obviously, the FAO, as it has done so far, can facilitate the exchange of experiences with other countries of the region for the development of innovative actions that obviously facilitate the development of programs in all these regions. Thank you very much. Republic to make their contribution. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon to you all. The Dominican Republic in December of 2020 took on the commitments derived from the UN resolution referring to agricultural development, food security, and nutrition. During our administration, the ministry has been busy maintaining production and supply of food in the midst of the COVID pandemic and its effects transforming productive systems and the trade systems in the country so as to guarantee food security and enable access of each Dominican to quality, quantity, and safety food with the necessary nutri nutrients to the entire population has been a huge challenge. When we have to plan our food security, we have to include more than 600 thousand tourists who are permanent guests 
And to this great challenge, we have the commitment of maintaining our supply, such as bananas, pineapples, uh, cocoa, other fresh fruits and vegetables to our traditional European and American clients. As a result of taking on a tr process of transition of a food security based on imports to local self-sufficient and profitable production. The goal has been fulfilled. Policy measures to undertake this has be, have been undertaken on the basis of the following axes. One, in investment in productive agricultural infrastructure. Two, financing production. Three, support to commerce. Four, investment in investment and technological uh, equipment. I can also share with you that the extraordinary direct program for the support to producers for the pro purchase of fertilizers has had an effective effect on maintaining production, cost, production costs at low levels. Despite this, agricultural exports to my country have still been rising. What is the government vision for feeding the country over the next 15 years? A stable supply of the majority of the basic staples, rice, uh, cassava, etc., for con internal consumption with the technology necessary. B, sustained service of the government in free service to farmers with priority need in terms of preparing the land, seeds, and the material needed, high-yield material, mechanized harvesting, etc. C, family farming that is consolidated, promoting in economic initiative groups with a priority on co-ops as a mechanism to promote rural development, creation of jobs, of local availability of food in communities, transformation with val added value, and particularly paying particular attention to the participation of youth and rural women. B a system of technological innovation that is strengthened. What does our government intend to do to overcome the challenge? First, reserve financial funds at comfortable rates, farming insurance, land title, and all actions that enable us to have the resources needed for investment to convert our farming or agriculture into agro-exports through loans at competitive rates, possibly at zero rates. Number two, strengthen our national system of, of safety and health. Formalize agreements with countries in our region through harmonization and homologation of health protocols and trade protocols for maintaining access to our traditional markets and conquer preferred niche and markets. Five, undertake campaigns of awareness raising on the basis of eating local healthy products and reducing uh, uh, foodstuffs, the com consumption of foodstuffs that are not healthy. The time has come. World trade vis-a-vis -vis the unhealthy situation in terms of uh, food insecurity is unsustainable. Some economists have concluded that agriculture is losing its importance. We, on the contrary, believe that the agricultural sector is deserving of particular attention from national policies, not just to fight COVID, but also as an element that's essential for development and coexistence of the entire planet and a sustainable environment. Our participation in this forum has confirmed to us that the FAO is the ideal platform to implement our positions and policies on the international fora and that it is the living space for us to agree on the way on how to do business that benefits consumers, producers, and the economies of our nations. And it is in that spirit that we send you that our President of the Dominican Republic sends you a very warm greeting, as does the people of the Dominican Republic.
I will now ask Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago, I will give Trinidad and Tobago the floor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the FAO for this, my first opportunity to present at such a high-level conference on behalf of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. I'm honored to share my country's ex experiences on the team Better Nutrition. Trinidad and Tobago strongly supports the work of FAO towards sustainable agri-food systems for achieving the sustainable development goals and FAO's four betters, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. In the context of the school environment, the following innovative policies are proposed and have the potential to promote the nutritional well-being of students. The draft Ministry of Education policy paper which is intended to provide strategic direction to guide programs, projects, and action plans for all schools with healthy lifestyles being the desired outcome. Under the Ministry of Health, a health-promoting school policy, which speaks to all tenants of health and aims to empower children and adolescents to learn, live, and lead healthy, happy, and productive lives. The National Draft Childhood Obesity Prevention Policy that proposes strategies for promoting healthy weights among school children, and the draft national nutrition guidelines for food offered at schools, most notably the ban of sugar-sweetened beverages in schools. I wish to share some policies and initiatives geared towards better nutrition implemented in Trinidad and Tobago in response to COVID-19. The implementation of a market box initiative which saw the distribution of fresh produce hampers to 79,000 families of students under the school feeding program, and over 130,000 vulnerable families affected during the peak of the pandemic. This initiative benefited hundreds of agro entrepreneurs in the supply chain, and I add 50,000 families also benefited from a national seed distribution program, which saw these families growing aspects of their dietary needs at home. We had the expanded refrigerated facilities used as a buffer to prevent, to preserve and distribute fresh agricultural produce. We also had a food support program, a short-term food assistance and development program assisting vulnerable persons and families in need through a debit card system. And the removal of value-added tax on basic food items to provide immediate relief to all citizens. In keeping with promoting better nutrition, Trinidad and Tobago conducted a number of nutritional campaigns and public awarenesses, um, awareness drives, namely Safe Food Campaign. This was a collaboration with FAO, a number of state agencies and NGOs to educate consumers on the importance of safe food and promote positive practical food safety shopping habits. A safe campaign which prioritizes sustainable farming, accountability of farmers to conduct safe practices, factual information in relation to food labels and eco-friendly practices. Social marketing campaigns that target behavioral changes to reduce non-communicable disease risk factors, including unhealthy diets. A salt consumption survey to determine the level of sodium in pre-packaged foods, along with a survey on sugar-sweetened beverages. The findings from this survey guided policy decisions. Front of, label, front of package labeling standards, which have a positive impact on reducing unhealthy diets, since it informs consumers of the quantities and ingredients contained in foods. External partnerships for better nutrition led to resilient school feeding programs, namely the Mexico CARICOM FAO co Cooperation for Adaptation and Resilience to Climate Change in the Caribbean, a project to strengthen the cap capabilities and capacities of institutions and stakeholders to implement resilient and school sustainable school feeding programs that incorporate the procurement of products from local small-scale farmers. Some of the main benefits of innovations and initiatives implemented include over 2,000 fresh produce hampers delivered daily to families of children registered in the school feeding program, 
Over 139,000 families receive food support in the form of fresh market produced hampers, reduced cost of additional food items as a result of the removal of VAT, peaked interest in agri entrepreneurship, promotion and uptake of healthier diets, nutrition, and lifestyles. Some limitations and constraints identified include difficulties farmers face in adopting new business models, technology, and innovation to meet market realities. For example, the high cost of implementing climate smart agri systems, increased production costs due to supply chain disruptions related to the COVID-19 pandemic, and now further exacerbated by the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Land tenure issues that affects farmers' ability to access resources and availability of good data. For example, production levels, post-harvest loss, etc., which is used to inform decision-making and a need for integrated digitalization systems for improved efficiency. Mr. Chair, Trinidad and Tobago, the Caribbean and small island developing states require urgent interventions from the FAO in strengthening capacity in mobilizing resources to implement resilient and sustainable school feeding programs, capacity building in resilient aquaculture for food security and livelihoods, technical assistance with integrated digitalization systems to increase the resilience and efficiency of selected value chains, and lastly, technical assistance for the transformation of extension services using innovation and digitalization to increase effectiveness and impact delivery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity once more. Thank you very much, Trinidad and Tobago. We appreciate the excellent presentation so far of ministers and heads of delegation and the innovation developed in their country for improved better nutrition. We will continue now with the second group of, uh, of ministers and high authorities so that they can uh, please make their observation, comments, and suggestion to the presentation made on better nutrition. We have two, uh, two um, countries here in this category, El Salvador and St. Lucia. So I will ask in, um, El Salvador virtually to begin their presentation. El Salvador. Good afternoon. Please receive a special greetings to the organizers and the participants of this very important event. The Republic of El Salvador is very pleased to take part in the 37th Regional Conference of the FAO for Latin America and the Caribbean, expressing our appreciation for the space made to us to take part in better nutrition. My country is for in my country, this is one of the government's priority axes through innovative, uh, through innovative work respecting human rights, uh, which uh, includes the right uh, to appropriate food, one of the most important parts of full human development. In this, the current government has defined public policy instruments from the highest levels of government aligned with improving food systems, establishing lines of action for reduction of poverty and food and hunger, such as the 2024 Social Development Plan and the policy for growing together. These have the main result to reduce undernutrition in the population. We also are pushing, are working on healthy food at schools. In addition, we formulated a proposal of a model to improve food systems 2021 uh, base, on the basis of the dialogues promoted in at the UN summit, which establishes a global framework of reference for policy strategies and sectoral plans. That model is a systemic f approach and a roadmap for the comprehensive uh, way of dealing with uh, nutrition and food security as a result of the current situation that affected that were affected where we were affected by COVID and by climate change. One of the results of these commitments is the our patterns for sustainable work 
that will enable us to reduce the problems of uh, undernutrition and transmissible diseases. We are strengthening nutrition education environments with healthy foodstuffs for women, children, producers, indigenous communities, and the disabled. Underscoring programs that make sure that there's accessibility to healthy diets in a sustainable fashion. In this sense, uh, from uh, the office of the First Lady, there is an implementation of uh, the policy of Grow Together, strengthening attention to health and development from the early infancy, uh, helping women from the early stages of their maternity all the way through to breastfeeding, etc. We've also implemented uh, the healthcare situation si system where we have strengthened articulation of the bodies that are improving nutritional attention and fostering awareness raising for health healthy foodstuffs in families and the last link in consumption in the food system from the school's feeding program, we have a universal coverage in promotion of healthy foods for students, ensuring safety and quality of foods, promoting production of foods in educational centers for a more varied and healthy set of foodstuffs. So this is one of the programs of social protection, protection that was very important in, during COVID and the, and the pandemic. For implementation of this and other of other binding policies, the government is strengthening and creating support networks with the participation of different sectors in the country and establishing partnerships for international cooperation and the United Nations system, and in particular, the very important support of the FAO from a fi technical and financial point of view in the generation of evidence and of support systems uh, tied in to the food system initiatives to improve the environment and education from a nutritional point of view for the entire population. Regardless of this, the current international and local situation because of COVID and the global problems because of the supply chain of food and the increase in fuel prices are having an effect on food demand. We need uh, a reinforcement of our ability to mobilize greater financial and technical resources to benefit the population that find themselves in conditions of vulnerability. Undoubtedly, we are facing important challenges, but we are working day to day to achieve the food security for the population, thus building economic and social development in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, El Salvador. I now give the floor to St. Lucia. St. Lucia, you have the floor. Mic, microphone. St. Lucia, this way. Good afternoon to everyone. As it pertains to better nutrition, in St. Lucia, we continue our efforts to ensure that our processes and standard operating procedures are in keeping with requirements to trade safe food products locally and in the regional and international markets. We also have an obligation to protect our citizens and visitors to our island by offering the best quality produce or products that are safe to consume and not riddled with chemicals. The ministry continues to work with farmers, fishers, agro-processors, and agencies like the Bureau of Standards in pursuit of HACCP certification to improve quality and competitiveness. We also produce many audio and visual educational communications for the public that promote healthy diets and eating nutritious foods. 
in targeting the future generation of food customers, we have continued the school feeding program where children are introduced to eating healthy foods using more locally produced nutritious foods which facilitates their healthy growth and development. The school feeding policy aims to ensure that every child in St. Lucia is provided with nutritionally balanced meals during the school day. The Ministry of Health continues to support the development of menus and nutrition guidelines for children in St. Lucia. With assistance from FAO, an initiative to train the cooks at the school kitchens in preparing healthy foods with appealing presentation, interesting texture, and attractive taste was done. A national fresh produce pack house was officially opened in December 2020 with the purpose of ensuring food safety with the production line. Produce is washed, sorted, graded, and sorted at appropriate conditions. The pack house is HACCP compliant, but is currently awaiting certification. I thank you for your brief attention. Have a thank wonderful you. rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much, St. Lucia. I now give the floor to Chile. Chile, you have the floor. Chile. Gracias. Thank you. I think that this is one of the most important sessions because I would like to consider this. What is the role of agriculture in producing food? And what is the mission of food to guarantee a human right? And that it's a physical, psychic, and in the well-being of people. But with our current food system leads to a question, why have foods become the main vector of illness and not health. Today, the pandemic is in the world is not COVID. There's a si silent uh, pandemic in this world that has killed 41 million people. COVID has killed 6 million. Why is it silent? Why do we not have the motivation and the concern that we have for COVID than we have for hunger? Well, because it has an effect on development. It's a, it's a producer of cancer, heart attacks, etc. And it is affecting the vast majority of the population. Humanity is becoming obese. Unfortunately, before 2040, if we continue on the current path, and clearly this can be prevented. But like COVID, that's whether it's transmitted by a virus, this is transmitted through neurosciences and and uh, and uh, uh, publicity campaigns that are deceiving. We cannot continue to be complicit to a disease that's called chronic and non transmissible when it's the most transmissible of all. It's affecting our future generations. If a child is obese, if a mother is obese, her genes are going to be changed and and she will be conditioning that condition, not just to herself, to her sons and daughters and grandchildren. And that is the major problem of humanity. And Latin America perhaps has a awareness of this. I am the author in Chile. Uh, of a law that was worked on with the Academy of Science that seeks to raise awareness because the changes have to be undertaken by citizens. Enable citizens to stop being consumers and for them to become citizens with the ability to make decisions. So for instance, why does a girl or a boy have to buy this granola bar thinking that it's healthy? In Chile, we have front labeling where it's got three stamps, high in salt, high in sugar, high in on fats. This is garbage. That is a metabolic bomb. So we developed a law that if a foodstuff has a label that it's not healthy, then it cannot be advertised on, on the television. It cannot be sold at schools. It cannot be deceitful. We cannot be... Uh, support this in the markets, nor can it be sold in schools where there are, these are places of education. You look at this, this uh, frost flake, frosted flakes normally would have a tiger. We can't be, it can't be considered as healthy because it's got 40% of sugar. It's destroying lives and in, a, in an industry that should be healthy. Here, 1%, 1.5% of sugar in this one. 
the, the stamps, because there was a reduction of, of salt and sodium and sugar, this product now can be advertised, it could be sold in schools. Because we want this garbage to no longer become garbage, to be garbage, but it becomes something that's healthy. In Chile, 25% of all products are reformulated or processed. There has not been unemployment, nor has there been uh, an increase in prices in healthy products. And that's why we'd like to promote this initiative, because it's affecting the health of our planet. How the planet that doesn't have fuel, f fossil fuels or agrochemicals or water or soils, how are we going to allow all of that to be producing garbage that's just destroying the planet? We're going to avoid a higher number of cancers, high blood pressure, heart attacks. This needs to be an ecosystem. Also, in Chile, we're working with the state to ensure that they go to Argentina, Peru, Uruguay, Mexico, Colombia. Latin America has to be the first healthy continent. And if Latin America is and Central America is, then the rest of the planet will do the same because we have scarce resources. And at the same time, we, since we have a problem, only 20% of the population is consuming 25% of fruit and vegetables. We need to have green labels that are only used for the purchase of green products, fresh fruit and vegetables, things that are produced by our family farmers, for instance, because the food that is lost primarily are the healthy products, fruit, vegetables. It's not just the processed foods that's lost, and that's why the we are need to be producing things that are not being lost. Finally, we're working on applying taxes to these products that have these excessive stamps on them so that we can, we can reduce the number of heart attacks, strokes that are the result of bad food. Thank you very much. Chili. And I love the passion. I love the passion that you made your presentation with and with all those examples you have brought to show us here. It was very informative. I think we have had some very good, um, interested and important comments and suggestions that were made by everyone who have spoken with the passion you have displayed in terms of better nutrition. I think that that's a very important subject for us in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I want to thank each and every one of you who have, and those persons also, who and, um, share those important information and make those important decisions in their country so that we can have better nutrition for the entire region, Latin America and the Caribbean. At this point in time, I want to close, conclude this session. And I want, I want to call on the secretary. I want to request the secretary to proceed to read the chairman general summary of the main comments, conclusions, and recommendation made in plenary and to receive the comments, contribution, and suggestions of the plenary. We will begin with the update on the development of the new FAO strategy and climate change. Secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Can we put the text in Spanish up on the screen, please? We need to post the uh, Spanish text on the screen, please. Entonces vamos a tomar el texto que Let's take the text that we should have reviewed yesterday to agree on it. And then we have a paragraph that was part of the dialogue that was agreed, worked on uh, by, between the Caribbean countries and Argentina after the plenary. So we begin our reading on the updated information on the FAO strategy on climate change, and I will read. The regional conference acknowledged the process of development of the new FAO strategy on climate change as called for by the recent evaluation of the organization's contribution to climate change, SDG 13, through an inclusive process to improve alignment 
with the FAO Strategic Framework 2022-2031, the 2030 Agenda, and the Paris Agreement. I understand that this here is referring to what was agreed to within the context of the FAO. Are there any comments or objections to this paragraph? So if there is no objection, then we'll agree that this... Any objection? Clarification? If there is no objection, clarification, then we, this, paragraph, if this paragraph is approved. I would like the Secretary to pro, um, proceed to the other. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Brazil, Brazil, please. Brazil, yes, let me hear Brazil. Yeah, uh, I would prefer... Uh, voy a hablar en español. Uh, I will speak Spanish. I would prefer, instead of acknowledged, took note. Thank you very much. Took note. B says, accepted the pillars suggested in the outline, in particular the strengthening of farmers' capacities, the innovative solutions to adapt to climate change, and the importance of partnerships with regional, international, and national organizations, and the use of science and innovation as a basis for proposals of action. Brazil, please. Mr. Brazil. Chairman. Yes, Brazil. Let me hear you. Yeah. De nuevo, en vez de... Once again, instead of accepted, took note of the pillars. Thank you. Thank you. C. Highlighted the need for the FAO to utilize the agreed language at a multilateral level, particularly the agreed in the 2030 Agenda for the elaboration of its documents, strategic frameworks, and action plans. I would not have any objections to the substance, but I do think that we should also include in our language the matter of blue economy. I think that the oceans have gained fundamental importance also for food and nutrition of our countries. And in today's forum, I have not seen that discussion among countries that also have oceans and in which the fishing industry is very important. So I think that it would be important to also highlight the blue economy and everything that has to do with the recovery of oceans because we've made a huge effort from Costa Rica, Ecuador, to expand the protected areas to generate enough, enough uh, ocean mass to promote fishery, fishing, aquaculture, and everything that has to do with proteins that come from the seas. So it would be important to also include that concept, if you agree. Objection to that. By the time Brazil, please, Brazil, please, Brazil please. get Bra Brazil. Yes, I recognize Brazil. I will call on Brazil yeah. in, a, in a moment. Any any yeah. objection to Costa Rica's proposal? If not Brazil, yes. Let me hear Brazil. Uh, Senor President, Mr. Chair, I would like to remind everyone that now we are discussing, or we're talking about what we discussed in the past session regarding the strategy for 
climate change of the FAO. And it is not the case of the topic that is proposed by the delegation of Costa Rica. So I very respectfully would like to remind everyone that this is a very specific matter. And yesterday we also had a long and very profound discussion. And in the drafting committee, we agreed on the use of terms such as green and blue. And that, well, I believe there, there is an agreement among all the delegations present and with the drafting committee that met yesterday. The discussion in this matter, and it took a very long time. And I think in the appropriate paragraph, we'll have those languages that was raised by Costa Rica inserted. So any other clarification in this paragraph? If not, um, we just approve and I will ask the secretary to proceed. Okay, gracias. Okay, thank you. The regional conference recommended that FAO A, respect the principles established in the Paris Agreement, such as equity in the implementation of the strategy and the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in light of the regional and sub-regional priorities and needs as well as the differences in the contexts and capabilities of each member and acknowledging the importance of technology development and transfer to enhance resilience to climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This paragraph, yes. Ecuador. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Here, there's a doubt. I understand that responsibilities are common but differentiated ones. I'm not sure that the capabilities have that same definition. Maybe we're talking about the capabilities and common responsibilities, but differentiated. Any comment on that? Uh, Brazil, Mr. Chairman, Brazil, please. yes, Brazil. Yes, to support what you, uh, para apoyar. To support what Ecuador has just mentioned, and the it is the the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, and then the corresponding capabilities. Thank you. Thank you. I feel that at the beginning, the word respect in this paragraph sounds too, too harsh. I don't know, maybe we could replace it for another synonym like adopt or something. But respect it sounds as if maybe no attention has been paid to this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. And I apologize for the delay in, in requesting the floor, because I'm going to refer to a paragraph from the beginning of this proposal to be approved by the plenary. So if we could please go back to the first paragraph. I think that there is a matter of procedure here that the colleagues in the FAO are going to understand. We are referring to the second line that says, as was requested in the, in the recent evaluation of the organization's contribution to climate action. Actually, who is asking for the strategy or who are asking for the strategy are the members because otherwise, they're from the result of an evaluation and indeed for the FAO to start to work on a new strategy, there has to be the mediation and the consider consideration of the members. So we would suggest to change the phrase as was required in the recent evaluation for as was requested by the council. And here we're going to need the assistance of the secretariat because I understand that it would be 
as this was in the period of sessions 166 of the Council of the FAO because the strategy is a decision of the FAO Council in its session period 166. I am going to read this first paragraph with the changes. A. Took note of the process of development of the new FAO strategy on climate change as was requested by the period 166 of sessions of the FAO Council in the recent evaluation of the contribution of the organization to climate action, SDG 13, through an inclusive process to improve alignment with the FAO strategic framework for 2022-2031, the 2030 Agenda, and the Paris Agreement. I raise my hand uh, for the the paragraph we were discussing. Okay, we will reach, uh, we will go back earlier. to that in a few yes, moments. Yes, thank you. Yes. Independent. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, Excellencies. To give the correct wording, which was proposed by Argentina, it should read by the 166th session of the Council. So that has to be added in. Any, any clarification more? So if not, we accept this paragraph and we move on. I will ask the secretary to read the one that we were on before we move back to the A, that those modifications that were made by suggestion that were made by delegates. Okay. El, la conferencia regional recommend okay. The regional conference recommended that FAO A, adopt the principles established in the Paris Agreement, such as equity in the implementation of the strategy and the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, and the respective differentiated capabilities in light of the regional and sub-regional priorities and needs as well as the differences in the contexts and capabilities of each member and acknowledging the importance of technology development and transfer to enhance resilience to climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's, that's the um, paragraph, the amended paragraph. We have Brazil first and then we'll have um, Ecuador. Brazil. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would prefer us to maintain respect and not adopt. Adopt would be acceptable, but I think that respect is better, and I'm going to explain why. Those, those of us that are in the day-to-day -day of the FAO discussions know that there is a specific region and a group of countries that are reluctant to recognize the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. And unfortunately, this group of countries and region have an unbalanced, um, uh, I think, influence on in the discussions. And I think that that's the spirit that encompasses the discussions on this specific matter. And that's why not only Brazil insists, but several other countries on making these matters explicit. Thank you. Before we go to Ecuador, can we use the word reaffirm instead? Chair, yes, we, we agree with I was just making a suggestion to replace the one of the word that was um, um, proposed by Brazil, and uh, we use the word reaffirm. Does that acceptable, Brazil? 
Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chair. I was saying that we we agree with with uh, with Brazil's comment, and we can live with any one of the two words that have been proposed. The other thing is a, a matter of form, and it must simply be a, a mistake. We have to talk about the corresponding capabilities, not differentiated capabilities. I think that differentiated could be eliminated. It could be deleted. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor once again. I take advantage of this opportunity to echo what has been stated by the Ambassador of Brazil. And in regards to this paragraph, we would like to remind everyone of what the Rio Charter was of over 30 years ago. And well, this year, it, it is 30 years of that declaration, which is extremely important for all developing countries because it somehow set the framework for all the discussions that came later when we're talking about the environment and climate change. Based on this declaration, I would like to remind everyone of Principle 7. Principle 7 of this declaration talks about the principle of common responsibilities but differentiated. That's principle number 7. And therefore, based on that and reminding everyone of what the Ambassador of Brazil said, in this paragraph, we would not feel very comfortable with the second part that is added to this principle that has been acknowledged since 1992. And the corresponding capability. So very humbly and with your indulgence, Mr. Uh, Chair, and of the delegates as well, we would ask to remove the phrase and, and the capabilities because there's a clear intentionality for us in which that phrase really doesn't serve the interests of our region. That's how Argentina understands it. Thank you. In Brazil. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, para apoyarlo. Well, just to support what Argentina has just said, I think that it is absolutely adequate and it would be very important to delete this. And also to propose that instead of and recognizing, no, to and acknowledging instead acknowledge the third the third line okay it says and acknowledging the importance the suggestion is to replace acknowledging for to acknowledge I will ask the secretary to read it now with the amendments that were proposed any other amendment Mexico. Eh, disculpe la insistencia. Lo I apologize for insisting. But what happens is that, well, according to what the ambassador of Brazil said regarding the fact that some countries do not respect the principles. But there, at the beginning, it says, recommend recommended that FAO respect the principles. So maybe if we adapt this, it would be the FAO member states respect the principles, just that. Is respect the principle. So we have two, two different positions. Is there any other position on this issue? So we'll ask the Brazil, Brazil on the floor again, Brazil. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, reaccionando al well, reacting to Mexico's comment, in this meeting, we cannot make recommendations to the other members. We are making recommendations to the FAO. And that is the purpose of this meeting. We do not have a mandate to make recommendations to other countries. Thank you. The point is that we have to make the recommendation and agree to it here and then put it in the draft it to become 
decisions of the conference. Argentina, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with the Ambassador of Brazil that the regional conference cannot recommend itself or to its members. So here, we would propose to, well, that the first word should be that recommended that the FAO could include the principles to the strategy. These are principles that have been acknowledged over 30 years ago and that were a triumph for all the developing countries. Thank you, Chair. Okay, to include the principles established in the Paris Agreement, such as equity in the implementation of the strategy and the principles of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in light of the regional and sub-regional priorities and needs, as well as the uh, concepts and capabilities of each member and acknowledge the importance of technology development and transfer to enhance resilience to climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we agree on that. So we will move forward. Or relax the, um, we accept this and we will move forward. We will ask the secretary to go to B, paragraph B, the pro proposal that we have here. B. B. Frame its work on international climate and environmental agreements, such as the 26th Conference of the Parties, COP26, of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change through the Glasgow Climate Pact, Pact and the Paris Agreement. Graph, any clarification, suggestion, addition? If not, Argentina, Argentina on Zoom. Gracias, señor presidente. Thank you, Chair. I think that here we have to be careful. The FAO is a specialized organization with a specific mandate in on food and agriculture, and therefore it is at least at the same level of any other multilateral international forum, any other organization. So the FAO does not have to frame its work within other fora or organizations or multilateral entities, but it has to take into account or consider the environmental agreements in its work to take them into account, but not to frame, because the FAO's mandate is absolutely different from the instruments and fora that are mentioned in this paragraph. Thank you, Chair. Any other clarification? Any other addition, suggestion? The paragraph is simply saying it's not the, that the FAO will adapt these um, agreements, use these agreements as a guide to work forward, but craft their own agreement. That's the paragraph is saying. So it's not saying that the FAO must follow blindly or dogmatically the paragraph that are those agreements that are stated in these international organizations. It is showing that agreement like those. So the FAO has the authority to craft their own agreement Bear in mind that you already have international agreements that you could run parallel to. That is what this um, paragraph is talking about. So we agree on this. So let's move forward. We accept. I'll ask the secretary to move, move, um, go to the next one. Gracias, señor presidente. Thank you, Chair. C. Provide support to members that request it to enhance Adaption, adaptation and low emission measures aimed at combating the effects of climate change and strengthen their national, sub-regional and regional policies, strategies and mechanisms in a coherent manner as appropriate and in accordance with existing contexts and capacities. Education or suggestion, intervention in this paragraph. No? So we can accept this and move forward? Secretary? Who? Somebody? Who is it?
ואני אסביר לה, אין זום. Good evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Regarding this paragraph, I would like to propose to replace the word adopt for implement. Implement adaptation measures. Thank you. Um, a, a proposal, a new proposal to replace Argentina, Argentina and Zoom. Gracias, señor presidente. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I totally agree with the suggestion of the Ambassador of Venezuela, and we would like to modify or propose that when it says adaptation and low emissions, I would say adaptation and mitigation measures, which is the language. And, okay, and we would also have to cross out low emissions aimed at combating the effects of climate change. Okay. So we have that suggestion from Argentina and Venezuela. So I'll ask the secretary to read the po any, any other intervention. Somebody? Um, Mexico. In lugar de prestes... Instead of provide, we can change that offer. Replace that with offer instead of provide. Yes, they should. The, the, I know it's very hard sometimes for the people who speak English to follow this conversation sometimes because when, when, when the proposition comes in Spanish, they don't, sometimes they don't, um, the interpreter don't get it um, at the same time. But um, we have some suggestion and addition. So I'll ask the secretary to read the paragraph that we have those addition in, and then we'll agree if we go, we'll proceed with it. To offer support to the members that request it to implement adaptation and mitigation measures aimed at combating the effects of climate change and strengthen their national, subregional, and regional policies, strategies, and mechanisms in a coherent manner as appropriate and in accordance with existing contexts and capacities. That paragraph that was just read by the secretary, any objection, any addition, clarification on that? If not, we can proceed and accept it, and we'll go to the drafting committee. I'll ask the secretary to go to the other one, e D. Gracias. Provide specific support to small island developing countries, recognizing their singular climatic vulnerability so they can increase in increasingly access climate financing, value chain development and resources for capacity development to strengthen their agri-food systems and provide support for the development of oceanographic and fisheries research through initiatives such as the Nansen Vessel for achieving sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. An agreement and they have a replacement for this paragraph here. I will ask, you don't have a, you agree with this? So any, any, any clarification in this paragraph? Addition? So if there is none, we should proceed. We should proceed. I will ask the secretary to continue to, uh, to E. E. Continue including in its work the support to family farmers, pet
peasants and indigenous peoples and people of Afro African descent and women and youth valuing ancestral knowledge to address the effects of climate change and to promote the efficient, sustainable and resilient use of productive resources with an emphasis on creating new opportunities for decent employment and generating new sources of agricultural and rural income. Any, any intervention in this paragraph? Cuba. No, Costa Rica? Costa Rica. Uh -huh. I, in this paragraph, would like to see if the addition of the need to seek financing. I know that other countries in the region may have solved the matter of financing for family farming, but in Central, Central America, family act farming is not solved. It's not bankable. They need uh, to have risk mitigators so that banks can access those resources and so that the financial resources then can be transferred. And it, we're discussing endorsements, uh, uh, insurance, uh, etc. This is a process that Central America needs in a, uh, uh, deeply because we're not pr currently in a position in which uh, this can be dealt with yet in our country. So I'd like to see the inclusion of financing here and the generation of studies for development of uh, in endorsers, insurance, and other mitigators of financial risk so that banks can actually uh, provide financing to family farmers. Ask Costa Rica exactly where you want to see financing highlight here because yesterday, I can remember yesterday when we had the discussion, there was a suggestion that we should have a paragraph that includes equitable funding to rural and indigenous community. So you, are, you, you satisfy with that? You, you, you think we should add that in it? It's not just for the indigenous communities, but for family farming uh, in the broader sense. Ecuador. Thank you, Chair. Floor, I was just looking back at this, and in G, we, in, in paragraph G, I saw here we have funding, so we can move to that when we reach there, we'll discuss it. Ecuador, yes, you have the floor. Once again, thank you, Chair. Taking on a very correct observation from our distinguished delegate from Colombia on a gender balance, perhaps we could incorporate after decent uh, employment, comma, with a gender focus or perspective, comma, and then it could continue. Thank you. Respond to that. I didn't hear the um, translation. Okay, hay una pro. Hay se propone incluir ahí con enfoque. Proposing to include uh, with gender focus, correct? So the proposal from Ecuador, we agree on that. So, Argentina and Zoom. Thank you, Chair. Here, we would like to refer and suggest a couple of insertions on line two after peoples and taking into account the discussions over the past two days in particular, those very interesting and valuable contributions from Bolivia after peoples, indigenous the Secretariat had already included my, the, the, the direction of my comments. Science, comma, evidence, comma, ancestral, knowledge, ancestral and traditional law, knowledge. On that same line, instead of effects, 
we in, would put in on the net that same line, we could have challenges instead of effects of climate change, rather the challenges of climate change. And challenge and uh, Costa Rica's concern in terms of funding will wait for consideration of paragraph G to see if that paragraph has the elements that can have the added value uh, in terms of what you've proposed, sir. Ms. Argentina, any other um, suggestion to this paragraph? We have Argentina just now. I will ask the secretary to read the entire addition that we have had in that paragraph. Secretary. C. E. E. Continue including in its work the support to family farmers, peasants, and indigenous indigenous peoples and native peoples and peoples of African descent, women and youth, valuing ancestral and traditional knowledge to address the challenges of climate change and to promote the efficient, sustainable and resilient use of productive resources with an emphasis on creating new opportunities for decent employ employment with a gender focus and generating new sources of agricultural and rural income. So that's the addition to the paragraph. Any any objection to that? If not, we'll accept it and move on. We go into. Uh, we go, uh, I will ask the secretary to read F, paragraph F. 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 Provide support to members that request it for the updating and implementation of their climate commitments, in particular their nationally determined contributions in a coherent manner as appropriate and in accordance with existing contexts and capacities. So that's, that's the proposal here from that paragraph. Any interjection, clarification, addition? Anyone on Zoom? So, so if there is no addition, we can move with this and accept this and move forward. Argentina and Zoom. Thank you, Chair. This is a very interesting paragraph. It's quite correct for the agenda topic that's being discussed at this regional conference. So we would like to propose to make it very specific to the FAO mandate because once again the mandate of the FAO it has to do with agriculture and, and food and as the paragraph has been presented it would seem that the FAO has a general mandate on climate change for instance. So first I think that so as to update and implement as appropriate and at the request of parties, if we add this in, uh, then we could remove the that requested from the first line, their climate commitments in the sector. That make this, um, that no, make this uh, proposal, um, this sorry, sir. paragraph. Sorry, Chair. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I, I haven't finished. I haven't oh, finished. Yeah. Yet, sorry, please. sorry, sorry yes. about it. No, please, 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 indulge me, indulge me. So, so uh, continue. No, please, sorry, 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 but yeah, just to finish and not to request for the floor once again. Um, I, I would, I would switch to to Spanish. Um, and talk so, I think, and sector, the agri-food sector. I would remove. Clim climate uh, commitments in the agri-food sector without the comma there. And here we should include in line with nationally determined contributions Um, in accordance with the Paris Agreement. Comma. Comma. 
in a coherent manner as appropriate and in accordance with the existing context and capacities. We'd have to check the grammar. Perhaps the word, the uh, drafting committee could have a look at it. But I think here it's important that we have to define that the mandate of the FAO is the agri-food sector and not a climate sector, and that nationally determined contributions is a sovereign decision. It's not uh, that is determined by the national governments, and it's a function of the context and priorities at a national level. So. These things do have to be included in the paragraph, but they perhaps need to be, uh, these additions have to be perhaps just fine-tuned by the drafting committee. Thank you, Chair. Brazil, Brazil and Zoom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Chair. I agree with Argentina, but it would be better to make explicit the FAO's mandate the climate commitments in accordance with its mandate in the agricultural sector. Thank you. Yes, any other? Um, Venezuela, Venezuela and Zoom. Thank you, Chair. I agree with the suggestions of, the, of Argentina and Brazil. However, I'm concerned that the paragraph in the paragraph we repeat as appropriate twice. Perhaps we could delete the last of those where it says in a coherent matter and in accordance with existing contexts and capacities because we already have as appropriate uh, at the beginning of the paragraph so I don't think it adds any value there thank you good any other suggestion on this paragraph so we have some addition whilst we had also some suggestion to delete some of the words to make it more broader and encompass more decision, to take, make more a decision that encompass more um, sector and more aspect in agriculture. So I'll ask the secretary to read now the entire paragraph. F, F provide support to members for the updating and implementation as appropriate and at, their, at the request of the party their climate commitments in accordance with the mandate, its mandate in the agricultural sector in line with their nationally determined contributions in accordance with the Paris Agreement in a coherent manner and in accordance with existing contexts and capacities. Paragraph, the addition to it, any objection? If there is no objection, we'll move forward uh, and accept uh, Mr. this. Chairman, yes. Mr. Chairman, Brazil, Brazil. I think it might be better instead of uh, instead of saying at the request of party, that that's not clear. It would be better to say at the request of members. That addition at the request of, me uh, at, of members from Brazil. Any objection to that? If not, we'll accept and move forward. I will ask the secretary to proceed to G. G, enable access and development of international and domestic climate and environmental finance mechanisms and non-reimbursable funds for members, regional and sub-regional organizations and other key partners with special attention to indigenous peoples and local communities. Any yes, Costa Rica. I'd like to see if we can include promotion of financial inclusion through risk transfer mechanisms such as insurance guarantees and uh, endorsements. So we could put it on the screen. That is, um, you're looking at the screen and see the part they add in that. That is the appropriate part you agree with. So. We have the addition there from Costa Rica. Any other addition? Anyone on Zoom? Okay, so we'll proceed. We'll, add, we'll accept that addition and we'll proceed. Argentina and Zoom. Gracias. Thank you, Chair. Once again, um, I, I'm going to switch to, to, to Spanish, sorry. Um, Primero, First, 
this is a question for the Secretariat or perhaps the Chair. Here in the, the proposal, we see the use in line five of other key partners in line three. We would like to know what this refers to because actually if we're thinking about a particular actor, that should be made clear because in some countries perhaps we have a position with respect to what actors should be included or partners in this strategy. Afterwards, the in the proposal made by Costa Rica, which I think is very interesting, perhaps what we would be missing would be a reference to family production uh, uh, schemes, uh, uh, family farming, and uh, native indigenous peoples, which would be at the end, exactly. Uh, and there is uh, so something that I, I, I thought that it was mentioned by Costa Rica, but um, uh, also yeah, sorry again, I switched to, to Spanish. Um, I think that when we were talking about financial trans uh, inclusion, I think that I heard including insurance and endorsements. I want to be sure that that was the intent of Costa Rica. Perhaps I didn't uh, hear properly and imagined it, but in that case, we would favor this to be considered by the rest of the members in the plenary because it would be very interesting to have this in our report. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think that, uh, yes, the, I think there were a number of delegations who made the point about crop financing generally for those farmers. We should look at that too to add it in. I will ask Brazil. Brazil won the floor. Brazil, you have the floor. Brazil, you have the floor, please. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chem. I believe that inclusion of this resolves the problem because we were reducing the scope of the mechanisms, and I don't think that was Costa Rica's intention. And uh, and I think that with this, it's solved. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Venezuela, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to suggest in line one to enable and foster access and development. So fast enable and foster access and development of, and then I think that there's a comma in one of the phrases that shouldn't be there when we refer to when we in this Spanish uh, there's a comma uh, that d should not be included uh, actually it does need to be there because native peoples and indigenous peoples are different yes right thank you Thank you, Chair. Once again, I would like to ask the floor for the same paragraph following the suggestion of the Ambassador of Venezuela that we support. I think that it would be interesting to, to not, not enable and process, but improve access and development. And here we would request the, your indulgence since we're very firm on the of international and national in line four. I don't know that that, that, that is, is truly uh, important to include what type of financing is being requested, national or international. It seems to me that 
specifying it doesn't really contribute anything to the paragraph and nor to its understanding for uh, those reading the report. Perhaps it's better to just delete that. Thank you, Chair. Chair. Do you have the floor, please? Thank you. It's the same line. The same line of thought as Argentina. I wanted to uh, to suggest the same thing as Argentina. Thank you, sir. So we have the um, correction or the addition to the paragraph and the delete the, those words that were deleted. I will ask the secretary to proceed and read the entire paragraph. Okay, facilitate. Facilitate, foster, and improve access and development of mechanisms of finance for the environment and climate that promotes financial inclusion and risk transfer mechanisms to favor access to insurance and endorsers and to non-reimbursable funds for members, regional and sub-regional organizations, and other key partners with special attention to family farmers, peasants, indigenous peoples, native peoples, and Afro-descendants, and local communities. I have a paragraph, the addition that were made and some of the words that were deleted. Any, any um, objection to that? Thank you for the inclusion. Yes, Ecuador, you have yes. the floor. Thank you, Ms. Uh, perhaps to try to, to go along with the uh, Addis Abeba action agenda. And um, the, the fifth line, we're seeing a uh, non fondos no reembolsables. The idea will be to add uh, uh, fondos in condiciones favorables. Funds under favorable conditions and or non-reimbursable. Also have uh, innovative financing or other means of implementation along with the Addis Adeva Action Agenda. Just to bear in mind that uh, piece of information and suggestion. Thank you, Chair. Costa Rica? Solo para. Just to include the gender topic, it should be special attention to uh, family, the persons of uh, fa family farmers to adapt this to, uh, to make it gender inclusive. I, I believe, says the interpreter, that this applies to the Spanish version. Those we had those proposals in the paragraph, so we'll ask now to read the entire paragraph and let us get the understanding of it. Facilitate, foster, and improve access and development of uh, finan uh, climate and environmental financing mechanisms and that foster financial in inclusion and mechanisms for risk transfer to favor access to insurance and endorsements and funds under favorable conditions and non-reimbursable funds for members, regional and sub-regional organizations, and other key partners with special attention to family farmers, peasants, indigenous peoples, native peoples, and Afro-descendants, and local communities. Any objection to that? It's a very broad, it's a very broad, broad, um, broad paragraph and compass a lot of groups. And I think now um, we can move with that. We approve that. So at last, we will move on. We move to H. 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 Use in its work an integrated and innovative approach promoting linkages between climate change, restoration, of productive ecosystems, integrated management of water resources, territorial planning, combat desertification, land degradation, and deforestation. Any intervention in this paragraph? Any objection, clarification, addition? Anyone on Zoom? So if there is no addition or objection, we can move on. Somebody there? Any? Argentina? 
Thank you, Chair. To make the paragraph rich in terms of all of the things that were mentioned in the meeting and also taking into account the meeting of the drafting committee from yesterday, we could we could change uh, the approaches to, instead of having innovative approaches, we could change that. And I'm sorry, says the interpreter, I missed what he wanted to include instead. The genomic vision, which was what Ecuador referred to today, direct plantings, and other tools, technical tools, comma, promoting, no, it's okay, no, promoting linkages. Thank you, Chair. So we have that addition from our Argentina, replacing um, some of the word there. Any other um, objection? Any objection to that, Ecuador? Thank you, Chair, for consideration of the distinguished senior authorities. The line seven, where we where we talk about water resources and uh, territorial planning, it would be land planning for to be able to use the uh, the language of the FAO, and that would make it very uh, clear for the FAO. Uh, that that Ecuador just proposed. Brazil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Argentina proposed genome addition and not vision. Thank you. Any other proposal? If not, now we will read the entire um, paragraph now with the addition. Ache. H. Use in its work an a holistic and innovative approach in including biotechnology, genome addition, promoting linkages between climate change, restoration of productive ecosystems, integrated management of water resources, planning and land management, combat desertification, land degradation, and deforestation. Finalize the development of the project for the strategy on climate change for its consideration by the FAO Council at its 170th session. Argentina. Gracias, señor presidente, y disculpe por por tomar nuevamente la palabra. Thank you, Chair, and I apologize for taking the floor um, to, to share with you that the consultation process has not ended yet. And in fact, next week, 
Under the auspices of the President of the Council, we have scheduled informal meetings with the representatives of the groups here of the FAO. And before going to the Council, this will be the strategy will be put to consideration of consultative forums, the advisors of the Council, which is the program committee. So actually what we want or what we think the regional conference should suggest is for the FAO to include the suggestions stated or opined by the members of the regional council. And to continue with the consultative process for the development of the project and the or the strategy for its consideration by the 170th FAO Council because uh, with certainty we were told that we have to refer to the number of the council and the session without indicating period so to be coherent with the text this can also be fixed by the drafting committee objection to Argentina suggestion Brazil uh, thank you, Chair. We cannot delete project. I think that the <laughs> secretary went too fast, typed too fast. Thank you. But I agree with, with everything else from Argentina. Addition, addition clarification. So we agree that uh, I'll ask the secretary to read and then we'll proceed. In, include the suggestions received in the 37th regional conference and continue with the consultative process so that the strategy project on climate change can be considered by the FAO Council at its 170th session, period of sessions work in progress that we'll have continue consultation until we arrive at the final draft that will be taken to the 170 session of the FAO Council. Any objection to that? If not, we will move, um, we'll move and accept this and send it to the drafting committee. So we'll ask the secretary to So we have a, we have a, uh, a proposal, a paragraph to add, add in, as a matter of fact, two. So to the, um, I will ask the secretary to read it in Spanish. This is the paragraph to confirm the language, to confirm the wording. This is what we received from the Caribbean countries together with Argentina. This is what we have. Yes, so that we could read it. Okay, A, provide technical and financial assistance to the members, in particular small island developing states of the Caribbean through the prog priority programmatic sphere of the FAO, Better Production 2, Blue Transformation to conserve and sustainably use oceans, seas, and marine resources in favor of sustainable development, including the improvement of policies and national programs, the promotion of technological innovation, and the participation of the private sector in order to reach the SDG 14 goals, submarine life, in order to achieve 
aquatic food systems that are more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, and ensuring the growing contribution to the reduction of poverty and the generation of income for small-scale uh, fishermen, and including youth in line with the 2021 Declaration of the Fisheries Committee in favor of fishing and sustainable aquaculture. Next, please. B. To strengthen the decision making based on evidence for the management of marine resources through research and development of capacities of the members of the Caribbean through the Nansen program. I stood by the Caribbean and Argentina because we had a discussion. Uh, on this yesterday, and I think that there was uh, this uh, bilateral today, with, which was moderated by the independent chair. And I will ask him to speak. I saw, I, I see, I'm see, recognizing Argentina and some members from the Caribbean, but the independent chair will speak on it first. Thank you very much, and thank you for working together to f try to finalize and to find a compromise. I think on paragraph A, this is indeed the compromise, but one sentence is missing at the end, and that would be, and in line with the, one, uh, with the report, and in line with the okay. report of the 168th session of the Council. I think at the end of it, when we discuss it, um, Argentina had no issue with it to, in deletion or addition. Um, let, let's Argentina. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Chair. You are right. When we discussed this, we said we were okay with the paragraph without that line that we aspire to include it if there is consensus, and therefore it is a matter in which we appeal to you if you agree. We think that it would be the best way to close the paragraph because we're talking about official FAO documents. And in that same paragraph, the only thing that is missing is the bracketed part that was sent because there the text is it's verbatim. The paragraph is verbatim. The, the brackets the Secretariat has that because we sent the paragraph and it surprises us that the bracket has not been placed. But these are very important. And the, or the quotes actually. And the other thing, if you please give me a minute, I'm already doing this, I'm trying to find where, where we, where the quotation marks were, where it says blue transformation. Paragraph in English. Um, yeah, the, 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 the second line, blue yes. transformation. It has, it has the quotation mark, blue transformation. Yes. It has it. Okay, thank you. Yes. And in the, and in the declaration, in line with the declaration, that is also in quotation marks because it's an official resolution of the Fisheries Committee. And the second thing, in item B, what we have agreed based on science and evidence. That was the expression in English that we also discussed and it was agreed. But Chair, I would like to say something that to me is very important. That goes beyond having agreed on these two paragraphs, which is basically that we value Latin American Union and of the Caribbean so much that in this small exercise, just by discussing and exchanging ideas, we very rapidly had the 
the capability of agreeing, which is very positive because there are many things that we can do together, and I think that it's important to highlight this. It is truly impressive to see the availability of my dear colleagues from the Caribbean, from the Caribbean, to try to find a solution. I must publicly acknowledge this, and I also want to acknowledge the role of the council's independent chair, of the independent council's chair, because he also. Is, also helped to establish this bridge. That is the Latin American and the Caribbean unity that we are expecting. Thank you very much, Chair. Express those same sentiments. Um, before I call on um, St. Vincent, who wanted um, to speak, I will, Brazil on the floor. Bra Brazil? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had also asked for the floor to congratulate and thank the delegations of Argentina, the Caribbean countries for their effort, their goodwill, and with the authority of the chair of the Independent Council, we have finally reached a very clear, totally acceptable text that reflects the effort and the determination of the countries of the region. Thank you. St. Vincent. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I too want to express on behalf of the Caribbean the joy having traversed the territory from on Tuesday and Monday and I'm happy that we have consensus. I just want to expound a bit, Mr. Chair, on the final statements from the representative from Argentina that we see this as an act of solidarity. Yes, we started on different pages, but it shows how our region can come together on very important issues. And I think that this lays a platform for other issues to be discussed. I just want to posit as well the, the importance of the Nansem vessel to the Caribbean and uh, after this meeting, it will be really good if we can get the support of all members, but particularly from Brazil and Argentina, to ensure that we address this issue expeditiously. Thank you. Costa Rica? Costa Rica, you indicated you want to make a contribution? No, it's okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other, any other clarification, contribution to this two paragraph? If not, we will accept it. I'd like the secretary to read it one finally, one final time, and we'll add it into the document. Okay. Just to remind you that this paragraph will be included in yesterday's report on priorities to provide technical and financial assistance to the members, in particular, small island developing states of the Caribbean through the pro priority programmatic sphere of the FAO, Better Production Two. Blue transformation to conserve and utilize in the best sustainable way the oceans, seas, and marine resources in benefit of sustainable development, including the improvement of national policies and programs, the promotion of technological innovation, and the participation of the private sector in order to reach SDGs 14 submarine life in order to achieve more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable aquatic food systems and ensuring the growing contribution of the reduction of poverty and the generation of income for small-scale fishermen and aquaculture producers, including youth, in line with the 2021 Declaration of the Fisheries Committee in favor of fishing, sustainable fishing and aquaculture, in line with their report of the 168th Council Session. B, to strengthen the decision-making based on science and evidence for the management of marine resources through research and development of capacities of the members of the Caribbean through the Nansen program. I was going to buy new glasses, but no, these are good. <laughs> I could see very well with these. Okay. 
So let me say that I am very happy that we have concluded this. I want to express the sentiment both of the independent chair of the council, the representative from Argentina, representative from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This show our commitment to agree on certain issues. We can have differences, but I think we are, we are agreeing on issues that are beneficial to the people of Latin America and the Caribbean. And this also shows that we can challenge and we can um, up our way in terms of accepting the challenge that were discussed this morning with the rising costs of food prices and the agriculture input. We in Latin America, Latin America and the Caribbean comprises a large chunk of the global population. We heard the chief economist this morning said that Latin America and the Caribbean are the food basket of the world. And if we are, uh, are, we are people are depending on us to produce, then we have the ability to conquer any challenge and any adversity. So I want to compliment both region. I know for a fact that the CARICOM has been moving in a right direction in trying to reduce the food import bill of the region so that we can produce, and, uh, produce our own food and reduce the bill, food import bill by 25% in 2025. I want to extend an invitation to our brothers in Latin America to work with us together so that we can make this part of the world one of the best for our population and the people of this Latin America and the Caribbean. So before I conclude, I will ask the Secretary to make some announcement and then we'll move forward. Primero, eh, anuncio, solicitamos por favor a las delegaciones que estén considerando realizar anuncios o proveer información en el ítem Asuntos Varios, previsto para el día viernes 1 de abril a las 10 horas, que remitan el tema del asunto a la Secretaría de la Conferencia Regional, de manera a preregistrar las intervenciones en el, para verificar el tiempo disponible para el efecto. Y dos, para la cena de celebración de la Conferencia Regional, cada país miembro recibió dos invitaciones, hay un problema de aforo, una para el jefe de delegación y otra para un acompañante, mientras que los observadores recibieron una invitación. El Ministerio de Agricultura y Ganadería del Ecuador ha dispuesto buses para el transporte de los y las invitadas, los que saldrán desde el lobby del hotel a las 18 horas 30 rumbo al convento de la Iglesia de San, San Francisco. Eso era, señor presidente. Thank you very much, secretary. And let me thank all the Argentina, yes. Presidente, discúlpeme. Chair, um, I'm sorry, but you're the only person that we have not, whose work we have not acknowledged, and it, it is not fair. You have been managing this meeting in, in such a way that all you're doing is drawing bridges. So allow me to acknowledge your work, and I think that you deserve an applause. And on the other hand, I think that the, that the independent council's chair. I don't remember that in any other meeting we've had the independent council chair of all the members of the of Latin America and the Caribbean. So thank you very much for your presence as well. Those kind words and I also want to join with you in thanking the independent chair for moderating and uh, in that discussion that we have had this morning. Let me thank all the delegation for the valuable intervention and comments today. I think all of us would have learned a lot what we are doing in our, in our various country, and I think that's the way we can go. I hope at the end of this conference, we can put all the ideas together and use it as a guide for action to end hunger and poverty in Latin America and the Caribbean. Once again, thank you, and I conclude this segment and move on. And I ask, remind the group of delegates supporting Rapporteur, the group will be meeting at 5.45 immediately after the closure of this session. We ask you to please start just in time to work because we have a lot of um, work to do. Um, as I said, that we have had a number of drafts that we have to conclude on, and we have a few days remaining. So at the end, by Friday, we should conclude all the decisions that will be, that will be taken at this conference. So let me um, end it today by thanking each and every one of you, and hope to see you tomorrow bright and early. Thanks once again. La pandemia de COVID-19 golpeó a América Latina y el Caribe más fuerte que a cualquier otra región del mundo. Y sin embargo, el sector agroalimentario no se detuvo. 
la región continuó siendo un pilar de la seguridad alimentaria global, garantizando el abastecimiento local y la exportación de alimentos durante toda la pandemia. Los pequeños productores adoptaron nuevas tecnologías digitales para acercarse a los consumidores y los gobiernos y el sector privado innovaron para asegurar el suministro alimentario incluso en los peores momentos de la crisis sanitaria. Pero la región aún debe enfrentar grandes desafíos. El hambre se encuentra en su punto más alto de los últimos 20 años y millones de personas han perdido sus empleos y sus medios de vida teniendo que optar por alimentos menos saludables. América Latina y el Caribe debe fortalecer su sector agroalimentario para responder a una población global creciente y para proveer alimentos nutritivos a precios asequibles a todos sus habitantes mediante una producción sostenible que preserve los recursos naturales. Por todas estas razones, la próxima Conferencia Regional de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura es más urgente y necesaria que nunca. Es una oportunidad única para que los países unan sus esfuerzos, porque la pandemia alteró todos los aspectos de nuestra vida, pero también abrió un gran espacio de cambio. Un espacio para que cada país transforme sus sistemas agroalimentarios para volverlos más eficientes, inclusivos, resilientes y sostenibles según sus condiciones y prioridades. Un espacio para transitar hacia una mejor producción, una mejor nutrición, un mejor medio ambiente y una vida mejor sin dejar a nadie atrás. Del 28 de marzo al 1 de abril de 2022, en Quito, Ecuador, la Conferencia Regional de la FAO será la ocasión de aprovechar esta oportunidad de cambio.